The Odyssey, Book One, by Homer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter O'Sullivan. James Joyce in Context, Volume One, Telemachus. The Odyssey, Book One, by Homer. Translated by Alexander Pope. Book One, Argument, Minerva's Descent to Ithaca. The poem opens within forty days of the arrival of Ulysses in his dominions. He had now remained seven years in the island of Calypso, when the gods assembled in council, proposed the method of his departure from thence and his return to his native country. For this purpose it is concluded to send Mercury to Calypso, and Pallas immediately descends to Ithaca. She holds a conference with Telemachus, in the shape of Montes, king of the Taphians, in which she advises him to take a journey in quest of his father Ulysses, to Pelos and Sparta, where Nestor and Menelaus yet reigned. Then, after having visibly displayed her divinity, disappears. The suitors of Penelope make great entertainments, and riot in her palace till late night. Phemius sings to them, the return of the Grecians, till Penelope puts a stop to the song. Some words arise between the suitors and Telemachus, who summon the council to meet the day following. The man, for wisdom's various arts renowned, long exercised in woes, O muse, resound, who when his arms had wrought the destined fall of sacred Troy, and raised her heaven-built wall, wandering from clime to clime, Observant strayed, their manners noted, at their stare surveyed. On stormy seas unnumbered toils he bore, safe with his friends to gain his natal shore. Vain toils, their impious folly dared to prey on herds devoted to the god of day. The god vindictive doomed them nevermore. Ah, men unblessed, to touch that natal shore. Oh, snatch some portion of these acts from fate celestial muse and to our world relate now at their realms the greeks arrived all who the wars of ten long years survived and scaped the perils of the gulfy main ulysses soul of all the victor train an exile from his dear paternal coast deplored his absent queen and empire lost calypso in her caves constrained his stay with sweet, reluctant, amorous delay. In vain, for now the circling years disclose the day predestined to reward his woes. At length his Ithaca is given by fate, where yet new labors his arrival wait. At length their rage the hostile powers restrain, all but the ruthless monarch of the main. But now the god remote, a heavenly guest, in Ethiopia graced the genial feast, a race divided, whom with sloping rays the rising and descending sun surveys. There, on the world's extremest verge, revered, with hecatombs and prayer in pomp preferred, distant he lay, while in the bright abodes of high Olympus, Jove convened the gods. The assembly thus the sire supreme addressed, Aegisthus's fate revolving in his breast, whom young Orestes to the dreary coast of Pluto sent, a blood-polluted ghost. Perverse mankind, whose wills, created free, charge all their woes on absolute degree, all to the dooming gods their guilt translate, and follies are miscalled the crimes of fate. When to his lust Aegisthus gave the rein, did fate or we the adulterous act constrain? Did fate or we, when great Atreides died, urge the bold traitor to the regicide? Hermes I sent, while yet his soul remained sincere from royal blood and faith profaned, to warn the wretch that young Orestes, grown to manly years, should reassert the throne. Yet, impotent of mind and uncontrolled, he plunged into the gulf which heaven foretold. Here Paul's the god. And pensive thus replies Minerva, graceful with her azure eyes, O thou, 
from whom the whole creation springs, The source of power on earth derived to kings. His death was equal to the direful deed, So may the man of blood be doomed to bleed. But grief and rage alternate wound my breast, For brave Ulysses, still by fate oppressed. Amidst an isle around whose rocky shore The forests murmur and the surges roar, the blameless hero from his wished for home a goddess guards in her enchanted dome atlas her sire to whose far-reaching eye the wonders of the deep expanded lie the eternal columns on which earth he rears end in the starry vault and prop the spheres by his fair daughter is the chief confined who soothes to dear delight his anxious mind successless all her soft caresses prove to banish from his heart his country's love to see the smoke from his loved palace rise while the dear isle in distant prospect lies with what contentment could he close his eyes and will omnipotence neglect to save the suffering virtue of the wise and brave must he whose altars on the phrygian shore with frequent rites and pure avowed thy power be doomed the worst of human ills to prove unblessed abandoned to the wrath of jove daughter with what words have passed thy lips unweighed replied the thunderer to the martial maid deem not unjustly by my doom oppressed of human race the wisest and the best neptune by prayer repentant rarely won afflicts the chief to avenge his giant son whose visual orb Ulysses robbed of light, great Polypheme of more than mortal might. Him young Thusa bore, the bright increase of Forcus, dread in the sounds and seas, whom Neptune eyed with bloom of beauty blessed, and in his cave the yielding nymph compressed, for this the god constrains the Greek to Rome, a hopeless exile from his native home, from death alone exempt, but cease to mourn. Let all combine to achieve his wished return. Neptune atoned, his wrath shall now refrain, or thwart the synod of the gods in vain. Father and king adored, Minerva cried, since all who in the Olympian bower reside, now take the wandering Greek their public care. Let Hermes to the Atlantic isle repair, bid him, arrived in bright calypso's court the sanction of the assembled powers report that wise ulysses to his native land must speed obedient to their high command meanwhile telemachus the blooming heir of sea-girth ithaca demands my care tis mine to form his green unpractised years in sage debates surrounded with his peers to save the state and timely to restrain the bold intrusion of the suitor train who crowd his palace and with lawless power his herds and flocks in feastful rites devour to distant sparta and the spacious waste of sandy pile the royal youth shall haste there with warm filial love the cause inquire that from his realm retards his godlike sire delivering early to the voice of fame the promise of a green immortal name she said the sandals of celestial mold fledged with ambrosial plumes and rich with gold surround her feet with these sublime she sails the aerial space and mounts the winged gales o'er the earth and ocean wide prepared to soar her dreaded arm a beamy javelin bore ponderous and vast which when her fury burns proud tyrants humbles the whole hosts o'erturns from high olympus prone her flight she bends and in the realms of ithaca descends her lineaments divine the grave disguise of mentes's form concealed from human eyes mentes the monarch of the taphian land a glittering spear waved awful in her hand there in the portal placed the heaven-born maid enormous riot and misrule surveyed on hides 
of bevies before the palace gate sad spoils of luxury the suitors sate with rival art and ardor in their mien at chess they vie to captivate the queen divining of their loves attending nigh a menial train the flowing bowl supply others apart the spacious hall prepare and form the costly feast with busy care there young telemachus his bloomy face glowing celestial sweet with godlike grace amid the circle shines but hope and fear painful vicissitude his bosom tear now imaged in his mind he sees restored in peace and joy the people's rightful lord the proud oppressors fly the vengeful sword while his fond soul these fancied triumphs swelled the stranger guessed the royal youth beheld grieved that a visitant so long should wait unmarked unhonored at the monarch's gate instant he flew with hospitable haste and the new friend with courteous air embraced stranger whoever thou art securely rest affianced in my faith a ready guest approach the dome the social banquet share and then the purpose of thy soul declare thus affable and mild the prince proceeds and to the dome the unknown celestial leads the spear receiving from the hand he placed against a column fair with sculpture graced where seemly ranged in peaceful order stood ulysses's arms now long disused to blood he led the goddess to the sovereign seat her feet supported with a stool of state a purple carpet spread the pavement wide then drew his seat familiar to her side far from the suitor train a brutal crowd with insolence and wine elate and loud where the free guest unnoted might relate if haply conscious of his father's face the golden ewer a maid obsequious brings replenished from the cool translucent springs with copious water the bright vase supplies a silver laver of capacious size they wash the tables in fair order spread they heap the glittering canisters with bread viands of various kinds allure the taste of choicest sort and savor rich repast delicious wine the attending herald brought the gold gave luster to the purple draught lured with the vapor of the fragrant feast in rushed the suitors with voracious haste marshalled in order due to each a sewer presence to bathe his hands a radiant ewer luxurious then they feast observant round gay stripling youths the brimming goblets crowned the rage of hunger quelled they all advanced and form to measured airs the mazy dance to femius was consigned the corded lyre whose hand reluctant touched the warbling wire Femius, whose voice divined, could sweetest sing high strains responsive to the vocal string. Meanwhile, in whispers to his heavenly guest, his indignation thus the prince expressed. Indulge my rising grief, whilst these, my friend, with song and dance the pompous revel end. Light is the dance, and doubly sweet the lays, when for the dear delight another pays his treasured stores those cormorants consume whose bones defrauded of a regal tomb and common turf lie naked on the plain or doomed to welter in the whelming main should he return that troop so blithe and bold with purple robes inwrought and stiff with gold precipitant in fear would wing their flight and curse their cumbrous pride's unwieldy weight but ah i dream the appointed hour is fled and hope too long with vain delusion fed deaf to the rumour of fallacious fame gives to the roll of death his glorious name would venial freedom 
let me now demand thy name, thy lineage, and paternal land. Sincere, from whence began thy course, recite, and to what ship I owe the friendly freight. Now first to me this visit dost thou deign, or numbered in my father's social train? All who deserved his choice he made his own, and curious much to know, he far was known. My birth, I boast, the blue-eyed virgin cries, from great and Chialis resound and wise, Mentes my name. I ruled a Taphian race, whose bounds the deep circumfluent waves embrace, a duteous people, and industrious isle, to naval arts inured, and stormy toil. Freighted with iron from my native land, I steer my voyage to the Brucian strand to gain by commerce for the labored mass a just proportion of refulgent brass. Far from your capital my ship resides, at Retorus, and secure at anchor rides, where waving groves on airy Nain grow, supremely tall, and shade the deeps below. Thence, to revisit your imperial dome, an old hereditary guest I come, your father's friend. Laertes can relate our faith unspotted, and its early date, who, pressed with heart-corroding grief and years, to the gay court a rural shed pretors, where, soul of all his train, a matron sage supports with homely fond his drooping age. With feeble steps, from marshalling his vines, returning sad, when toilsome day declines. With friendly speed, induced by erring fame, to hail Ulysses a safe return, I came. But still the frown of some celestial power with envious joy retards the blissful hour. Let not your soul be sunk in sad despair. He lives, he breathes, this heavenly vital air. Among a savage race, whose shelfy bounds with ceaseless roar the foaming deep surrounds, the thoughts which roll within my ravished breast to me no seer the aspiring god suggest nor skilled nor studious with prophetic eye to judge the winged omens of the sky yet hear this certain speech nor deem it vain though adamantine bonds the chief restrain the dire restraint his wisdom will defeat and soon restore him to his regal seat but generous youth sincere and free declare are you of manly growth his royal heir? For sure Ulysses in your look appears, The same his features, if the same his years. Such was that face on which I dwelt with joy, Ere Greece assembles stemmed the tides to Troy. But parting then for that detested shore, Our eyes, unhappy, never greeted more. To prove a genuine birth, the prince replies, on female truth assenting faith relies. Thus manifest of right, I build my claim, sure founded on a fair maternal fame. Ulysses a son, but happier he whom fate hath placed beneath the storms which toss the great. Happier the son, whose hoary sire is blessed with humble affluence and domestic rest. Happier than I, to future empire born, but doomed a father's wretched fate to mourn. To whom with aspect mild the guest divine, O true descendant of a sceptred line, The gods a glorious fate from anguish free To chaste Penelope's increase decree. But say, yon jovial troop so gaily dressed, Is this a bridal or a friendly feast? Or from their deed I rightlier may divine, unseemly flown with insolence and wine unwelcome revelers whose lawless joy pains the sage ear and hurts the sober eye magnificence of old the prince replied beneath our roof with virtue could reside unblamed abundance crowned the royal board what time this dome revered her prudent lord who now, so heaven decrees, 
is doom'd to mourn, Bitter constraint, erroneous and forlorn. Better the chief on Ilion's hostile plain Had fallen surrounded with his warlike train, Or safe return'd, the race of glory past, New to his friends embrace, and breathed his last. Then grateful Greece with streaming eyes would raise Historic marbles to record his praise, His praise eternal on the fateful stone, Had with transmissive honour graced his son. Now, snatched by harpies to the dreary coast, Sunk is the hero, and his glory lost, Vanished at once, unheard of and unknown, And I, his heir, in misery alone. Nor for a dear lost father only flow the filial tears, But woe succeeds to woe to tempt the spouseless queen With amorous wiles, resort the nobles from the neighboring isles, from Samos circled with the Ilian main, Dulcium and Zacynthus' sylvan reign, e'en the presumptuous hope her bed to ascend, the lords of Ithaca their right pretend. She seems attentive to their pleaded vows, her heart detesting what her ear allows. They, vain expectants of the bridal hour, my stores in riotous expense devour. In feast and dance, the mirthful months employ, And meditate my doom to crown their joy. With tender pity touched, the goddess cried, Soon may kind heaven a sure relief provide, Soon may your sire discharge the vengeance due, And all your wrongs the proud oppressors rue. Oh, in that portal should the chief appear, Each hand tremendous with a brazen spear, in radiant panoply his limbs encased, For so of old my father's court he graced, When social mirth unbent his serious soul O'er the full banquet and the sprightly bowl. He then, from Ephor, the fair domain of Illus, Sprung from Jason's royal strain, Measured a length of seas, a toilsome length in vain. For, voyaging to learn the direful art To taint with deadly drugs the barbed dart, Observant of the gods, and sternly just, Illus refused to impart the baneful trust. With friendlier zeal, my father's soul was fired, The drugs he knew, and gave the boon desired. Appeared he now with such heroic port, As then conspicuous at the Taphian court. Soon should you boasters cease their haughty strife, or each atone his guilty love with life. But of his wished return, the care resign, be future vengeance to the powers divine. My sentence here, with stern detaste avowed, to their own districts drive the suitor crowd. When next the morning warms the purple east, convoke the peerage, and the gods attest. The sorrows of your inmost soul relate, And form sure plans to save the sinking state. Should second love a pleasing flame inspire, And the chaste queen connubial rites require, Dismissed with honor, let her hence repair To great Icarius, whose paternal care Will guide her passion and reward her choice With wealthy dower and bridal gifts of price. Then let this dictate of my love prevail, Instant to foreign realms prepare to sail, To learn your father's fortunes. Fame may prove, or omened voice, The messenger of Jove, propitious to the search. Direct your toil through the wide ocean, First to sandy pile of Nestor, hoary sage, His doom demand. Thence speed your voyage to the Spartan strand, for young Atrides to the Achaean coast Arrived the last of all the victor host. If yet Ulysses views the light, Forbear, till the fleet hours restore the circling year. But if his soul hath winged a destined flight, Inhabitant of deeth, disastrous night, Homeward with pious speed repass the main, To the pale shade funereal rites ordain, Plant the fair column over the vacant grave, a hero's honors let the hero have. With decent grief the royal deed deplored, 
for the chaste queen select an equal lord; Then let revenge your daring mind employ, By fraud or force the suitor train destroy, And starting into manhood, scorn the boy. Hast thou not heard how young Orestes, fired With great revenge, immortal praise acquired? His virgin sword Aegisthus' veins imbrued, The murderer fell, and blood atoned for blood. O oh, greatly blessed with every blooming grace, With equal steps the paths of glory trace, Join to that royal youth's your rival name, And shine eternal in the sphere of fame. But my associates now my stay deplore, Impatient on the hoarse resounding shore. Thou heedful of advice, secure proceed, My praise the precept is, be thine the deed. The counsel of my friend, the youth rejoined, Imprints conviction on my grateful mind. So fathers speak, persuasive speech and mild, Their sage experience to the favorite child. But since to part for sweet refraction due, The gentle viands let my train renew, And the rich pledge of plighted faith receive, Worthy heir of Ithaca to give. Deferred the promised boon, the goddess cries, Celestial azure brightening in her eyes, And let me now regain the Ritrian port. From Temis returned, your royal court I shall revisit, And that pledge receive, the gifts memorial of our friendships leave. Abrupt, with eagle speed, she cut the sky, Instant, invisible to the mortal eye. Then first he recognized the ethereal guest, Wonder and joy alternate, fire in his breast. Heroic thoughts infused his heart dilate, Revolving much his father's doubtful fate. At length composed he joined the suitor throng, Hushed in attention to the warbled song. His tender theme the charming lyrist chose, Minerva's anger and the dreadful woes which voyaging from Troy the victors bore, while storms vindictive intercept the shore, the shrilling airs, the vaulted roof rebounds, reflecting to the queen the silver sounds, with grief renewed the weeping fair descends, their sovereign step a virgin train attends, a veil of richest texture wrought she wears, and silent to the joyous hall repairs, there from the portal, with her mild command, thus gently checks the minstrel's tuneful hand. Femius, let acts of gods and heroes old, what ancient bards in hall and bower have told, attempered to the lyre your voice employ, such the pleased ear will drink with silent joy. But oh, forbear that dear disastrous name to sorrow sacred and secure a fame. My bleeding bosom sickens at the sound, And every piercing note inflicts a wound. Why, dearest object of my duteous love, Replied the prince, will you the bard reprove? Oft Jove's ethereal rays, resistless fire, The chanter's soul and raptured song inspire Instinct divine, nor blame severe his choice, Warbling the Grecian woes with heart and voice. For novel lays attract our ravished ears, But, oh, the mind with inattention hears, Patient permit the sadly pleasing strain, Familiar now with grief, your tears refrain, And in the public woe forget your own, You weep not for a perished lord alone. What Greeks, new wandering in the Stygian gloom, Wish your Ulysses shared an equal doom, your widowed hours, apart, with female toil and various labors of the loom beguile, there rule from palace cares remote and free, that care to man belongs, and most to me. Mature beyond his years, the queen admires his sage reply, and with her train retires. Then swelling sorrows burst from their former bounds, with echoing grief afresh the dome resounds, Till Pallas, piteous of her plaintive cries, In slumber closed her silver-streaming eyes. 
meantime, rekindled at the royal charms, tumultuous love each beating bosom warms. In temperate rage a wordy war began, bold Telemachus assumed the man. Instant, he cried, your female discord end, ye deedless boasters, and the song attend. Obey that sweet compulsion, nor profane with dissonance the smooth melodious strain. Pacific now prolong the jovial feast, but when the dawn reveals the rosy east, I, to the peers assembled, shall propose the firm resolve. I, here in few disclose, no longer live the cankers of my court. All to your several states with speed resort. Waste in wild riot what your land allows. There ply the early feast and late carouse. But if to honor lost, tis still decreed, For you my bowl shall flow, my flock shall bleed. Judge and revenge my right, impartial Jove, By him and all the immortal thrones above. A sacred oath, each proud oppressor slain, Shall with inglorious gore this marble stain. Awed by the prince, thus haughty, bold, and young, Rage gnawed the lip and wonder chained the tongue. Silence at length, the gay Antinous broke, constrained a smile, and thus ambiguous spoke. What god to your untutored youth affords this headlong torrent of amazing words? May Jove delay thy reign, and cumber late so bright a genius with the toils of state. These toils, Telemachus serene replies, have charms with all their weight, the lore the wise, fast by the throne obsequious fame resides, and wealth incessant rolls in her golden tides. Nor let Antinous rage, if strong desire of wealth and fame a youthful bosom fire, elect by Jove his delegate of sway, with joyous pride that summons I'd obey. Whenever Ulysses roams the realm of night, should factious power dispute my lineal right, some other Greeks a fairer claim may plead. To your pretense their title would proceed. At least, the scepter lost, I still should reign sole o'er my vassals and domestic train. To this Eurymachus, to heaven alone refer the choice to fill the vacant throne. Your patrimonial stores in peace possess, undoubted all your filial claim confess. Your private right should impious power invade, the peers of Ithaca would arm in aid. But say, that stranger guest who late withdrew, what and from whence? His name and lineage shew. His grave demeanor and majestic grace speak him descended of not vulgar race. Did he some loan of ancient right require, or came forerunner of your sceptred sire? Son of Polybus, the prince replies, no more my sire will glad thee longing eyes. The queen's fond hope inventive rumor cheers, or vain diviner's dreams divert her fears. That stranger guest, the Taphian realm obeys, a realm defended with encircling seas. Mentes, an ever-honored name, of old high in Ulysses' social list enrolled. Thus he, though conscious of the ethereal guest, answered evasive of the sly request. Meantime, the lyre rejoins the sprightly lay, love dittied airs, and dance conclude the day, but when the star of eve with golden light adorn the matron brow of sable night, the mirthful train dispersing quit the court, and to their several domes to rest resort, a towering structure to the palace joined, to this his steps the thoughtful prince inclined, in his pavilion there to sleep repairs, the lighted torch and sage your clea bears, daughter of ops, the just Pizensor's son, for twenty bevies of great Laertes won. 
in rosy prime, with charms attractive graced, honoured by him, a gentle lord, and chaste with dear esteem, too wise with jealous strife to taint the joys of sweet connubial life. Stole with Telemachus her service ends, a child she nursed him, and a man attends. Whilst to his couch himself the prince addressed, the duteous dame received the purple vest. The silver ring she pulled, the door reclosed, the bolt, obedient to the silken cord, to the strong stable's inmost depth restored, secured the valves. There, wrapped in silent shade, pensive, the rules the goddess gave, he weighed, stretched on the downy fleece, no rest he knows, and in his raptured soul the vision glows. End of the Odyssey, Book One. Recording by Peter O'Sullivan, Simsbury, Connecticut. Book Two of Homer's Odyssey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter O'Sullivan. James Joyce in Context, Volume 1. Telemachus. Book 2 of Homer's Odyssey. Translated by Alexander Pope. Argument. The Council of Ithaca. Telemachus, in the assembly of the lords of Ithaca, complains of injustice done him by the suitors and insists upon their departure from his place, appealing to the princes, and exciting the people to declare against them. The suitors endeavor to justify their stay, at least till he shall send the queen to the court of Acarius, her father, which he refuses. There appears a prodigy of two eagles in the sky, which an augur expounds to the ruin of the suitors. Telemachus then demands a vessel to carry him to Pelos in Sparta, there to inquire of his father's fortunes. Pallas, in the shape of mentor, an ancient friend of Ulysses, helps him to a ship, assists him in preparing the necessities for the voyage, and embarks with him that night, which concludes the second day of the opening of the poem. The scene continues in the palace of Ulysses in Ithaca. Now reddening from the dawn, the morning ray glowed in the front of heaven and gave the day. The youthful hero, with returning light, rose anxious from the inquietudes of night. A royal robe he wore with graceful pride, a two-edged falchion threatened by his side. Embroidered sandals glittered as he trod, and forth he moved, majestic as a god. Then by his heralds, restless of delay, to council calls the peers. The peers obey. Soon as in solemn form the assembly sate, from his high dome himself descends in state. Bright in his hand a ponderous javelin shined, two dogs a faithful guard attend behind. Pallas, with great divine, his form improves, and gazing crowds admire him as he moves. His father's throne he filled, while distant stood the hoary peers, and aged wisdom bowed. Twas silence all, at last Egyptus spoke, Egyptus, by his age and sorrow broke. A length of days his soul with prudence crowned, a length of days had bent him to the ground. His eldest hope in arms to Ilion came, by great Ulysses taught the path to fame. But, hapless youth, the hideous Cyclops tore his quivering limbs and quaffed his spouting gore. Three sons remained to climb with haughty fires the royal bed euronymus aspires the rest with duteous love his griefs assuage and ease the sire of half the cares of age yet still his antiphus he loves he mourns and as he stood he spoke and wept by turns since great ulysses sought the phrygian plains within these walls inglorious silence reigns Say then, ye peers, by whose commands we meet? Why here once more in solemn council sit? Ye young, ye old, the weighty cause disclose. Arrive some message of invading foes? Or say, 
Does high necessity of state inspire some patriot and demand debate? The present synod speaks its author wise. Assist him, Jove, thou region of the skies. He spoke. Telemachus, with transport glows, embraced the omen and majestic rose. His royal hand the imperial scepter swayed, then thus, addressing to Egyptius, said, Reverend old man, lo here confessed he stands, by whom ye meet, my grief your care demands. No story I unfold of public woes, nor bear advices of impending foes. Peace and blessed land, and joys incessant crowned, of all this happy realm, I grieve alone. From my lost sire continual sorrows spring, the great, the good, your father and your king. Yet more, our house from its foundation bows, our foes are powerful, and your sons the foes. Hither, unwelcome to the queen they come, why seek they not the rich Icarian dome? If she must wed, from other hands require the dowry. Is Telemachus her sire? Yet through my court the noise of revel rings, And waste the wise frugality of kings. Scarce all my herds their luxury suffice, Scarce all my wine their midnight hours supplies, Safe in my youth, in riot still they grow, Nor in the hapless orphan dread a foe. But come at will, the time when manhood grants more powerful advocates than vain complaints. Approach that hour. Insufferable wrong cries to the gods, and vengeance sleeps too long. Rise then, ye peers, with virtuous anger rise. Your fame revere, but most the avenging skies. By all the deathless powers that reign above, by righteous Themis, and by thundering Jove, Themis, who gives to counsels or denies success, and humbles or confirms the wise, rise in my aid. Suffice the tears that flow for my lost sire, nor add new woe to woe. If e'er he bore the sword to strengthen ill, or, having power to wrong, betrayed the will, on me, on me your kindled wrath assuage, and bid the voice of lawless riot rage. If ruin to your royal race ye doom, Be you the spoilers, and our wealth consume. Then might we hope redress from juster laws, And raise all Ithaca to aid our cause. But while your sons commit the unpunished wrong, You make the arm of violence too strong. While thus he spoke, with rage and grief he frowned, and dashed the imperial sceptre to the ground. The big round tear hung trembling in his eye. The synod grieved, and gave a pitying sigh. Then silent sate, at length, Atinous burns with haughty rage, and sternly thus returns. O oh, insolence of youth, whose tongue affords such railing eloquence, and war of words, studious thy country's worthies to defame, Thy erring voice displays thy mother's shame. Elusive of the bridal day, she gives fond hopes to all, and all with hopes deceives. Did not the sun, through heaven's wide azure rolled, for three long years the royal fraud behold? While she, laborious in delusion, spread the spacious loom, and mixed the various thread. Where as to life the wondrous figures rise, Thus spoke the inventive queen with artful sighs. Though cold in death Ulysses breathes no more, Cease yet a while to urge the bridal hour, Cease till to great Laertes I bequeath The task of grief, his ornaments of death, Lest when the fates his royal ashes claim, The Grecian matrons taint my spotless fame, When he whom living mighty realms obeyed, shall want in death a shroud to grace his shade. Thus she, at once the generous train complies, nor fraud mistrusts in virtue's fair disguise. The work she plied, but studious of delay, by night reversed the labors of the day, while trice 
the sun his annual journey made, The conscious lamp the midnight fraud survey'd. Unheard, unseen, three years her arts prevail, The fourth her maid unfolds the amazing tale. We saw, as unperceived we took our stand, The backward labours of her faithless hand. Then urged, she perfects her illustrious toils, A wondrous monument of feminine wiles. But you, O peers, and thou, O prince, give ear, I speak aloud, that every Greek may hear. Dismiss the queen, and if her sire approves, Let him espouse her to the peer she loves. Bid instant to prepare the bridal train, Nor let a race of princess wait in vain. Though with a grace divine her soul is blest, And all Minerva breathes within her breast, in wondrous arts than woman more renowned, and more than woman with deep wisdom crowned. Though Tiro nor Mycenae match her name, not great Alemena the proud boasts of fame, yet thus by heaven adorned, by heaven's decree she shines with fatal excellence to thee. With thee, the bowl we drain, indulge the feast, till righteous heaven reclaim her stubborn breast, what though from pole to pole resounds her name? The sun's destruction waits the mother's fame. For, till she leaves thy court, it is decreed thy bowl to empty, and thy flock to bleed. While yet he speaks, Telemachus replies, E'en nature starts, and what ye ask denies. Thus shall I thus repay a mother's cares, Who gave me life and nursed my infant years? While sad on foreign shores Ulysses threads, Or glides a ghost with unapparent shades, How to Acarius in the bridal hour Shall I by waste undone refund the dower? How from my father should I vengeance dread? How would my mother curse my hated head? And while in wrath to vengeful fiends she cries, How from their hell would vengeful fiends arise abhorred by all accursed my name would grow the earth's disgrace and humankind my foe if this displease why urge ye here your stay haste from the court ye spoilers haste away waste in wild riot what your land allows there ply the early feast and late carouse but if to honor lost tis still decreed for you my howl shall flow, my flocks shall bleed. Judge, and assert my right, impartial Jove, By him, and all the immortal host above, A sacred oath. If heaven the power supply, Vengeance I vow, and for your wrongs ye die. With that two eagles from a mountain's height, By Jove's command, direct their rapid flight. Swift they descend, with wing to wing conjoined, Stretch their broad plumes, and float above the wind. Above the assembled peers they wheel on high, And clang their wings, and hovering beat the sky. With ardent eyes the rival train they threat, And shrieking loud denounce approaching fate. They cuff, they tear, their cheeks and neck they rend, and from their plumes huge drops of blood descend. Then, sailing o'er the domes and towers, they fly, full toward the east, and mount into the sky. The wondering rivals gaze, and with cares oppressed, and chilling horrors freeze in every breast, till, big with knowledge of approaching woes, the prince of augurs, Halithrases, rose, Prescient he viewed the aerial tracks, And drew a sure presage from every wing that flew. Ye sons, he cried, of Ithaca, give ear, Hear all, but chiefly you, O rivals, hear. Destruction sure o'er all your heads and pens, Ulysses comes, and death his steps attends. Nor to the great alone is death decreed. We and our guilty Ithaca must bleed. Why cease we then the wrath of heaven to stay? Be humbled all, 
and lead, ye great, the way. For lo, my words no fancied woes relate, I speak from science and the voice of fate. When great Ulysses sought the Phrygian shores to shake with war proud Ilion's lofty towers, deeds then undone, me faithful tongue foretold. Heaven sealed my words, and you those deeds behold. I see, I cried, his woes a countless train, I see his friends o'erwhelmed beneath the main. How twice ten years from shore to shore he roams, now twice ten years are past, and now he comes. To whom Eurymachus, fly, dotted fly, with thy wise dreams and fables of the sky, go prophecy at home, thy sons advise. Here thou art sage and vain, I better read the skies, unnumbered birds glide through the aerial way, vagrants of the air, and unforeboding stray. Cold in the tomb, or in the deeps below, Ulysses lies, or wert thou laid as low. Then would that busy head no broils suggest, For fire to rage Tele Telemachus's breast. From him some bribe thy venal tongue requires, And interest, not the god, thy voice inspires. His guideless youth, if thy experience aged, mislead fallacious into idle rage. Vengeance deserve thy malice shall repress, and but augment the wrongs thou wouldst redress. Telemachus may bid the queen repair to great Icarius, whose paternal care will guide her passion and reward her choice with wealthy dower and bridal gifts of price. Till she retires, determined we remain, And both the prince and augur treat in vain. His pride of words and thy wild dream of fate Move not the brave, or only move their hate. Threat on, O prince, elude the bridal day, Threat on till all thy shores in waste decay. True, Greece affords a train of lovely dames, in wealth and beauty worthy of our flames. But never from this nobler suit we cease, for wealth and beauty less than virtue please. To whom the youth. Since then in vain I tell my numerous woes, in silence let them dwell. But heaven and all the Greeks have heard my wrongs, to heaven and all the Greeks redress belongs. Yet this I ask, nor be it asked in vain, A bark to waft me o'er the rolling main, The realms of Peel and Sparta to explore, And seek my royal sire from shore to shore, If, or to fame his doubtful fate be known, Or to be learned from oracles alone, If yet he lives with patience I forbear, till the fleet hours restore the circling year. But if already wandering in the train of empty shades, I measure back the main, plant the fair column o'er the mighty dead, and yield his consort to the nuptial bed. He ceased, and while abashed the peers attend, Mentor arose, Ulysses' faithful friend, when fierce in arms he sought the scenes of war. My friend, he cried, my palace be thy care. Years rolled on years, my godlike sire decay. Guard thou his age, and his behests obey. Stern as he rose, he cast his eyes around, that flashed with rage as he spoke, he frowned. Oh, never, never more let king be just, be mild in power or faithful to his trust. Let tyrants govern with an iron rod, oppress, destroy, and be the scourge of God. Since he who like a father held his reign, so soon forgot, was just and mild in vain. True, while my friend is grieved, his griefs I share, yet now the rivals are my smallest care. 
They for the mighty mischiefs they devise, Ere long shall pay, their forfeit lives the price. But against you, ye Greeks, ye coward train, Gods, how my soul is moved with just disdain! Dumb ye all stand, and not one tongue affords His injured prince the little aid of words. Yet while he spoke, Leocritus rejoined, O pride of words, and arrogance of mind, Wouldst thou to rise in arms, the Greeks advise? Join all your powers in arms, ye Greeks arise. Yet would your powers in vain our strength oppose? The valiant few, or match a host of foes. Should great Ulysses stern appear in arms, While the bowl circles and the banquet warms, Though to his breast his spouse with transport flies, Torn from her breast, that hour Ulysses dies. But hence, retreating to your domes, repair, To arm the vessel, mentor, be thy care, And Halithrases, thine, be each his friend, Ye love the father, go the son attend. But yet I trust, the boaster means to stay Safe in the court, nor tempt the watery way. Then, with a rushing sound, the assembly bend diverse their steps. The rival rout ascend the royal dome, while sad the prince explores the neighboring main, and sorrowing treads the shores. There, as the waters o'er his hands he shed, the royal suppliant to Minerva prayed. O goddess, who descending from the skies vouchsafe thy present to my wandering eyes, by whose commands the raging deeps I trace, and seek my sire through storms and rolling seas. Hear from thy heavens above, O warrior maid, descend once more, propitious to my aid. Without thy presence, vain is thy command, Greece and the rival train thy voice withstand. Indulgent to his prayer, the goddess took sage mentor's form, and thus like mentor spoke. O prince, in early youth divinely wise, born, the Ulysses of thy age to rise, if to the son the father's worth descends, o'er the wide wave success thy ways attends. To tread the walks of death he stood prepared, and what he greatly thought, he nobly dared. Were not his wise sons descendant of the wise, and did not heroes from brave heroes rise? Vain were my hopes, few sons attend the praise of their great sires, and most their sires disgrace. But since thy veins paternal virtue fires, And all Penelope thy soul inspires, Go and succeed, the rival's aims despise, For never, never wicked man was wise. Blind they rejoice, though now, even now they fall, Death hastes amain, one hour overwhelms them all, And lo, with speed we plough the watery way, my power shall guard thee, and my hand convey. The winged vessel, studious I prepare, Through seas and realms companion of thy care. Though to the court ascend, and to the shores, When night advances, bear the naval stores, Bread that decaying man with strength supplies, And generous wine which thoughtful sorrow flies. Meanwhile the mariners, by my command shall speed aboard a valiant chosen band. Wide o'er the bay, by vessel, vessel rides, the best I chose to waft then o'er the tides. She spoke. To his high dome the prince returns, and, as he moves, with royal anguish mourns. T'was riot all among the lawless train, boar bled by boar, and goat by goat lay slain. Arrived his hand, the gay Atinous pressed, And thus deriding with smile addressed, Grieve not, O daring prince, that noble heart, Ill suits gay youth the stern heroic part, Indulge the genial hour, 
unbend thy soul, Leave thought to age, and drain the flowing bowl. Studious to ease thy grief, our care provides the bark, To waft thee o'er the swelling tides. Is this, returns the prince, for mirth a time? When lawless gluttons riot, mirth's a crime? The luscious wines dishonored lose their taste? The song is noise, and impious is the feast? Suffice it to have spent with swift decay the wealth of kings, and made my youth a prey. But now the wise instructions of the sage, and manly thoughts inspired by manly age, teach me to seek redress for all my woe, here or in pile, in pile, for here your foe. Deny your vessels, ye deny in vain, a private voyager I pass the main. Free breathe the winds, and free the billows flow, And where on earth I live, I live your foe. He spoke and frowned, nor longer deigned to stay, Sternly his hand withdrew, and strode away. Meanwhile, o'er all the dome they quaff, they feast, Derisive taunts were spread from guest to guest, And each in jovial mood his mate addressed. Tremble ye not, O friends, and coward fly, Doomed by the stern Telemachus to die, To pile or Sparta to demand supplies, Big with revenge the mighty warrior flies, Or comes from Ephyr with poisons fraught, And kills us all in one tremendous draught? Or who can say, his gamesome mate replies, But while the danger of the deeps he tries, He, like his sire, may sink deprived of breath, And punish us unkindly by his death. What mighty labours would then he create To seize his treasures and divide his state, The royal palace to his queen convey, Or him she blesses in the bridal day? Meantime the lofty rooms the prince surveys, And where lay the treasures of the Ithacan race, here ruddy brass and gold refulgent blazed, There polished chests and broidered vestures graced, Here jars of oil breathed forth the rich perfume, There casks of wine and rose adorned the dome, Pure flavorous wine, by gods in bounty given, And worthy to exalt the feasts of heaven. Untouched they stood, till his long labors O'er the great Ulysses reached his native shore, a double strength of bars secured the gates, Fast by the door the wise Eurycleia waits. Eurycleia, who great ops thy lineage shared, And watched all night, all day a faithful guard, To whom the prince, O thou whose guardian care Nursed the most wretched king that breathes the air, Untouched, and sacred may these vessels stand till great Ulysses views his native land. But by thy care twelve urns of wine be filled, next these in worth, and firm these urns be sealed, and twice ten measures of the choicest flower prepared are yet descends the evening hour. For when the flavoring shades of night arise, And peaceful slumbers close my mother's eyes, Me from our coast shall spreading sails convey To seek Ulysses through the watery way. While he spoke, she filled the walls with cries, And tears ran trickling from her aged eyes. Oh, whither, whither flies my son, she cried, to realms that rocks and roaring seas divide. In foreign lands thy father's days decayed, And foreign lands contain the mighty dead. The watery way ill-fated if you try, All, all must perish, and by fraud you die. Then stay, my child, storms beat and rolls the main, O oh, beat those storms! and roll the seas in vain. Far hence, replied the prince, thy fears be driven. Heaven calls me forth, 
these counsels are of heaven, but by the powers that hate the perjured, swear to keep my voyage from the royal ear, nor uncompelled the dangerous truth betray, till twice six times descends the lamp of day. Lest the sad tale a mother's life impair, and grief destroy what time a while would spare. Thus he. The matron with uplifted eyes attests the all-seeing sovereign of the skies. Then studious she prepares the choicest flower, the strength of wheat and wines of ample store. While to the rival train the prince returns, the martial goddess with impatience burns. Like thee, Telemachus, in voice and size, with speed divine from street to street she flies, she bids the mariners prepared to stand, when night descends, embodied on the strand. Then to Narman swift she runs, she flies and asks a bark, the chief a bark supplies. And now, declining with his sloping wheels, down sunk the sun behind the western hills. The goddess shoved the vessel from the shores, and stowed within its womb the naval stores, full in the openings of the spacious main it rides, and now descends the sailor's train. Next to the court, impatient of delay, with rapid step the goddess urged her way. There every eye with slumberous chains she bound, and dashed the flowing goblet to the ground. Drowsy they rose, with heavy fumes oppressed, reeled from the palace, and retired to rest. Then thus, in mentor's fo reverend form arrayed, spoke to Telemachus, the martial maid. Lo, on the seas prepared the vessel stands, the impatient mariner thy speed demands. Swift as she spoke, with rapid pace she leads, the footsteps of the deity he treads. Swift to the shore they moved along the strands, the ready vessel rides, the sailors ready stand. He bids them bring their stores, the attending train load the tall bark, and launch into the main, the prince and goddess to the stern ascend, to the strong stroke at once the rowers bend. Full from the west she bids fresh breezes blow, the sable billows foam and roar below. The chief his orders gives, the obedient band with due observance wait the chief's command. With speed they ma the mass they rear, with speed unbind the spacious sheet, and stretch it to the wind. High o'er the roaring waves, the spreading sails bow the tall mast and swell before the gales. The crooked keel the parting surge divides, and to the stern retreating roll the tides. And now they ship their oars, and crown with wine the holy goblet to the powers divine, imploring all the gods that reign above, but chief the blue-eyed progeny of Jove. Thus all the night they stem the liquid way, and end their voyage with the morning ray. End of Book Two of Homer's Odyssey. The Council of Trent, the twenty second session. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kalinda James Joyce in Context, Volume 1, Telemachus The Council of Trent, the Twenty-Second Session The Canons and Decrees of the Sacred and Ecumenical Council of Trent Edited and Translated J. Waterworth Session the Twenty-Second Being the Sixth under the Sovereign Pontiff Pius the Fourth Celebrated on the 17th of September 1562. Doctrine on the Sacrifice of the Mass. The sacred and holy, ecumenical and general synod of Trent, lawfully assembled in the Holy Ghost, the same legates of the apostolic sect presiding therein, 
to the end that the ancient, complete, and in every part perfect faith and doctrine touching the great mystery of the Eucharist may be retained in the Holy Catholic Church, and may, all errors and heresies being repelled, be preserved in its own purity. The Synod, instructed by the illumination of the Holy Ghost, teaches, declares, and decrees what follows, to be preached to the faithful, on the subject of the Eucharist, considered as being a true and singular sacrifice. CHAPTER I. ON THE INSTITUTION OF THE MOST HOLY SACRIFICE OF THE MASS. For as much as, under the former testament, according to the testimony of the Apostle Paul, there was no perfection, because of the weakness of the Levitical priesthood, there was need, God the Father of mercies so ordaining, that another priest should rise, according to the order of Melchizedek, our Lord Jesus Christ, who might consummate and lead to what is perfect, as many as were to be sanctified. He, therefore, our God and Lord, though he was about to offer himself once on the altar of the cross unto God the Father by means of his death, there to operate an eternal redemption, nevertheless, because that his priesthood was not to be extinguished by his death in the Last Supper, on the night in which he was betrayed, that he might leave to his own beloved spouse the church a visible sacrifice, such as the nature of man requires, whereby that bloody sacrifice, once to be accomplished on the cross, might be represented, and the memory thereof remain even unto the end of the world, and its salutary virtue be applied to the remission of those sins which we daily commit. Declaring himself constituted a priest for ever, according to the order of Melchizedek, he offered up to God the Father his own body and blood under the species of bread and wine, and, under the symbols of those same things, he delivered his own body and blood to be received by his apostles, whom he then constituted priests of the New Testament, and by those words, Do this in commemoration of me, he commanded them and their successors in the priesthood to offer them, even as the Catholic Church has always understood and taught. For, Having celebrated the ancient Passover, which the multitude of the children of Israel immolated in memory of their going out of Egypt, he instituted the new Passover, to wit, himself to be immolated, under visible signs, by the church, through the ministry of priests, in memory of his own passage from this world unto the Father, when, by the effusion of his own blood, he redeemed us, and delivered us from the power of darkness, and translated us into his kingdom. And this is indeed that clean oblation which cannot be defiled by any unworthiness or malice of those that offer it, which the Lord foretold by Malachias was to be offered in every place clean to his name, which was to be great amongst the Gentiles, and which the Apostle Paul, writing to the Corinthians, has not obscurely indicated when he says that they who are defiled by the participation of the table of devils cannot be partakers of the table of the Lord, by the table, meaning in both places the altar. This, in fine, is that oblation which was prefigured by various types of sacrifices during the period of nature and of the law, inasmuch as it comprises all the good things signified by those sacrifices as being the consummation and perfection of them all. CHAPTER two, THAT THE SACRIFICE OF THE MASS IS PROPITIATORY BOTH FOR THE LIVING AND THE DEAD and forasmuch as, in this divine sacrifice which is celebrated in the Mass, that same Christ is contained and immolated in an unbloody manner, who once offered himself in a bloody manner on the altar of the cross. The Holy Synod teaches that this sacrifice is truly propitiatory, and that by means thereof this is effected, that we obtain mercy and find grace in seasonable aid, if we draw nigh unto God, contrite and penitent, with a sincere heart and upright faith, with fear and reverence. For the Lord, appeased by the oblation thereof, and granting the grace and gift of penitence, forgives even heinous crimes and sins. For the victim is one and the same, the same now offering by the ministry of priests, who then offered himself on the cross, the manner alone of offering being different. The fruits indeed of which oblation, of that bloody one to wit, are received most plentifully through this unbloody one, so far is this latter from derogating in any way from that former oblation. Wherefore, 
not only for the sins, punishments, satisfactions, and other necessities of the faithful who are living, but also for those who are departed in Christ, and who are not as yet fully purified, is it rightly offered, agreeably, to a tradition of the apostles. CHAPTER three, ON MASSES IN HONOR OF THE SAINTS and although the Church has been accustomed at times to celebrate certain masses in honor and memory of the saints, not therefore, however, doth she teach that sacrifice is offered unto them, but unto God alone who crowned them, whence neither is the priest wont to say, I offer sacrifice to thee, Peter, or Paul. But giving thanks to God for their victories, he implores their patronage, that they may vouchsafe to intercede for us in heaven, whose memory we celebrate upon earth. CHAPTER Four, ON THE CANON OF THE MASS And whereas it beseemeth that holy things be administered in a holy manner, and of all holy things this sacrifice is the most holy, to the end that it might be worthily and reverently offered and received, the Catholic Church instituted many years ago the sacred canon, so pure from every error, that nothing is contained therein which does not in the highest degree savor of a certain holiness and piety and raise up unto God the minds of those that offer. For it is composed out of the very words of the Lord, the traditions of the apostles, and the pious institutions also of holy pontiffs. CHAPTER V. ON THE SOLEMN CEREMONIES OF THE SACRIFICE OF THE MASS And whereas such is the nature of man, that without external helps he cannot easily be raised to the meditation of divine things, Therefore has Holy Mother Church instituted certain rites, to wit, that certain things be pronounced in the Mass in a low, and others in a louder tone. She has likewise employed ceremonies such as mystic benedictions, lights, incense, vestments, and many other things of this kind, derived from an apostolical discipline and tradition, whereby both the majesty of so great a sacrifice might be recommended, and the minds of the faithful be excited by those visible signs of religion and piety, to the contemplation of those most sublime things which are hidden in this sacrifice. CHAPTER six, ON MASS WHEREIN THE PRIEST ALONE COMMUNICATES The sacred and holy synod would fain indeed that at each Mass the faithful who are present should communicate, not only in spiritual desire, but also by the sacramental participation of the Eucharist, that thereby a more abundant fruit might be derived to them from this most holy sacrifice, but not therefore, if this be not always done, does it condemn as private and unlawful, but approves of and therefore commends those masses in which the priest alone communicates sacramentally, since those masses also ought to be considered as truly common, partly because the people communicate spiritually thereat, partly also because they are celebrated by a public minister of the church, not for himself only, but for all the faithful who belong to the body of Christ. CHAPTER Seven, ON THE WATER THAT IS TO BE MIXED WITH THE WINE TO BE OFFERED IN THE CHALICE The Holy Synod notices in the next place that it has been enjoined by the church on priests to mix water with the wine that is to be offered in the chalice, as well because it is believed that Christ the Lord did this, as also because from his side there came out blood and water, the memory of which mystery is renewed by this commixture, and whereas in the Apocalypse of Blessed John the peoples are called waters, the union of that faithful people with Christ, their head is hereby represented. CHAPTER Eight on not celebrating the Mass everywhere in the vulgar tone, the mysteries of the Mass, to be explained to the people. Although the Mass contains great instruction for the faithful people, nevertheless it has not seemed expedient to the fathers that it should be everywhere celebrated in the vulgar tongue. Wherefore, the ancient usage of each church, and the rite approved of by the Holy Roman Church, the mother and mistress of all churches, being in each place retained, and that the sheep of Christ may not suffer hunger, nor the little ones ask for bread, and there be none to break it unto them, the holy synod charges pastors and all who have the cure of souls, that they frequently, during the celebration of Mass, expound either by themselves or others some portion of those things which are read at Mass, and that, amongst the rest, they explain some mystery of this most holy sacrifice, especially on the Lord's days and festivals. CHAPTER nine. Preliminary Remark on the Following Canons 
and because that many errors are at this time disseminated, and many things are taught and maintained by diverse persons, in opposition to this ancient faith, which is based on the sacred gospel, the traditions of the apostles, and the doctrine of the holy fathers, the sacred and holy synod, after many and grave deliberations maturely had touching these matters, has resolved with the unanimous consent of all the fathers to condemn and to eliminate from holy church by means of the canon subjoined whatsoever is opposed to this most pure faith and sacred doctrine. On the Sacrifice of the Mass Canon 1 If any one saith that in the Mass a true and proper sacrifice is not offered to God, or that to be offered is nothing else but that Christ is given us to eat, let him be anathema. Canon 2. If any one saith that by those words, Do this for the commemoration of me, Luke 22.19, Christ did not institute the apostles priest, or did not ordain that they and other priests should offer his own body and blood, let him be anathema. Canon 3. If any one saith that the sacrifice of the Mass is only a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, or that it is a bare commemoration of the sacrifice consummated on the cross, but not a propitiatory sacrifice, or that it profits him only who receives, and that it ought not to be offered for the living and the dead for sins, pains, satisfactions, and other necessities, let him be anathema. Canon 4 if any one saith that by the sacrifice of the Mass a blasphemy is cast upon the most holy sacrifice of Christ consummated on the cross, or that it is thereby derogated from, let him be anathema. Canon 5. If any one saith that it is an imposture to celebrate Masses in honor of the saints, and for obtaining their intercession with God, as the Church intends, let him be anathema. Canon 6. If any one saith that the canon of the Mass contains errors, and is therefore to be abrogated, let him be anathema. Canon 7. If any one saith that the ceremonies, vestments, and outward signs which the Catholic Church makes use of in the celebration of Masses are incentives to impiety rather than offices of piety, let him be anathema. Canon 8. If any one saith that masses wherein the priest alone communicates sacramentally are unlawful and are therefore to be abrogated, let him be anathema. Canon 9. If any one saith that the rite of the Roman Church according to which a part of the canon and the words of consecration are pronounced in a low tone is to be condemned, or that the mass ought to be celebrated in the vulgar tongue only, or that the water ought not to be mixed with the wine that is to be offered in the chalice, for that it is contrary to the institution of Christ, let him be anathema. Decree concerning the things to be observed and to be avoided in the celebration of the Mass. What great care is to be taken that the sacred and holy sacrifice of the Mass be celebrated with all religious service and veneration, each one may easily imagine, who considers that in holy writ he is called accursed, who doth the work of God negligently and if we must needs confess that no other work can be performed by the faithful so holy and divine as this tremendous mystery itself, wherein that life-giving victim, by which we were reconciled to the Father, is daily immolated on the altar by priests, it is also sufficiently clear that all industry and diligence is to be applied to this end, that it be performed with the greatest possible inward cleanness and purity of heart, and outward show of devotion and piety. Whereas, therefore, either through the wickedness of the times, or through the carelessness and corruption of men, many things seem already to have crept in which are alien from the dignity of so great a sacrifice, to the end that the honor and cult due thereunto may, for the glory of God and the edification of the faithful people, be restored. The Holy Synod decrees that the ordinary bishops of places shall take diligent care, and be bound to prohibit and abolish all those things which either covetousness, which is a serving of idols, or irreverence, which can hardly be separated from impiety, or superstition, which is a false imitation of true piety, may have introduced. And that many things may be comprised in a few words. First, as relates to covetousness, they shall wholly prohibit all manner of conditions and bargains for recompenses, and whatsoever is given for the celebration of new masses, 
as also those importunate and illiberal demands rather than requests for alms and other things of the like sort which are but little removed from a simonical taint or at all events from filthy lucre in the next place that irreverence may be avoided each in his own diocese shall forbid that any wandering or unknown priest be allowed to celebrate mass furthermore they shall not allow any one who is publicly and notoriously stained with crime either to minister at the holy altar or to assist at the sacred services nor shall they suffer the holy sacrifice to be celebrated either by any seculars or regulars whatsoever in private houses or at all out of the church and those oratories which are dedicated solely to divine worship and which are to be designated and visited by the said ordinaries and not then unless those who are present shall have first shown by their decently composed outward appearance that they are there not in body only but also in mind and devout affection of heart they shall also banish from churches all those kinds of music in which whether by the organ or in the singing there is mixed up anything lascivious or impure as also all secular actions vain and therefore profane conversations all walking about noise and clamour that so the house of god may be seen to be and may be called truly a house of prayer lastly that no room may be left for superstition they shall by ordinance and under given penalties provide that priests do not celebrate at other than due hours nor employ other rites or other ceremonies and prayers in the celebration of masses besides those which have been approved of by the church and have been received by a frequent and praiseworthy usage they shall wholly banish from the church the observance of a fixed number of certain masses and candles as being the invention of superstitious worship rather than of true religion and they shall instruct the people what is and whence especially is derived the fruit so precious and heavenly of this most holy sacrifice they shall also admonish their people to repair frequently to their own parish churches, at least on the Lord's days and the greater festivals. All, therefore, that has been briefly enumerated is in such wise propounded to all ordinaries of places as that by the power given them by this sacred and holy synod, and even as delegates to the apostolic see, they may prohibit, ordain, reform, and establish not only the things aforesaid, but also whatsoever else shall seem to them to have relation hereunto and may compel the faithful people inviolably to observe them by ecclesiastical censures and other penalties which at their pleasure they may appoint any privileges exemptions appeals and customs whatsoever to the contrary notwithstanding decree on reformation the same sacred and holy ecumenical and general synod of trent lawfully assembled in the holy ghost the same legates of the apostolic see presiding therein to the end that the business of reformation may be proceeded with has thought good that the following things be ordained in the present session chapter one the canons relative to the life and property of conduct of clerics are renewed there is nothing that continually instructs others unto piety and the service of god more than the life and example of those who have dedicated themselves to the divine ministry for as they are seen to be raised to a higher position above the things of this world others fix their eyes upon them as a mirror and derive from them what they are to imitate wherefore clerics called to have the lord for their portion ought by all means so to regulate their whole life and conversation as that in their dress comportment gait discourse and all things else nothing appear but what is grave regulated and replete with religiousness avoiding even slight faults which in them would be most grievous that so their actions may impress all with veneration whereas therefore the more useful and decorous these things are for the church of god the more carefully also are they to be attended to the holy synod ordains that those things which have been heretofore copiously and wholesomely enacted by sovereign pontiffs and sacred councils relative to the life propriety of conduct dress and learning of clerics and also touching the luxuriousness feastings dances gambling sports and all sorts of crime whatever as also the secular employments to be by them shunned the same shall be henceforth observed under the same penalties or greater to be imposed at the discretion of the ordinary nor shall any appeal suspend the execution hereof as relating to the correction of manners but if anything of the above shall be found to have fallen into desuetude, they shall make it their care that it be brought again into use as soon as possible, 
and be accurately observed by all, any customs to the contrary notwithstanding, lest they themselves may have, God being the avenger, to pay the penalty deserved by their neglect of the correction of those subject to them. CHAPTER Two, WHO ARE TO BE PROMOTED TO CATHEDRAL CHURCHES Whosoever is hereafter to be promoted to a cathedral church shall not only be fully qualified by birth, age, morals, and life, and in other respects, as required by the sacred canons, but shall also have been previously constituted in sacred order, for the space of at least six months. And information on these points, if the individual be only recently or not at all known at the court of Rome, shall be derived from the legates of the apostolic see or from the nuncios of the provinces, or from his ordinary, and in his default, from the nearest ordinaries. And besides the things above named, he shall possess such learning as to be able to discharge the obligations of the office that is about to be conferred upon him. And he shall, therefore, have been previously promoted by merit in some university for studies, to be a master or doctor or licentiate in sacred theology or in canon law, or shall be declared by the public testimony of some academy fit to teach others. And, if he be a regular, he shall have a similar attestation from the superiors of his own order, and all the above-named persons from whom the information or testimony aforesaid is to be derived shall be bound to report on these matters faithfully and gratuitously, otherwise let them know that their consciences will be grievously burthened, and that God and their own superiors will punish them. CHAPTER three, Daily distributions out of the third part of all fruits soever are to be established on whom the portion of absentees devolves, certain cases excepted. Bishops, even as the delegates of the apostolic see, shall have power to divide the third part of any manner of fruits and proceeds of all dignities, personates, and offices existing in cathedral or collegiate churches, into distributions to be assigned as they shall judge fit in such wise to wit, that if those who ought to receive them should fail on any appointed day personally to discharge the duty that devolves upon them, according to the form that shall be prescribed by the said bishops, they shall forfeit that day's distribution, and shall acquire no manner of property therein, but it shall be applied to the fabric of the church as far as it may need it, or to some other pious place at the discretion of the ordinary. But if their contumacy increase, they shall proceed against them according to the constitution of the sacred canons. But if any of the aforesaid dignitaries has, neither by right nor custom, any jurisdiction, administration, or office devolving upon him in the cathedral or collegiate churches, but out of the city in the same diocese there is a cure of souls to be attended to, which he who holds that dignity is willing to take upon himself, in this case, during the time that he shall reside and minister in the church with that cure, he shall be considered as though he were present and assisted at the divine offices in those cathedral or collegiate churches. These things are to be understood as appointed for those churches only wherein there is no custom or statute whereby the said dignitaries who do not serve lose something, which amounts to the third part of the said fruits and proceeds. Any customs, even though immemorial, exemptions and constitutions, even though confirmed by oath or by any authority whatsoever to the contrary, notwithstanding. CHAPTER four. Those not initiated into a sacred order shall not have a voice in the chapter of any cathedral or collegiate church, the qualifications and duties of those who hold benefices therein. Whosoever being employed in the divine offices in a cathedral or collegiate, secular or regular church, is not constituted in the order of subdeaconship at least, shall not have a voice in the chapter of those churches, even though this may have been voluntarily conceded to him by the others. As to those who possess, or shall hereafter possess, in the said churches, any dignities, personates, offices, prebends, portions, and any other manner of benefices whatever, to which various obligations are annexed, such as that some shall say or sing mass, others the gospel, others the epistle, they shall be bound, all just impediment ceasing, to receive the requisite orders within a year, whatsoever may be their privilege, exemption, prerogative, or nobility of birth. Otherwise they shall incur the penalties enacted by the constitution of the Council of Vienne, which begins ut i qui, which by this present decree is renewed, and the bishop shall compel them to exercise in person the aforesaid orders on the appointed days, and to discharge all the other duties required of them in the divine service, under the said penalties, and others even more grievous, which may be imposed at their discretion. 
nor, for the future, shall any such office be assigned to any but those who shall be well known fully to have already the age and other qualifications. Otherwise, such provision shall be null. Chapter 5. Dispensations expedited out of the Roman court shall be committed to the bishop, and be by him examined. Dispensations, by whatsoever authority they are to be granted, if they are to be consigned out of the Roman court, shall be consigned to the ordinaries of those who shall have obtained them. And as to those dispensations which shall be granted as graces, they shall not have effect until the said ordinaries, as delegates of the apostolic see, shall have first ascertained summarily only and extrajudicially that the terms of the petition do not labor under the vice of surreption or abruption. Chapter 6. Last Intentions to be Altered with Caution in alterations of last wills, which alterations ought not to be made except for a just and necessary cause, the bishops, as delegates of the apostolic see, shall, before the alterations aforesaid are carried into execution, ascertain that nothing has been stated in the prayer of the petition which suppresses what is true or suggests what is false. Chapter 7. The chapter Romana, in the sixth of the Decretals, is renewed. Apostolic legates and nuncios, patriarchs, primates, and metropolitans, in appeals interposed before them, shall, in all causes whatsoever, as well as in admitting the appeals, as in granting inhibitions after an appeal, be bound to observe the form and tenor of the sacred constitutions, and especially of the constitution of Innocent the Fourth, beginning Romana. Any custom, even though immemorial, or usage or privilege to the contrary notwithstanding, otherwise the inhibitions and proceedings, and all the consequences thereof shall be ipso jure null. Chapter 8. Bishops shall execute the pious dispositions of all persons, shall visit all manner of pious places, if not under the immediate protection of kings. The bishops, even as the delegates of the apostolic see, shall, in the cases by law permitted, be the executors of all pious dispositions, whether made by last will, or between the living, they shall have a right to visit all manner of hospitals, colleges, and confraternities of laymen, even those which are called schools, or which go by any other name, but not, however, those places which are under the immediate protection of kings, except with their permission. Also the elemicinary institutions, called Mont de Piet, or of charity, and all pious places by whatsoever name designated, even though the aforesaid institutions be under the care of laymen, and though the said pious places be protected by a privilege of exemption, and by virtue of their office, they shall take cognizance of, and see to the performance, in accordance with the ordinances of the sacred canons, of all things that have been instituted for God's worship, for the salvation of souls, or for the support of the poor. Any custom, even though immemorial, or privilege, or statute whatsoever to the contrary notwithstanding. CHAPTER nine. Administrators of any pious places whatsoever shall give in their accounts to the ordinary, unless it be otherwise provided by the foundation. The administrators, whether ecclesiastical or lay, of the fabric of any church whatsoever, even though it be a cathedral, as also of any hospital, confraternity, charitable institution, called Mont de Piet, and of any pious places whatsoever, shall be bound to give in once a year an account of their administration to the ordinary, all customs and privileges to the contrary being set aside, unless it should happen that, in the institution and regulations of any church or fabric, it has been otherwise expressly provided. But if from custom or privilege or some regulation of the place their account has to be rendered to others deputed thereunto, in that case the ordinary shall also be employed jointly with them, and all acquittances given otherwise shall be of no avail to the said administrators. CHAPTER Ten, Notaries shall be subject to the examination and judgment of the bishops. Whereas the unskilfulness of notaries causes very many injuries, and gives occasion to many lawsuits, the bishop, even as the delegate of the apostolic see, may, by actual examination, search into the competency of all notaries, even though created by apostolic, imperial, or royal authority, and if such notaries be found incompetent, or on any occasion guilty of a delinquency in the discharge of their office, he may forbid them, altogether or for a time, to exercise that office, in ecclesiastical and spiritual affairs, lawsuits and causes, nor shall any appeal on their part suspend the prohibition of the ordinary. CHAPTER eleven, Usurpers of the property of any church or pious place are punished. If any cleric or layman, by whatsoever dignity preeminent, 
be he even emperor or king, should be so possessed by covetousness, that root of all evils, as to presume to convert to his own use, and to usurp, by himself or by others, by force or fear, or even by means of any supposititious persons, whether lay or clerical, or by any artifice, or under any colorable pretext whatsoever, the jurisdictions, property, rents, and rights, even those held in fee or under lease, the fruits, emoluments, or any sources of revenue whatsoever belonging to any church, or to any benefice, whether secular or regular, mont de piet, or to any other pious places which ought to be employed for the necessities of the ministers thereof, and of the poor, or shall presume to hinder them, in any of the ways aforesaid, from being received by those unto whom they of right belong, he shall lie under an anathema, until he shall have wholly restored to the church, and to the administrator or beneficiary thereof, the jurisdictions, property, effects, rights, fruits, and revenues which he has seized upon, or, in whatsoever way they have come to him, even by way of a gift from a supposititious person, and until he shall, furthermore, have obtained absolution from the Roman pontiff. And if he be the patron of the said church, he shall, besides the penalties aforesaid, be thereupon deprived of the right of patronage. And the cleric who shall be the author of, or consenting to, any execrable fraud and usurpation of this kind, shall be subjected to the same penalties, as also he shall be deprived of all benefices whatsoever, and be rendered incapable of any others whatsoever. And even after entire satisfaction and absolution he shall be suspended from the exercise of his orders at the discretion of his ordinary. Decree touching the petition for the concession of the chalice. Moreover, whereas the same sacred and holy synod in the preceding session reserved unto another time for an opportunity that might present itself, two articles to be examined and defined, which articles had been proposed on another occasion, but had not then been as yet discussed, to wit, whether the reasons by which the holy Catholic Church was led to communicate, under the one species of bread, laymen, and also priests, when not celebrating, are in such wise to be adhered to, as that on no account is the use of the chalice to be allowed to any one soever, and whether in that case, for reasons beseeming and consonant with Christian charity, it appears that the use of the chalice is to be granted to any nation or kingdom, it is to be conceded under certain conditions, and what are those conditions? It has now, in its desire that the salvation of those on whose behalf the request is made, may be provided for in the best manner, decreed that the whole business be referred to our most holy Lord, as by this present decree it doth refer it, who, of his singular prudence, will do that which he shall judge useful for the Christian commonwealth, and salutary for those who ask for the use of the chalice. Indiction of the next session. Moreover, this sacred and holy synod of Trent appoints for the day of the next session, the Thursday after the octave of all saints, which will be the twelfth day of the month of November, and thereon it will decree concerning the sacrament of order, and the sacrament of matrimony, etc. The session was prorogued until the fifteenth day of July, 1563. End of Doctrine on the Sacrifice of the Mass Psalm 42 to Yechim. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vera Nguyen. James Joyce in Context, Volume 1, Telemachus. Psalm 42 to Yechim. A Psalm for David. Judge me, O God, and distinguish my cause from a nation that is not holy. Deliver me from the unjust and deceitful man. For thou art God my strength, why hast thou cast me off? And why do I go sorrowful whilst the enemy afflicteth me? Send forth thy light and thy truth. They have conducted me, and brought me unto thy holy hill, and into thy tabernacles. And I will go into the altar of God, to God who giveth joy to my youth. To thee, O God my God. I will give praise upon the harp. Well, thou say, O my soul, and why dost thou disquiet me? Hope in God, for I will still give praise to him, the salvation of my countenance and my God. End of Psalm 42, Dwechim. The Acts of the Apostles, Chapters 6 and 7, Due Reims Translation.
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daniel W. James Joyce in Context, Volume 1, Telemachus. The Acts of the Apostles, Chapters 6 and 7, Douay Reims Translation. And in those days, the number of the disciples increasing, there arose a murmuring of the Greeks against the Hebrews, for that their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve, calling together the multitude of the disciples, said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying was liked by all the multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they praying imposed hands upon them. And the word of the Lord increased, and the number of the disciples was multiplied in Jerusalem exceedingly. A great multitude also of the priests obeyed the faith. And Stephen, full of grace and fortitude, did great wonders and signs among the people. Now there arose some, of that which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and of the Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and of them that were of Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit that spoke. Then they suborned men to say that they had heard him speak words of blasphemy against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the ancients and the scribes, and running together, they took him and brought him to the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, This man seetheth not to speak words against the holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the traditions which Moses delivered unto us. And all that sat in the council, looking on him, saw his face as if it had been the face of an angel. Then the high priest said, Are these things so? Who said, Ye men, brethren, and fathers, hear! The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham, when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Sharon. And he said to him, Go forth out of thy country and from thy kindred, and come into the land which I shall show thee. Then he went out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Sharon. And from thence, after his father was dead, he removed him into this land, wherein you now dwell. And he gave him no inheritance in it, no, not a pace of the foot, but he promised to give it him in possession, and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. And God said to him, that his seed should sojourn in a strange country, and that they should bring them under bondage, and treat them evil for a hundred years. And the nation which they shall serve will I judge, said the Lord. And after these things they shall go out and shall serve me in this place. And he gave them the covenant of circumcision. And so he begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs, through envy, sold Joseph into Egypt. And God was with him, and delivered him out of all his tribulations. And he gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And he appointed him governor over Egypt and over all his house. Now there came a famine upon all Egypt and Shannon, and great tribulation, and our fathers found no food. But when Jacob had heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent our fathers first. And at the second time Joseph was known by his brethren, and his kindred was made known to Pharaoh. And Joseph sending called thither Jacob, his father, and all his kindred, seventy-five souls. So Jacob went down into Egypt, and he died, and our fathers. And they were translated into Sechem, and were laid in the sepulchre that Abram bought for a sum of money for the sons of Hamor, the son of Sechem. And when the time of the promise drew near, which God had promised to Abraham, the people increased and were multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose in Egypt, who knew not Joseph. This same, dealing craftily with our race, afflicted our fathers that they should expose their children, to the end that they might not be kept alive, at the same time was Moses born, and he was acceptable to God, who was nourished three months in his father's house. And when he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. 
and Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in his words and in his deeds. And when he was full forty years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And when he had seen one of them suffer wrong, he defended him, and striking the Egyptian, he avenged him who suffered the injury. And he thought that his brethren understood that God by his hand would save them, but they understood it not. And the day following he showed himself to them when they were at strife, and would have reconciled them in peace, saying, Men, ye are brethren, why hurt you one another? But he that did the injury to his neighbor thrust him away, saying, Who hath appointed thee, prince, and judge over us? What, wilt thou kill me, as thou didst yesterday kill the Egyptian? And Moses fled upon this word, and was a stranger in the land of Madian, where he begot two sons. And when forty years were expired, there appeared to him in the desert of Mount Sinai an angel in a flame of fire in a bush. And Moses, seeing it, wondered at the sight. And as he drew near to view it, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses, being terrified, durst not behold. And the Lord said to him, Loose the shoes from thy feet, for the place wherein thou standest is holy ground. Seeing, I have seen the affliction of my people which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning, and I am come down to deliver them. And now come, and I will send thee into Egypt. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who hath appointed thee prince and judge? Him God sent to be prince and redeemer, by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the burning bush. He brought them out, doing wonders and signs in the land of Egypt, and in the Red Sea, and in the desert for forty years. This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, A prophet shall God raise up to you of your own brethren, as myself. Him you shall hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness, with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, who received the words of life to give unto us, whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him away, and in their hearts turned back into Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. For as for this Moses, who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we know not what is become of him. And they made a calf in those days, and offered sacrifices to the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. And God turned and gave them up to serve the host of heaven, as it is written in the books of the prophets. Did you offer victims and sacrifices to me for forty years in the desert, O house of Israel? And you took unto you the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Rempham, figures which you made to adore them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. The tabernacle of the testimony was with our fathers in the desert, as God ordained for them, speaking to Moses that he should make it according to the form which he had seen, which also our fathers receiving brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David, who found grace before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house, yet the Most High dwelleth not in houses made by hands, as the prophet saith, Heaven is my throne, and the earth my footstool. What house will you build me, saith the Lord, or what is the place of my resting? Hath not my hand made all these things? You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do you also. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them who foretold of the coming of the Just One, of whom you have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of the angels and have not kept it. <sighs> now hearing these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed with their teeth at him. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looking up steadfastly to heaven, saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And they, crying out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and with one accord ran violently upon him. And casting him forth without the city, they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, invoking and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling on his knees, he cried with a loud voice, saying, Lord, lay not his sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep in the Lord, and Saul was consenting to his death. 
End of Acts of the Apostles, chapters 6 and 7, Douay Reims translation. Recording by Daniel W. The Age of Fable, Daedalus by Thomas Bullfinch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Alan Davis Drake. James Joyce in Context, Volume 1, Telemachus. The Age of Fable, Daedalus by Thomas Bullfinch. Daedalus. The labyrinth from which Theseus escaped by means of the clue of Ariadne was built by Daedalus, a most skilful artificer. It was an edifice with numberless winding passages and turnings opening into one another, and seeming to have neither beginning nor end, like the river Meander, which turns on itself and flows now outward, now backward, in its course to the sea. Daedalus built a labyrinth for King Minos, but afterwards lost the favor of the king and was shut up in a tower. He contrived to make his escape from his prison, but could not leave the island by sea, as the king kept strict watch on all the vessels, and permitted none to sail without being carefully searched. Minos may control the land and the sea, said Daedalus, but not the regions of the air. I will try that way. So he set to work to fabricate wings for himself and his young son Icarus. He wrought feathers together, beginning with the smallest and adding larger, so as to form an increasing surface. The larger ones he secured with thread, and the smaller with wax, and gave the whole a gentle curvature like the wings of a bird. Icarus, the boy, stood and looked on, sometimes running to gather up the feathers which the wind had blown away and then handling the wax and working it over with his fingers, by his play impeding his father in his labors. When at last the work was done, the artist, waving his wings, found himself buoyed upward, and hung suspended, poising himself on the beaten air. He next equipped his son in the same manner, and taught him how to fly, as a bird tempts her young ones from the lofty nest into the air. When all was prepared for flight, he said, Icarus, my son, I charge you to keep at a moderate height, for if you fly too low, the damp will clog your wings, and if too high, the heat will melt them. Keep near me, and you will be safe. While he gave him these instructions and fitted the wings to his shoulders, the face of the father was wet with tears, and his hands trembled. He kissed the boy not knowing that it was for the last time. Then rising on his wings, he flew off, encouraging him to follow, and looked back from his own flight to see how his son managed his wings. As they flew, the plowman stopped his work to gaze, and the shepherd leaned on his staff and watched them, astonished at the sight, and thinking there were gods who could thus cleave the air. They passed Samos and Delos on the left, and Lebenthos on the right, when the boy, exalting in his career, began to leave the guidance of his companion and soar upward, as if to reach heaven. The nearness of the blazing sun softened the wax which held the feathers together, and they came off. He fluttered with his arms, but no feathers remained to hold the air. While his mouth uttered cries to his father, it was submerged in the blue waters of the sea, which thenceforth was called by his name. His father cried, Icarus, Icarus, where are you? At last he saw the feathers floating on the water, and bitterly lamenting his own arts, he burned the body and called the land Icaria, in memory of his child. Daedalus arrived safe in Sicily, where he built a temple to Apollo and hung up his wings, an offering to the god. Daedalus was so proud of his achievements that he could not bear the idea of a rival. His sister had placed her son Perdix under his charge, to be taught the mechanical arts. He was an apt scholar and gave striking evidence of ingenuity. Walking on the seashore, 
he picked up the spine of a fish. Imitating it, he took a piece of iron and notched it on the edge, and thus invented the saw. He put two pieces of iron together and connected them at one end with a rivet, and sharpening the other ends, and made a pair of compasses. Daedalus was so envious of his nephew's performances that he took an opportunity, when they were together one day on the top of a high tower, to push him off. But Minerva, who favors ingenuity, saw him falling, and arrested his fate by changing him into a bird called after his name, the Partridge. This bird does not build its nest in the trees, nor take lofty flights, but nestles in the hedges, and mindful of his fall, avoids high places. The death of Icarus is told in the following lines by Darwin. And melting wax and loosened strings sank hapless Icarus on unfaithful wings. Headlong he rushed through the affrighted air, with limbs distorted and dishevelled hair. His scattered plumage danced upon the wave, and sorrowing nereids decked his watery grave. O'er his pale course their pearly sea-flowers shed, and strewed with crimson moss his marbled bed, stuck in their coral towers the passing bell, and wild in ocean tolled his echoing knell. End of The Age of Fable Daedalus by Thomas Bullfinch The Roman Breviary Liturgy for the Feast of John Chrysostomos This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Martin Giessen James Joyce in Context, Volume 1, Telemachus The Roman Breviary Liturgy for the Feast of John Chrysostomos Collect of the Day Let us pray. O Lord, who didst vouchsafe to illumine thy church with the wondrous righteousness and doctrine of thy blessed confessor and bishop, St. Chrysostom, grant, we beseech thee, that the bounty of thy heavenly grace may evermore increase and multiply the same. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord loved him and adorned him. He clothed him with a robe of glory. O Doctor, right excellent, O light of holy church, O blessed John Chrysostom, lover of the divine law, entreat for us the Son of God. Let us pray. O Lord, who didst vouchsafe to illumine thy church with the wondrous righteousness and doctrine of thy blessed confessor and bishop, St. Chrysostom, grant, we beseech thee, that the bounty of thy heavenly grace may evermore increase and multiply the same. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If any man shall come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree, and shall spread abroad like a cedar in Libanus. Let us pray. O God, who makest us glad with the yearly festival of blessed Polycarp, thy martyr and bishop, mercifully grant that as we now observe his heavenly birthday, so we may likewise rejoice in his protections. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Matins First Nocturne Graciously hear, O Lord Jesu Christ, the prayers of thy servants, and have mercy upon us, who with the Father and the Holy Ghost livest and reignest for ever and ever. Amen. Vouchsafe, Reverend Father, thy blessing. May the Father Eternal bless us with a never-ending blessing. Amen. He that giveth his mind to the law of the Most High will seek out the wisdom of all the ancients, and be occupied in prophecies. He will keep the sayings of the renowned men, and where subtle parables are, he will be there also. 
he will seek out the secrets of grave sentences, and be conversant in dark parables. He shall serve among great men, and appear before princes. He will travel through strange countries, for he hath tried the good and evil among men. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Lord, thou deliveredst unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Vouchsafe, reverend Father, thy blessing. May the Son of God, the Soul begotten, mercifully bless and keep us. Amen. The righteous will give his heart to resort early to the Lord that made him, and will pray before the Most High, and will open his mouth in prayer and make supplication for his sins. When the great Lord will, he shall be filled with the spirit of understanding, he shall pour out wise sentences, and give thanks unto the Lord in his prayer. He shall direct his counsel and knowledge, and in his secrets shall he meditate. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. Behold a great priest, who in his days pleased the Lord. Therefore by an oath the Lord assured him that he would increase him among his people. He established him with the blessing of all men and the covenant, and made it rest upon his head. Therefore by an oath the Lord assured him that he would increase him among his people. Vouchsafe, reverend Father, thy blessing. May the grace of the Holy Spirit all our heart and mind enlighten. Amen. He shall show forth that which he hath learned, and shall glory in the law of the covenant of the Lord. Many shall commend his understanding, and so long as the world endureth, it shall not be blotted out. His memorial shall not depart away, and his name shall live from generation to generation. Nations shall show forth his wisdom, and the congregation shall declare his praise. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. The Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest for ever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand. Thou art a priest for ever after the order of Melchizedek. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost. Thou art a priest for ever after the order of Melchizedek. Second Nocturne May his loving kindness and mercy assist us, who with the Father and the Holy Ghost liveth and reigneth for ever and ever. Amen. Vouchsafe, reverend Father, thy blessing. May God the Father Almighty show us his mercy and pity. Amen. John of Antioch who on account of the golden stream of his eloquence is called by the Greeks Chrysostomos, or the golden-mouthed, was a lawyer and man of the world of much eminence, before he turned his great intellect and wonderful industry to the study of things sacred. He took orders and was ordained a priest of the church of Antioch, and after the death of Nectarius was forced by the Emperor Arcadius to accept, though sorely against his own will, the Archbishopric of Constantinople. Having received the burden of a shepherd's office in the year 398, he set himself zealously to do his duty, struggling against the degradation of public morality and the loose lives of the nobility, and thereby drew upon himself the ill-will of many enemies, especially the Empress Eudoxia, whom he had rebuked on account of the money of the widow Calitropa, and the land of another widow. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. I have found David my servant. With my holy oil have I anointed him. My hand shall hold him fast. The enemy shall not be able to do him violence. The son of wickedness shall not hurt him. My hand shall hold him fast. 
Vouchsafe, reverend Father, thy blessing. May Christ bestow upon us the joys of life eternal. Amen. Some bishops being assembled in a council at Chalcedon, which council the saint held to be neither lawful nor public, although he was commanded to go there, he refused, whereupon Eudoxia, striving earnestly against him, caused him to be sent into exile. Soon after, however, the people of the city rose and demanded his recall, and he was then brought back again amid great public rejoicings. Nevertheless he ceased not to war against vice, and absolutely forbade the celebration of public games round the silver statue of Eudoxia in the square outside the Church of the Eternal Wisdom. Upon this a party of bishops, who were enemies to him, banded together, and obtained that he should be banished again, which was done accordingly, amid the lamentations of widows and the poor, who felt as if they were being deprived of a common father. During this exile it almost passeth belief how much Chrysostom suffered, and how many souls he turned to the faith which is in Christ Jesus. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. I have laid help upon one that is mighty. I have exalted one chosen out of the people. My hand shall hold him fast. I have found David my servant, with my holy oil have I anointed him. My hand shall hold him fast. Vouchsafe, reverend Father, thy blessing. May God enkindle in our hearts the fire of his holy love. Amen. At this time a council was assembled at Rome, wherein Chrysostom's restoration to his see was decreed by Pope Innocent I but meanwhile he was suffering great hardships and cruelties on his journey at the hands of the soldiers who had him in charge. As he passed through Armenia, he prayed in the church of the holy martyr Basiliscus, and the same night that blessed conqueror appeared to him in a vision, and said, Brother John, to-morrow thou shalt be with me. On the next day, therefore, he received the sacrament of the Eucharist, and arming himself with the sign of the cross, resigned his soul to God, it being the 14th of September. As soon as he was dead, a furious hailstorm took place at Constantinople, and after four days the Empress died. The Emperor Theodosius, the son of Arcadius, brought the body of John Chrysostom to Constantinople with great state, and numerously attended and on the 27th of January laid it with magnificent honours in the grave, beside which he prayed for the forgiveness of his own father and mother. The holy body was afterwards taken to Rome, and is now buried in the Vatican Basilica. The number, devoutness, and brilliance of St. John Chrysostom's sermons and other writings, his acuteness in exposition, and the close aptness of his explanations of Holy Scripture, have been and are the object of universal wonder and admiration, and often seem not unworthy to have been dictated to him by the Apostle Paul, for whom he entertained a wonderful devotion. This most outstanding doctor of the Church Universal was proclaimed and appointed the heavenly patron of sacred orators by the Supreme Pontiff Pius X. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. This is he who wrought mighty deeds and valiant in the sight of God, and all the earth is filled with his doctrine. May his intercession avail for the sins of all the people. He was a man who despised the life of the world, and attained unto the kingdom of heaven. May his intercession avail for the sins of all the people. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. May his intercession avail for the sins of all the people. Third Nocturne May the Lord Almighty and merciful break the bonds of our sins and set us free. Amen. Vouchsafe, reverend Father, thy blessing. May the Gospel's holy lection be our safeguard and protection. Amen. At that time Jesus said unto his disciples, 
ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt hath lost his savour, wherewith shall it be salted? A homily by St. John Chrysostom Consider how that the Lord saith, Ye are the salt of the earth, by the which figure he showeth what a necessity of life is his teaching. By this figure he would have us know that we have an account to render, not of our own life only, but for the whole world. Not unto two cities, nor unto ten, nor unto twenty, nor unto one people, as I sent the prophets, so send I you. But I send you unto every land and sea, even unto the whole world, lying groaning as it is under the burden of divers sins. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. The Lord loved him and adorned him. He clothed him with a robe of glory, and crowned him at the gates of paradise. The Lord put upon him the breastplate of faith and adorned him, and crowned him at the gates of paradise. Vouchsafe, Reverend Father, thy blessing. May he whose feast day we are keeping be our advocate with God. Amen. These words, ye are the salt of the earth, show unto us the whole nature of man as savourless and of bad odour through the corruption of sin. And therefore he demandeth from his followers such qualities as are most needful and useful to the furthering of the salvation of many. He that is lowly in spirit, compassionate, meek, and a seeker after righteousness, shutteth not up his good things in his own heart, but rather is like a fountain whence good things freely flow forth unto his neighbour. He that is merciful, whose heart is pure, who seeketh peace, and who suffereth persecution for the truth's sake, is by the same token one whose life is for the good of the commonwealth. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. In the midst of the congregation he opened his mouth, and the Lord filled him with the spirit of wisdom and understanding. He shall find joy and a crown of gladness, and the Lord filled him with the spirit of wisdom and understanding. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. And the Lord filled him with the spirit of wisdom and understanding. Vouchsafe, Reverend Father, thy blessing. May the King of Angels give us fellowship with all the citizens of heaven. Amen. Think not, saith the Lord, that the struggle is easy, whereunto ye shall be called, nor that those are paltry things for which ye shall be held accountable. Ye are the salt of the earth. What then? Are ye to salt that which is corrupted? Nay, for it is impossible that what is once corrupted can be made sound by salting it. This it is not asked of them to do, but their work is to sprinkle with salt, and to keep fresh thereafter such things as the Lord hath given over into their charge. For these things he himself hath made new, and freed them from all taint before giving them. Christ's is the power that doth deliver from the corruption of sin. To preserve from falling away again is the duty and toil commanded to the apostles. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. Lords The Lord guided the righteous in right paths, and showed him the kingdom of God. Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things, saith the Lord. Let us pray. O Lord, who didst vouchsafe to illumine thy church with the wondrous righteousness and doctrine of thy blessed confessor and bishop, St. Chrysostom, Grant, we beseech thee, that the bounty of thy heavenly grace may evermore increase and multiply the same. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. End of the Roman Breviary Liturgy for the Feast of John Chrysostomos Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey
the Roman Breviary, Liturgy for the Feast of Pope Gregory the Seventh. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen. James Joyce in Context, Volume One, Telemachus. The Roman Breviary. Liturgy for the Feast of Pope Gregory the Seventh. Collect of the Day. Let us pray. O God, the strength of them that put their trust in Thee, who didst establish Thy blessed Confessor and Pope Gregory with the strength of constancy to defend the freedom of Thy Church, grant, we pray Thee, that by his prayers and good example we may manfully conquer all things contrary to our salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. First Vespers The Lord loved him and adorned him, Alleluia. He clothed him with a robe of glory, Alleluia. O holy priest and bishop, thou worker of so many mighty works, and good shepherd to Christ's flock, pray for us unto the Lord our God, Alleluia. Let us pray. O God, of the strength of them that put their trust in thee, who didst establish thy blessed confessor and pope Gregory with the strength of constancy to defend the freedom of thy church, grant, we pray thee, that by his prayers and good example we may manfully conquer all things contrary to our salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Light perpetual shall shine upon thy saints, O Lord, and an ageless eternity. Alleluia. O ye holy and righteous, rejoice in the Lord. Alleluia. For God hath chosen you as his inheritance. Alleluia. Let us pray. O eternal shepherd, do thou look favourably upon thy flock, which we beseech thee to guard and keep for evermore, through the blessed Urban, thy martyr and supreme pontiff, whom thou didst choose to be the chief shepherd of the whole church. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Matins. First Nocturne. Graciously hear, O Lord Jesu Christ, the prayers of thy servants, and have mercy upon us, who with the Father and the Holy Ghost livest and reignest for ever and ever. Amen. Vouchsafe, Reverend Father, thy blessing. May the Father Eternal bless us with the never-ending blessing. Amen. This is a true saying, If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop must then be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behaviour, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest, being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Alleluia. Lord, thou deliveredst unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Alleluia. Vouchsafe, Reverend Father, thy blessing. May the Son of God, the Soul Begotten, mercifully bless and keep us. Amen. For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able, 
by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. But thou, o Lord, have mercy upon us, thanks be to God. Behold a great priest, who in his days pleased the Lord. Therefore by an oath the Lord assured him that he would increase him among his people. Hallelujah. He established him with the blessing of all men and the covenant, and made it rest upon his head. Therefore by an oath the Lord assured him that he would increase him among his people. Hallelujah. Vouchsafe, Reverend Father, thy blessing. May the grace of the Holy Spirit all our heart and mind enlighten. Amen. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behaviour as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. But thou, o Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. The Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest for ever after the order of Melchizedek. Alleluia. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand. Thou art a priest for ever after the order of Melchizedek. Alleluia. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Thou art a priest for ever after the order of Melchizedek. Alleluia. Second Nocturne May his loving kindness and mercy assist us, who with the Father and the Holy Ghost liveth and reigneth for ever and ever. Amen. Vouchsafe, Reverend Father, thy blessing. May God the Father Almighty show us his mercy and pity. Amen. Hildebrand, who reigned as Pope under the name of Gregory the Seventh, was born at Soana in Tuscany. By his teaching, by his holiness, and by his graces of all kinds, he was a noble light of the Church, whose brightness hath shone throughout all lands. There is a story to the effect that when he was a little child, without any schooling, he was playing at the feet of a carpenter who was planing wood, and that God guided his hand to arrange the shavings which fell into the form of letters making the inspired words of David, He shall have dominion from sea to sea, a foreshadowing, as it were, of that wide lordship over the earth which was afterwards his. He was taken to Rome and brought up under the shelter of St. Peter. As a young man he bitterly sorrowed over the oppression of the freedom of the church by the laity, and over the corruption of the clergy themselves. He took the habit of a monk in the Abbey of Cluny, which was then in all the glory of the severest observance of the rule of St. Benedict. There he served God's majesty with such warmth of earnestness that the saintly fathers of the convent chose him to be their prior. But the providence of God had greater things in store for him, whereby to make him a source of health to many, and he was brought away from Cluny. He was first elected abbot of the monastery of St. Paul outside the walls at Rome, and afterwards created a cardinal of the Roman Church. Under the popes Leo the Ninth, Victor the Second, Stephen the Ninth, Nicholas the Second, and Alexander the Second, he discharged great offices of trust and the duties of a legate, and blessed Peter Damian, speaking of him at this time, calleth him a man of most holy and honest thoughts. When Pope Victor the Second sent him as his legate into France, he by a miracle forced the Bishop of Lyon 
who was befouled by the pollution of simony, to acknowledge his sin. In the Council of Tours he wrung from Berengarius a second abjuration of his heresy, and he prevailed against the schism of Cadolaus, and strangled it. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, thanks be to God. I have found David my servant, with my holy oil I have anointed him. My hand shall hold him fast, alleluia. The enemy shall not be able to do him violence, the son of wickedness shall not hurt him. My hand shall hold him fast, alleluia. Vouchsafe, reverend father, thy blessing. May Christ bestow upon us the joys of life eternal. Amen. After the death of Alexander the Second, Hildebrand, against his own will and to his own grief, was on the twenty-second day of April, in the year of Christ, one thousand and seventy-three, chosen Pope by one common consent of all. Reigning as Gregory the Seventh, he was as the sun shining upon the temple of the Most High. Mighty both in word and deed, he toiled for the restoration of ecclesiastical discipline, for the spread of the faith, for the defence of the freedom of the Church, for the suppression of error and corruption, so that since the time of the Apostles there is said never to have been a Pope who bore more labour and trouble for the sake of God's Church, or contended more manfully for her liberties. He purged divers provinces of the pollution of simony. Like a brave soldier he withstood without dread the unrighteous contendings of the Emperor Henry the Fourth, setting himself as a wall of defence for the house of Israel. And when the said Henry fell into the depths of sin, he cut him off from the communion of the faithful, and from his kingdom, and loosed the nations that were subject to him from their sworn allegiance. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. I have laid help upon one that is mighty, I have exalted one chosen out of the people. My hand shall hold him fast, alleluia. I have found David my servant, with my holy oil I have anointed him. My hand shall hold him fast, alleluia. Vouchsafe, reverend father, thy blessing. May God enkindle in our hearts the fire of his holy love. Amen. While he was celebrating solemn mass, godly men saw a dove descend from heaven, perch upon his right shoulder, and spread out its wings so as to veil his head, a testimony that it was not by reasonings of man's wisdom, but by the teachings of the Holy Ghost that he was guided in his rule over the church. When the armies of the infamous Henry encompassed Rome, and hedged her in on every side, a great fire which the enemy had raised became extinct when Gregory made the sign of the cross towards it. The Norman duke, Robert Guiscard, at length delivered Gregory from the hand of Henry, and he departed from Rome, first to the abbey of Monte Cassino, and thence onward to Salerno, to dedicate the church of St. Matthew at that place. While he was preaching to the people there, on a certain day he was smitten with grievous pains, and fell into a sickness, whereof he foresaw that he should never be healed. As he lay on his deathbed, Gregory's last words were, I have loved righteousness and hated iniquity, and therefore I am dying in exile. He was a man really holy, a visitor of sin, and a most leal soldier of the church. It is past reckoning how many sufferings he manfully bore and how much he wisely ordained in the many councils which he gathered together in Rome. He had been Pope twelve years, when in the year of salvation one thousand and eighty-five he went hence to be ever with the Lord. Both during his life and after his death he was marked by signs and wonders not a few. His holy body was honourably buried in the cathedral church of Salerno. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. This is he who wrought mighty deeds and valiant in the sight of God, and all the earth is filled with his doctrine. May his intercession avail for the sins of all the people. Alleluia. He was a man who despised the life of the world, and attained unto the kingdom of heaven. 
May his intercession avail for the sins of all the people. Alleluia. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. May his intercession avail for the sins of all the people. Alleluia. Third Nocturne May the Lord Almighty and Merciful break the bonds of our sins and set us free. Amen. Vouchsafe, Reverend Father, thy blessing. May the Gospel's holy lection be our safeguard and protection. Amen. At that time, when Jesus came into the coasts of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? A homily by St. Leo the Pope When the Lord, as we read in the Gospel, asked his disciples, Who did men, amid their divers speculations, believe him, the Son of Man, to be? Blessed Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the Lord answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. But the dispensation of truth perdures, and blessed Peter, persevering in the strength of the rock which he hath received, hath not relinquished the position he assumed at the helm of the church. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. The Lord loved him and adorned him, he clothed him with a robe of glory, and crowned him at the gates of paradise. Alleluia! The Lord put upon him the breastplate of faith, and adorned him, and crowned him at the gates of paradise. Alleluia! Vouchsafe, reverend Father, thy blessing. May he whose feast day we are keeping be our advocate with God. Amen. In the universal church it is as if Peter were still saying every day, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. For every tongue which confesseth the Lord is taught that confession by the teaching of Peter. This is the faith that overcometh the devil and looseth the bonds of his prisoners. This is the faith which maketh men free of the world and bringeth them to heaven, and the gates of hell are impotent to prevail against it. This is the rock which God hath fortified with such ramparts of salvation, that the contagion of heresy will never be able to infect it, nor idolatry and unbelief to overcome it. And therefore, dearly beloved, we celebrate today's festival with reasonable obedience, that in my humble person he may be acknowledged and honoured who doth continue to care for all the shepherds, as well as sheep entrusted unto him and who doth lose none of his dignity, even in an unworthy successor. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. Let your loins be girded about, and your lights burning, and be ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding. Alleluia. Watch, therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. And be ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding. Alleluia. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. And be ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding. Alleluia. Vouchsafe, Reverend Father, thy blessing. May the King of Angels give us fellowship with all the citizens of heaven. Amen. Urban was a Roman who, in the reign of Emperor Alexander Severus, by his teaching and holy life, brought many to believe in Christ. Among others was Valerian, the husband of the blessed Cecilia, and Tiburtius, the brother of Valerian, both of whom afterwards bravely underwent martyrdom. It was Urban who wrote the following words concerning the property of the Church. Those things which his faithful ones make offering of unto the Lord must never be turned to any other use than those of the church, or of our Christian brethren, or of the poor. 
he sat in the chair of Peter six years, seven months, and four days, and being crowned with martyrdom was buried the cemetery of Praetextatus on the 25th day of May. He held five ordinations in December, wherein he ordained nine priests, five deacons, and eight bishops for divers places. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. Lords the Lord guided the righteous in right paths, alleluia, and showed him the kingdom of God, alleluia. Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things, saith the Lord, alleluia. Let us pray. O God, the strength of them that put their trust in thee, who didst establish thy blessed confessor and pope Gregory with the strength of constancy to defend the freedom of thy church, grant, we pray thee, that by his prayers and good example we may manfully conquer all things contrary to our salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Go forth, O ye daughters of Sion, and behold the martyrs with their crowns, with which the Lord hath crowned them in the day of solemnity and rejoicing. Alleluia, alleluia. Right dear in the sight of the Lord, alleluia, is the death of his saints, alleluia. Let us pray. O Eternal Shepherd, do thou look favourably upon thy flock, which we beseech thee to guard and keep for evermore, through the blessed Urban, thy martyr and supreme pontiff, whom thou didst choose to be the chief shepherd of the whole church. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. End of the Roman Breviary, Liturgy for the Feast of Pope Gregory the Seventh. Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey. A Popular History of Ireland, Book 2, Chapter 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. James Joyce in Context, Volume 1. Telemachus, A Popular History of Ireland, Book 2, Chapter 2. King Malachy I by Thomas Darcy McGee. Malaglan, or Malachy I, sometimes called of the Shannon, from his patrimony along that river, brought back again the sovereignty to the center, and in happier days might have become the second founder of Tara. But it was plain enough then, and it is tolerably so still, that this was not to be an age of restoration. The kings of Ireland after this time, says the quaint old translator of the annals of Clang MacNoyes, had a good little of it down to the days of King Brian. It was, in fact, a perpetual struggle for self-preservation, the first duty of all governments, as well as the first law of all nature. The powerful action of the Gentile forces upon an originally ill-centralized and recently much abused constitution seemed to render it possible that every new ardry would prove the last. Under the pressure of such a deluge all ancient institutions were shaken to their foundations, and the venerable authority of religion itself, like a hermit in a mountain torrent, was contending for the hope of escape or existence. We must not, therefore, amid the din of the conflicts through which we are to pass, condemn without stint or qualification those princes who were occasionally driven, as some of them were driven to that last resort, the employment of foreign mercenaries, and those mercenaries often anti-Christians, to preserve some show of native government and kingly authority. Grant that, in some of them, the use of such allies and agents cannot be justified on any plea or pretext of state necessity, where base ends or unpatriotic motives are clear or credible. Such treason to country cannot be too heartily condemned but it is indeed far from certain that such were the motives in all cases, or that such ought to be our conclusion in any in the absence of sufficient evidence to that effect. 
though the gentile power had experienced toward the close of the last reign such severe reverses yet it was not in the nature of the men of norway to abandon a prize which was once so nearly being their own the fugitives who escaped as well as those who remained within the strong ramparts of waterford and dublin urged the fitting out of new expeditions to avenge their slaughtered countrymen and prosecute the conquest but defeat still followed on defeat in the first year of malachy they lost twelve hundred men in a disastrous action near castle dermont with Oclobar, the prince bishop of cashel and in the same or the next season they were defeated with a loss of seven hundred men by malachy at fork in meath in the third year of malachy however a new northern expedition arrived in a hundred and forty vessels which according to the average capacity of the long ships of that age must have carried with them from seven thousand to ten thousand men fortunately for the assailed this fleet was composed of what they called black gentiles or danes as distinguished from their predecessors the fair gentiles or norwegians a quarrel arose between the adventurers of the two nations as to the possession of a few remaining fortresses especially of dublin and an engagement was fought along the liffey which lasted for three days the danes finally prevailed driving the norwegians from their stronghold and cutting them off from their ships the new northern leaders are named anlaf or olaf citric or sigurd and ivar the first of the danish earls who established themselves at dublin waterford and limerick respectively though the immediate result of the arrival of the great fleet of eighteen forty seven relieved for the moment the worst apprehensions of the invaded and enabled them to rally their means of defence yet as denmark had more than double the population of norway it brought them into direct collision with a more formidable power than that from which they had been so lately delivered the tactics of both nations were the same no sooner had they established themselves on the ruins of their predecessors in dublin than the danish forces entered east meath under the guidance of kenneth a local lord and overran the ancient mensal from the sea to the shannon one of their first exploits was burning alive two hundred and sixty prisoners in the tower of trilloy in the island of low gower near dunshallen the next year his allies having withdrawn from the neighborhood kenneth was taken by king malachy's men and the traitor himself drowned in a sack in the little river nanny which divides the two baronies of dulic this death penalty by drowning seems to have been one of the useful hints which the irish picked up from their invaders during the remainder of this reign the gentile war resumed much of its old local and guerrilla character the provincial chiefs and the ardry occasionally employed bands of one nation of the invaders to combat the other and even to suppress their native rivals the only pitched battle of which we hear is that of the two plains near coolstown king's county in the second last year of malachy a d eight fifty nine in which his usual good fortune attended the king the greater part of his reign was occupied as always must be the case with the founder of a new line in coercing into obedience his former peers on this business he made two expeditions into munster and took hostages from all the tribes of the eugean race with the same object he held a conference with all the chiefs of ulster hugh of ellach only being absent at armagh in the fourth year of his reign and a general feast or assembly of all the orders of ireland at rathew in west meath in his thirteenth year a d eight fifty seven he found notwithstanding his victories and his early popularity that there are always those ready to turn from the setting to the rising sun and toward the end of his reign he was obliged to defend his camp near armagh by force from a night assault from the discontented prince of Alec, who also ravaged his patrimony almost at the moment he lay on his deathbed malachy i departed this life on the thirteenth day of november a d eight sixty 
having reigned sixteen years. Mournful is the news to the gale, exclaimed the elegant bard. Red wine is spilt into the valley. Aaron's monarch has died. And the lament contrasts his stately form as he rode the white stallion, with the striking reverse when his only horse this day, that is the bier on which his body was borne into the churchyard, is drawn behind two oxen. End of A Popular History of Ireland, Book 2, Chapter 2, King Malachy I. Recording by David Lawrence in Brampton, Ontario, July the 4th, 2009. St. Malachy, from the Catholic Encyclopedia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. James Joyce in Context, Volume 1, Telemachus. St. Malachy, from the Catholic Encyclopedia. St. Malachy, whose family name was O'Morgare, was born in Armagh, in 1094, St. Bernard describes him as of noble birth. He was baptized Melvithoc, a name which has been Latinized as Malachy, and was trained under Imar O'Hagan, subsequently abbot of Armagh. After a long course of studies, he was ordained priest by St. Silac, Celsus, in 1119. In order to perfect himself in sacred liturgy and theology, he proceeded to Lismore, where he spent nearly two years under St. Mulchus. He was then chosen abbot of Bangor in 1123. A year later, he was consecrated bishop of Connor, and, in 1132, he was promoted to the primacy of Armagh. St. Bernard gives us many interesting anecdotes regarding St. Malachy, and highly praises his zeal for religion, both in Connor and Armagh. In 1127, he paid a second visit to Lismore and acted for a time as confessor to Cormac McCarthy, Prince of Desmond. While Bishop of Connor, he continued to reside at Bangor, and when some of the native princes sacked Connor, he brought the Bangor monks to Invra, County Kerry, where they were welcomed by King Cormac. On the death of St. Celsus, who was buried at Lismore in 1129, St. Malachy was appointed Archbishop of Armagh, 1132, which dignity he accepted with great reluctance. Owing to intrigues, he was unable to take possession of his see for two years. Even then, he had to purchase the Bacal Isu, Staff of Jesus, from Nial, the usurping lay primate. During three years at Armagh, as St. Bernard writes, St. Malachy restored the discipline of the church, grown lax during the intruded rule of a series of lay abbots, and had the Roman liturgy adopted. St. Bernard continues, having extirpated barbarism and re-established Christian morals, seeing all things tranquil, he began to think of his own peace. He therefore resigned Armagh in 1138 and returned to Connor, dividing the sea into Down and Connor, retaining the former. He founded a priory of Austin Canons at Downpatrick, and was unceasing in his episcopal labors. Early in 1139 he journeyed to Rome via Scotland, England, and France, visiting St. Bernard at Clairvaux. He petitioned Pope Innocent for palliums for the sees of Armagh and Cashel, and was appointed legate for Ireland. On his return visit to Clairvaux he obtained five monks for a foundation in Ireland, under Christian, an Irishman, as superior. Thus arose the great abbey of Melifont in 1142. St. Malachy set out on a second journey to Rome in 1148, but on arriving at Clairvaux he fell sick, and died in the arms of St. Bernard on 2nd November. Numerous miracles are recorded of him, and he was also endowed with the gift of prophecy. St. Malachy was canonized by Pope Clement III, on 6 July 1199, and his feast is celebrated on the 3rd of November, in order not to clash with the Feast of All Souls. An account of the relics of St. Malachy will be found in Ming, Patrologiae Sursus Completus, CLXXXV. 
for a discussion of the prophecies concerning the popes known as st malachy's prophecies the reader is referred to the article prophecies end of st malachy recorded by david lawrence in brampton ontario july fifth two thousand and nine The Prophecy of Malachias by Dewey Reams Chapter 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. James Joyce in Context, Volume 1, Telemachus The Prophecy of Malachias by Dewey Reams Chapter 1 The Burden of the Word of the Lord to Israel by the hand of Malachias. I have loved you, saith the Lord, and you have said, Wherein hath thou loved us? Was not Esau brother to Jacob, saith the Lord? And I have loved Jacob, but have hated Esau, and I have made his mountains a wilderness, and have given his inheritance to the dragons of the desert. But if Edom shall say, We are destroyed, but we will return and build up what hath been destroyed. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, They shall build up, and I will throw down, and they shall be called the borders of wickedness, and the people with whom the Lord is angry for ever. And your eyes shall see, and you shall say, The Lord be magnified upon the border of Israel. The Son honoureth the Father, and the servant his master. If then I be a father, where is my honour? And if I be a master, where is my fear? saith the Lord of hosts. To you, O priests, that despise my name, and have said, Wherein have we despised thy name? You offer polluted bread upon my altar, and you say, Wherein have we polluted thee? In that you say, The table of the Lord is contemptible. If you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it to thy prince, if he will be pleased with it, or if he will regard thy face, saith the Lord of hosts. And now beseech ye the face of God, that he may have mercy on you, for by your hand hath this been done. If by any means he will receive your faces, saith the Lord of hosts. Who is there among you that will shut the doors, and will kindle the fire on my altar gratis? I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will not receive a gift of your hand. For from the rising of the sun, even to the going down, my name is great among the Gentiles, and in every place there is sacrifice. And there is offering to my name a clean oblation, for my name is great among the Gentiles, saith the Lord of hosts. And you have profaned it in that you say, the table of the Lord is defiled, and that which is laid thereupon is contemptible with the fire that devoureth it. And you have said, Behold of our labor, and you puffed it away, saith the Lord of hosts. And you brought in a rapin the lame and the sick, and brought in an offering. Shall I accept it at your hands, saith the Lord? Cursed is the deceitful man that hath in his flock a male, and making a vow offereth in sacrifice that which is feeble to the Lord. For I am a great king, saith the Lord of hosts, and my name is dreadful among the Gentiles. Chapter 2 And now, O ye priests, this commandment is to you. If you will not hear, and if you will not lay it to heart, to give glory to my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will send poverty upon you, and will curse your blessings, yea, I will curse them, because you have not laid it to heart. Behold, I will cast the shoulder to you, and will scatter upon your face the dung of your solemnities, and it shall take you away with it. And you shall know that I sent you this commandment, that my covenant might be with Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him of life and peace, and I gave him fear, and he feared me, and he was afraid before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth, and iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace, and in equity, 
and turn many away from iniquity. For the lips of the priests shall keep knowledge, and they shall seek the law at his mouth, because he is the angel of the Lord of hosts. But you have departed out of the way, and have caused many to stumble at the law. You have made void the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore have I also made you contemptible and base before all people, as you have not kept my ways, and have accepted persons in the law. Have we not all one Father? Hath not one God created us? Why then doth every one of us despise his brother, violating the covenant of our fathers? Judah has transgressed, an abomination has been committed in Israel, and in Jerusalem, for Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved, and hath married the daughter of a strange god. The Lord will cut off the man that hath done this, both the master and the scholar, out of the tabernacles of Jacob, and him that offereth an offering to the Lord of hosts. And this again have you done. You have covered the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and bellowing, so that I have no more a regard to sacrifice, neither do I accept any atonement at your hands. And you have said, For what cause? Because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, whom thou hast despised, yet she was thy partner and the wife of thy covenant. Did not one make her, and she is the residue of his spirit? And what doth one seek but the seed of God? Keep then your spirit, and despise not the wife of thy youth. When thou shalt hate her, put her away, saith the Lord, the God of Israel. But iniquity shall cover his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Keep your spirit, and despise not. You have wearied the Lord with your words, and you said, Wherein have we wearied him? In that you say, Every one that doth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and such please him, or surely where is the God of judgment? Chapter 3 Behold, I send my angel, and he shall prepare the way before my face, and presently the Lord, whom you seek, and the angel of the testament, whom you desire, shall come to his temple. Behold, he cometh, saith the Lord of hosts. And who shall be able to think of the day of his coming? And who shall stand to see him? For he is like a refining fire, and like the fuller's herb. And he shall sit refining and cleansing the silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi, and shall refine them as gold and as silver, and they shall offer sacrifices to the Lord in justice. And the sacrifice of Judah and of Jerusalem shall please the Lord, as in the days of old, and in the ancient years. And I will come to you in judgment, and will be a speedy witness against sorcerers, and adulterers, and false swearers, and them that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widows, and the fatherless, and oppress the stranger, and have not feared me, saith the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord, and I change not, and you, the sons of Jacob, are not consumed. For from the days of your fathers you have departed from my ordinances, and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, saith the Lord of hosts. And you have said, Wherein shall we return? Shall a man afflict God? For you afflict me. And you have said, Wherein do we afflict thee? In tithes and in first fruits. And you are cursed with want, and you afflict me, even the whole nation of you. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and try me in this, saith the Lord, if I open not unto you the floodgates of heaven, and pour you out a blessing even to abundance. And I will rebuke for your sakes the devourer, and he shall not spoil the fruit of your land. Neither shall the vine in the field be barren, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed. For you shall be a delightful land, saith the Lord of hosts. Your words have been unsufferable to me, saith the Lord. And you have said, What have we spoken against thee? You have said, He laboreth in vain that serveth God. And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinances, 
and that we have walked sorrowful before the Lord of hosts. Wherefore now we call the proud people happy, for they that work wickedness are built up, and they have tempted God, and are preserved. Then they that feared the Lord spoke every one with his neighbor, and the Lord gave ear, and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him, for them that fear the Lord, and think on his name. And they shall be my special possession, saith the Lord of hosts, in the day that I do judgment, and I will spare them, as a man spareth his son that serveth him. And you shall return, and shall see the difference between the just and the wicked, and between him that serveth God, and him that serveth him not. Chapter 4 For behold the day shall come kindled as a furnace, and all the proud, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall set them on fire, saith the Lord of hosts. It shall not leave them root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name, the Son of Justice shall arise, and health in his wings, and you shall go forth, and shall leap like calves of the herd. And you shall tread down the wicked, when they shall be ashes under the sole of your feet in the day that I do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel, the precepts and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elias the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with anathema. End of the Prophecy of Malachias Recording by David Lawrence in Brampton, Ontario, May 14, 2009The Triumph of Time by Algernon Charles Swinburne This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Geeson James Joyce in Context, Volume 1, Telemachus The Triumph of Time by Algernon Charles Swinburne Before our lives divide forever, while time is with us and hands are free, time swift to fasten and swift to sever hand from hand as we stand by the sea, I will say no word that a man might say whose whole life's love goes down in a day. For this could never have been, and never, though the gods and years relent, shall be. Is it worth a tear, is it worth an hour, to think of things that are well outworn, of fruitless husk and fugitive flower, the dream foregone and the deed foreborn? Though joy be done with and grief be vain, time shall not sever us wholly in twain. Earth is not spoilt for a single shower, but the rain has ruined the ungrown corn. It will not grow again, this fruit of my heart, smitten with sunbeams, ruined with rain. The singing seasons divide and depart, winter and summer depart in twain. It will not grow again, it is ruined at root, the blood-like blossom, the dull red fruit. Though the heart yet sickens, the lips yet smart, with sullen savour of poisonous pain. I have given no man of my fruit to eat. I trod the grapes, I have drunken the wine. Had you eaten and drunken and found it sweet, this wild new growth of the corn and vine, this wine and bread without lees or leaven, we had grown as gods, as the gods in heaven, souls fair to look upon, goodly to greet, one splendid spirit, your soul and mine. In the change of years, in the coil of things, in the clamour and rumour of life to be, we, drinking love at the furthest springs, covered with love as a covering tree, we had grown as gods, as the gods above, filled from the heart to the lips with love, held fast in his hands, clothed warm with his wings, 
O oh, love, my love, had you loved but me. We had stood as the sure stars stand, And moved as the moon moves, loving the world, And seen grief collapse as a thing disproved, Death consume as a thing unclean. Twain halves of a perfect heart, Made fast soul to soul while the years fell past. Had you loved me once, as you have not loved, had the chance been with us that has not been. I have put my days and dreams out of mind, days that are over, dreams that are done. Though we seek life through, we shall surely find there is none of them clear to us now, not one. But clear are these things, the grass and the sand, where, sure as the eyes reach, ever at hand, with lips wide open and face burnt blind, the strong sea daisies feast on the sun. The low downs lean to the sea, the stream, one loose, thin, pulseless, tremulous vein, rapid and vivid and dumb as a dream, works downward, sick of the sun and the rain. No wind is rough with the rank, rare flowers. The sweet sea, mother of loves and hours, shudders and shines as the grey winds gleam, turning her smile to a fugitive pain. Mother of loves that are swift to fade, mother of mutable winds and hours, a barren mother, a mother maid, cold and clean as her faint salt flowers. I would we twain were even as she, lost in the night and the light of the sea, where faint sounds falter and one beams wade, break and are broken and shed into showers. The love and hours of the life of a man, they are swift and sad being born of the sea, hours that rejoice and regret for a span, born with a man's breath, mortal as he, loves that are lost ere they come to birth, weeds of the wave without fruit upon earth. I lose what I long for, save what I can, my love, my love, and no love for me. It is not much that a man can save on the sands of life in the straits of time, who swims in sight of the great third wave that never a swimmer shall cross or climb. Some waif washed up with the straits and spars that ebb tide shows to the shore and the stars. Weed from the water, grass from a grave, a broken blossom, a ruined rhyme. There will no man do for your sake, I think, what I would have done for the least word said. I had wrung life dry for your lips to drink, broken it up for your daily bread, body for body and blood for blood as the flow of the full sea risen to flood that yearns and trembles before it sink, I had given and laid down for you, glad and dead. Yea, hope at highest and all her fruit, and time at fullest and all his dower, I had given you surely and life to boot, where we once made one for a single hour. But now you are twain, you are cloven apart, Flesh of his flesh, but heart of my heart. And deep in one is the bitter root, And sweet for one is the lifelong flower. To have died if you cared I should die for you, Clung to my life if you bade me, Played my part as it pleased you. These were the thoughts that stung, The dreams that smote with a keener dart Than shafts of love or arrows of death. These were but as fire is dust or breath, or poisonous foam on the tender tongue of the little snakes that eat my heart. I wish we were dead together today, lost sight of, hidden away out of sight, clasped and clothed in the cloven clay, out of the world's way, out of the light, out of the ages of worldly weather, forgotten of all men altogether. As the world's first dead, taken wholly away, Made one with death, filled full of the night. How we should slumber, how we should sleep, Far in the dark with the dreams and the dews, And dreaming, grow to each other and weep, 
Laugh low, live softly, murmur and muse. Yea, and it may be, struck through by the dream, feel the dust quicken and quiver, and seem alive as of old to the lips, and leap spirit to spirit as lovers use. Sick dreams and sad of a dull delight, for what shall it profit when men are dead to have dreamed, to have loved with the whole soul's might, to have looked for day when the day was fled? Let come what will, there is one thing worth, to have had fair love in the life upon earth, to have held love safe till the day grew night, while skies had colour and lips were red. Would I lose you now, would I take you then? If I lose you now that my heart has need, And come what may after death to men, What thing worth this will the dead years breed? Lose life, lose all, But at least I know, O oh, sweet life's love, Having loved you so, Had I reached you on earth, I should lose not again, In death nor life, Nor in dream or deed. Yea, I know this well, Where you once sealed mine, Mine in the blood's beat, mine in the breath, Mixed into me as honey in wine, Not time that saith and gainsayeth, Nor all strong things had severed us then, Not wrath of gods, not wisdom of men, Nor all things earthly, nor all divine, Nor joy, nor sorrow, nor life, nor death. I had grown pure as the dawn and the dew, you had grown strong as the sun or the sea, But none shall triumph a whole life through, For death is one, and the fates are three. At the door of life, by the gate of breath, There are worse things waiting for men than death. Death could not sever my soul and you, As these have severed your soul from me. You have chosen and clung to the chance they sent you, Life sweet as perfume and pure as prayer. But will it not one day in heaven repent you? Will they solace you wholly the days that were? Will you lift up your eyes between sadness and bliss, Meet mine and see where the great love is, And tremble and turn and be changed? Content you, the gate is straight, I shall not be there. But you, had you chosen, had you stretched hand, Had you seen good such a thing were done, I too might have stood with the souls that stand in the sun's sight, Clothed with the light of the sun. But who now on earth need care how I live? Have the high gods anything left to give, Save dust and laurels and gold and sand, Which gifts are goodly, but I will none. O oh, all fair lovers about the world, there is none of you, none that shall comfort me. My thoughts are as dead things, wrecked and whirled round and round in a gulf of the sea. And still through the sound and the straining stream, through the coil and chafe they gleam in a dream, the bright fine lips so cruelly curled, and strange swift eyes where the soul sits free. Free, without pity, withheld from woe, ignorant, Fair as the eyes are fair. Would I have you change now, change at a blow, Startled and stricken, awake and aware? Yea, if I could, would I have you see My very love of you filling me, And know my soul to the quick, As I know the likeness and look of your throat and hair? I shall not change you, Nay, though I might, would I change my sweet one love with a word? I had rather your hair should change in the night, Clear now as the plume of a black, bright bird. Your face fail suddenly, cease, turn grey, Die as a leaf that dies in a day. I will keep my soul in a place out of sight, Far off where the pulse of it is not heard. Far off it walks in a bleak, blown space, Full of the sound of the sorrow of years. I have woven a veil for the weeping face Whose lips have drunken the wine of tears. I have found a way for the failing feet, 
a place for slumber and sorrow to meet. There is no rumour about the place, nor light, nor any that sees or hears. I have hidden my soul out of sight, and said, Let none take pity upon thee, none comfort thy crying, for lo, thou art dead. Lie still now, safe out of sight of the sun. Have I not built thee a grave, and wrought thy grave clothes on thee of grievous thought, with soft-spun verses and tears unshed? and sweet light visions of things undone. I have given thee garments and balm and myrrh, and gold and beautiful burial things, but thou be at peace now, make no stir. Is not thy grave as a royal king? Fret not thyself, though the end were sore. Sleep, be patient, vex me no more. Sleep, what hast thou to do with her? the eyes that weep with the mouth that sings. Where the dead red leaves of the years lie rotten, the cold old crimes and the deeds thrown by, the misconceived and the misbegotten, I would find a sin to do ere I die, sure to dissolve and destroy me all through, that would set you higher in heaven, serve you and leave you happy when clean forgotten, as a dead man out of mind am I. Your lithe hands draw me, your face burns through me, I am swift to follow you, keen to see, but love lacks might to redeem or undo me, as I have been, I know I shall surely be. What should such fellows as I do? Nay, my part were worse if I chose to play, for the worst is this after all, if they knew me, not a soul upon earth would pity me. And I play not for pity of these, but you, if you saw with your soul what man am I, you would praise me at least that my soul all through clove to you, loathing the lives that lie, the souls and lips that are bought and sold, the smiles of silver and kisses of gold, the lapdog loves that whine as they chew, the little lovers that curse and cry. There are fairer women, I hear, that may be. But I, that I love you and find you fair, who are more than fair in my eyes, if they be, do the high gods know, or the great gods care? Though the swords in my heart for one were seven, should the iron hollow of doubtful heaven that knows not itself whether night time or day be, reverberate words and a foolish prayer, I will go back to the great sweet mother, mother and lover of men, the sea. I will go down to her, I and none other, close with her, kiss her and mix her with me, cling to her, strive with her, hold her fast. O oh, fair white mother, in days long past, born without sister, born without brother, set free my soul as thy soul is free. O fair green-girdled mother of mine, see, that art clothed with the sun and the rain, thy sweet hard kisses are strong like wine, thy large embraces are keen like pain. Save me and hide me with all thy waves, find me one grave of thy thousand graves, those pure, cold, populous graves of thine, wrought without hand in a world without stain. I shall sleep and move with the moving ships, change as the winds change, veer in the tide. My lips will feast on the foam of thy lips. I shall rise with thy rising, with thee subside. Sleep and not know if she be, if she were, filled full with life to the eyes and hair, as a rose is fulfilled to the rose-leaf tips with splendid summer and perfume and pride. This woven raiment of nights and days, were it once cast off and unwound from me, naked and glad would I walk in thy ways, alive and aware of thy ways and thee, clear of the whole world, hidden at home, clothed with the green and crowned with the foam, a pulse of the life of thy straits and bays, a vein in the heart of the streams of the sea. Fair mother, fed with the lives of men, 
Thou art subtle and cruel of heart, men say. Thou hast taken and shall not render again. Thou art full of thy dead and cold as they. But death is the worst that comes of thee. Thou art fed with our dead, O mother, O sea. But when hast thou fed on our hearts? Or when, having given us love, hast thou taken away? O tender-hearted, O perfect lover, Thy lips are bitter and sweet thine heart. The hopes that hurt and the dreams that hover, Shall they not vanish away and apart? But thou, thou art sure, thou art older than earth, Thou art strong for death and fruitful of birth. Thy depths conceal and thy gulfs discover, from the first thou wert, in the end thou art. And grief shall endure not for ever, I know. As things that are not shall these things be. We shall live through seasons of sun and of snow, and none be grievous as this to me. We shall hear, as one in a trance that hears, the sound of time, the rhyme of the years. Wrecked hope and passionate pain will grow as tender things of a springtide sea. Sea fruit that swings in the waves that hiss, drowned gold and purple and royal rings. And all time past, was it all for this? Times unforgotten and treasures of things? Swift years of liking and sweet long laughter that wist not well of the years thereafter till love woke smitten at heart by a kiss, with lips that trembled and trailing wings. There lived a singer in France of old by the tideless, dolorous Midland Sea. In a land of sand and ruin and gold there shone one woman and none but she. And finding life for her love's sake fail, being fain to see her, he bade set sail, touched land, and saw her as life grew cold, and praised God seeing, and so died he. Died praising God for his gift and grace, for she bowed down to him weeping, and said, Live! And her tears were shed on his face, or ever the life in his face was shed. The sharp tears fell through her hair, and stung once, and her close lips touched him, and clung once, and grew one with his lips for a space, and so drew back, and the man was dead. O oh brother, the gods were good to you. Sleep, and be glad while the world endures. Be well content as the years wear through. Give thanks for life, and the loves and lures. Give thanks for life, O oh brother, and death, for the sweet last sound of her feet, her breath, for gifts she gave you, gracious and few, tears and kisses, that lady of yours. Rest and be glad of the gods, but I, how shall I praise them, or how take rest? There is not room under all the sky for me that know not of worst or best, dream or desire of the days before, sweet things or bitterness any more. Love will not come to me now, though I die, as love came close to you, breast to breast. I shall never be friends again with roses. I shall loathe sweet tunes, where a note grown strong relents and recoils and climbs and closes, as a wave of the sea turned back by song. There are sounds where the soul's delight takes fire, face to face with its own desire, a delight that rebels, a desire that reposes. I shall hate sweet music my whole life long. The pulse of war and the passion of wonder, the heavens that murmur, the sounds that shine, the stars that sing and the loves that thunder, the music burning at heart like wine, an armed archangel whose hands raise up all senses mixed in the spirit's cup till flesh and spirit are molten in sunder, these things are over, and no more mine. These were a part of the playing I heard once, ere my love and my heart were at strife. Love that sings and hath wings as a bird, balm of the wound and heft of the knife. Fairer than earth is the sea, 
and sleep than overwatching of eyes that weep. Now time has done with his one sweet word, the wine and leaven of lovely life. I shall go my ways, tread out my measure, fill the days of my daily breath with fugitive things not good to treasure, do as the world doth, say as it saith. But if we had loved each other, O oh sweet, had you felt, lying under the palms of your feet, the heart of my heart, beating harder with pleasure to feel you tread it to dust and death. Ah, had I not taken my life up and given all that life gives and the years let go, the wine and honey, the balm and leaven, the dreams reared high and the hopes brought low. Come life, come death, not a word be said, should I lose you living and vex you dead? I shall never tell you on earth, and in heaven, if I cry to you then, will you hear or know? End of The Triumph of Time by Algernon Charles Swinburne Recording by Martin Geeson in Hazelmere, Surrey Anabasis by Xenophon, Book 4, Chapter 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Geeson. James Joyce in Context, Volume 1, Telemachus. Anabasis by Xenophon, Book 4, Chapter 7. Translated from the Greek by H. G. Dakins. After this they marched into the country of the Taochians, five stages, thirty parasangs, and provisions failed. For the Taochians lived in strong places, into which they had carried up all their stores. Now when the army arrived before one of these strong places, a mere fortress without city or houses, into which a motley crowd of men and women and numerous flocks and herds were gathered, Cerisophus attacked at once. When the first regiment fell back tired, a second advanced, and again a third, for it was impossible to surround the place in full force as it was encircled by a river. Presently Xenophon came up with the rear guard, consisting of both light and heavy infantry whereupon Chirisophus halted him with the words, In the nick of time you have come. We must take this place, for the troops have no provisions unless we take it. Thereupon they consulted together, and to Xenophon's inquiry what it was which hindered their simply walking in, Chirisophus replied, There is just this one narrow approach which you see, but when we attempt to pass it by, they roll down volleys of stones from yonder overhanging crag pointing up, and this is the state in which you find yourself if you chance to be caught, and he pointed to some poor fellows with their legs or ribs crushed to bits. But when they have expended their ammunition, said Xenophon, there is nothing else is there to hinder our passing. Certainly, except yonder handful of fellows, there is no one in front of us that we can see, and of them only two or three apparently are armed and the distance to be traversed under fire is, as your eyes will tell you, about one hundred and fifty feet, as near as can be, and of this space the first hundred is thickly covered with great pines at intervals. Under cover of these, what harm can come to our men from a pelt of stones, flying or rolling? So then there is only fifty feet left to cross during a lull of stones. Aye, said Chirisophus, but with our first attempt to approach the bush a galling fire of stones commences. The very thing we want, said the other, for they will use up their ammunition all the quicker. But let us select a point from which we shall only have a brief space to run across, if we can, and from which it will be easier to get back, if we wish. Thereupon Cerisophus and Xenophon set out with Callimachus the Parhasian, the captain in command of the officers of the rear guard that day. The rest of the captains remained out of danger. 
That done, the next step was for a party of about seventy men to get away under the trees, not in a body, but one by one, every one using his best precaution. And Agassias the Stymphalian, and Aristonymus the Methydrian, who were also officers of the rear guard, were posted as supports outside the trees, for it was not possible for more than a single company to stand safely within the trees. Here Callimachus hit upon a pretty contrivance. He ran forward from the tree under which he was posted two or three paces, and as soon as the stones came whizzing he retired easily. But at each excursion more than ten wagon-loads of rocks were expended. Agassias, seeing how Callimachus was amusing himself, and the whole army looking on as spectators, was seized with the fear that he might miss his chance of being first to run the gauntlet of the enemy's fire and get into the place. So, without a word of summons to his neighbour, Aristonymus, or to Eurylochus of Lucia, both comrades of his, or to anyone else, off he set on his own account, and passed the whole detachment. But Callimachus, seeing him tearing past, caught hold of his shield by the rim, and in the meantime Aristonymus the Methydrian ran past both, and after him Eurylochus of Lucia, for they were one and all aspirants to valour, and in that high pursuit each was the eager rival of the rest. So in this strife of honour the three of them took the fortress, and when they had once rushed in not a stone more was hurled from overhead. And here a terrible spectacle displayed itself. The women first cast their infants down the cliff, and then they cast themselves after their fallen little ones, and the men likewise. In such a scene, Aeneas the Stymphalian, an officer, caught sight of a man with a fine dress about to throw himself over, and seized hold of him to stop him. But the other caught him to his arms, and both were gone in an instant, headlong down the crags, and were killed. Out of this place the merest handful of human beings were taken prisoners, but cattle and asses in abundance, and flocks of sheep. From this place they marched through the Calibes, seven stages, fifty parasangs. These were the bravest men whom they encountered on the whole march, coming cheerily to close quarters with them. They wore linen cuirasses reaching to the groin, and instead of the ordinary wings or basques, a thickly plaited fringe of cords. They were also provided with greaves and helmets, and at the girdle a short sabre, about as long as the Laconian dagger, with which they cut the throats of those they mastered. And after severing the head from the trunk, they would march along carrying it, singing and dancing, when they drew within their enemy's field of view. They carried also a spear fifteen cubits long, lanced at one end. This folk stayed in regular townships, and whenever the Hellenes passed by they invariably hung close on their heels fighting. They had dwelling places in their fortresses, and into them they had carried up their supplies, so that the Hellenes could get nothing from this district, but supported themselves on the flocks and herds they had taken from the Taochians. After this the Hellenes reached the river Harpasus, which was four hundred feet broad. Hence they marched through the Scythenians four stages, twenty parasangs, through a long level country, to more villages among which they halted three days, and got in supplies. Passing on from thence in four stages of twenty parasangs, they reached a large and prosperous, well-populated city, which went by the name of Gymnias from which the governor of the country sent them a guide to lead them through a district hostile to his own. This guide told them that within five days he would lead them to a place from which they would see the sea. And, he added, if I fail of my word, you are free to take my life. Accordingly he put himself at their head. But he no sooner set foot in the country hostile to himself than he fell to encouraging them to burn and harry the land. Indeed his exhortations were so earnest, it was plain that it was for this he had come, and not out of the good will he bore the Hellenes. On the fifth day they reached the mountain, the name of which was Theches. No sooner had the men in front ascended it, and caught sight of the sea, than a great cry arose, and Xenophon in the rear guard, catching the sound of it, 
conjectured that another set of enemies must surely be attacking in front, for they were followed by the inhabitants of the country, which was all aflame. Indeed the rear-guard had killed some, and captured others alive, by laying an ambuscade. They had taken also about twenty wicker shields, covered with the raw hides of shaggy oxen. But as the shout became louder and nearer, and those who from time to time came up, began racing at the top of their speed towards the shouters, and the shouting continually recommenced with yet greater volume as the numbers increased, Xenophon settled in his mind that something extraordinary must have happened. So he mounted his horse, and taking with him Lysias and the cavalry, he galloped to the rescue. Presently they could hear the soldiers shouting, and passing on the joyful word, The sea! The sea! Thereupon they began running, rear-guard and all, and the baggage animals and horses came galloping up. But when they had reached the summit, then indeed they fell to embracing one another, generals and officers and all, and the tears trickled down their cheeks. And on a sudden, some one, whoever it was, having passed down the order, the soldiers began bringing stones and erecting a great cairn, whereon they dedicated a host of untanned skins and staves and captured wicker shields, and with his own hand the guide hacked the shields to pieces, inviting the rest to follow his example. After this the Hellenes dismissed the guide with a present raised from the common store, to wit a horse, a silver bowl, a Persian dress, and ten darics. But what he most begged to have were their rings, and of these he got several from the soldiers. So after pointing out to them a village where they would find quarters, and the road by which they would proceed towards the land of the Macrones, as evening fell he turned his back upon them in the night, and was gone. End of Anabasis by Xenophon, Book 4, Chapter 7 Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey Religion and Love by A. E. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen James Joyce in Context, Volume 1, Telemachus Religion and Love by A. E. I have often wondered whether there is not something wrong in our religious systems, in that the same ritual, the same doctrines, the same aspirations, are held to be sufficient both for men and women. The tendency everywhere is to obliterate distinctions, and if a woman be herself, she is looked upon unkindly. She rarely understands our metaphysics, and she gazes on the expounder of the mystery of the Logos with enigmatic eyes which reveal the enchantment of another divinity. The ancients were wiser than we in this, for they had Aphrodite and Hera, and many another form of the Mighty Mother, who bestowed on women their peculiar graces and powers. Surely no girl in ancient Greece ever sent up to all-pervading Zeus a prayer that her natural longings might be fulfilled, but we may be sure that to Aphrodite came many such prayers. The deities we worship today are too austere for women to approach with their peculiar desires, and indeed in Ireland the largest number of our people do not see any necessity for love-making at all, or what connection spiritual powers have with the affections. A girl, without repining, will follow her four-legged dowry to the house of a man she may never have spoken twenty words to before her marriage. We praise our women for their virtue, but the general acceptance of the marriage as arranged shows so unemotional, so undesirable a temperament, that it is not to be wondered at. 
one wonders was their temptation what the loss to the race may be it is impossible to say but it is true that beautiful civilizations are built up by the desire of man to give his beloved all her desires where there is no beloved but only a housekeeper there are no beautiful fancies to create the beautiful arts no spiritual protest against the mean dwelling no hunger to build the world anew for her sake aphrodite is outcast and with her many of the other immortals have also departed the home life in ireland is probably more squalid than with any other people equally prosperous in europe the children begotten without love fill more and more the teeming asylums we are without art literature is despised we have few of those industries which spring up in other countries in response to the desire of woman to make gracious influences pervade the home of her partner a desire to which man readily yields and toils to satisfy if he loves truly the desire for beauty has come almost to be regarded as dangerous if not sinful and the woman who is still the natural child of the great mother and priestess of the mysteries if she betray the desire to exercise her divinely given powers if there be enchantment in her eyes and her laugh and if she bewilder too many men is in our latest code of morals distinctly an evil influence the spirit melted and tortured with love which does not achieve its earthly desire is held to have wasted its strength and the judgment which declares the life to be wrecked is equally severe on that which caused this wild conflagration in the heart but the end of life is not comfort but divine being we do not regard the life which closed in the martyr's fire as ended ignobly the spiritual philosophy which separates human emotions and ideas and declares some to be secular and others spiritual is to blame there is no meditation which if prolonged will not bring us to the same world where religion would carry us and if a flower in the wall will lead us to all knowledge so the understanding of the peculiar nature of one half of humanity will bring us far on our journey to the sacred deep i believe it was this wise understanding which in the ancient world declared the embodied spirit in man to be influenced more by the divine mind and in woman by the mighty mother by which nature in its spiritual aspect was understood in this philosophy boundless being when manifested revealed itself in two forms of life spirit and substance and the endless evolution of its divided rays had as its root impulse the desire to return to that boundless being by many ways blindly or half consciously the individual life strives to regain its old fullness the spirit seeks union with nature to pass from the life of vision into pure being and nature conscious that its grosser forms are impermanent is forever dissolving and leading its votary to a more distant shrine nature is timid like a woman declares an indian scripture she reveals herself shyly and withdraws again all this metaphysic will not appear out of place if we regard woman as influenced beyond herself and her conscious life for spiritual ends i do not enter a defence of the loveless coquette but the woman who has a natural delight in awakening love in men is priestess of a divinity than which there is none mightier among the rulers of the heavens through her eyes her laugh in all her motions there is expressed more than she is conscious of herself 
the mighty mother through the woman is kindling a symbol of herself in the spirit and through that symbol she breathes her secret life into the heart so that it is fed from within and is drawn to herself we remember that with dante the image of a woman became at last the purified vesture of his spirit through which the mysteries were revealed we are forever making our souls with effort and pain and shaping them into images which reveal or are voiceless according to their degree and the man whose spirit has been obsessed by a beauty so long brooded upon that he has almost become that which he contemplated owes much to the woman who may never be his and if he or the world understood aright he has no cause of complaint it is the essentially irreligious spirit of ireland which has come to regard love as an unnecessary emotion and the mingling of the sexes as dangerous for it is a curious thing that while we commonly regard ourselves as the most religious people in europe the reverse is probably true the country which has never produced spiritual thinkers or religious teachers of whom men have heard if we accept berkeley and perhaps the remote johannes scotus erigena cannot pride itself on its spiritual achievement and it might seem even more paradoxical but i think it would be almost equally true to say that the first spiritual note in our literature was struck when a poet generally regarded as pagan wrote it as the aim of his art to reveal in all poor foolish things that live a day eternal beauty wandering on her way the heavens do not declare the glory of god any more than do shining eyes nor the firmament show his handiwork more than the woven wind of hair for these were wrought with no lesser love than set the young stars swimming in seas of joyous and primeval air if we drink in the beauty of the night or the mountains it is deemed to be praise of the maker but if we show an equal adoration of the beauty of man or woman it is dangerous it is almost wicked of course it is dangerous and without danger there is no passage to eternal things there is the valley of the shadow beside the pathway of light and it will always be there and the heavens will never be entered by those who shrink from it spirituality is the power of apprehending formless spiritual essences of seeing the eternal in the transitory and in the things which are seen the unseen things of which they are the shadow i call mr yeats's poetry spiritual when it declares as in the lines i quoted that there is no beauty so trivial that it is not the shadow of the eternal beauty a country is religious where it is common belief that all things are instinct with divinity and where the love between man and woman is seen as a symbol the highest we have of the union of spirit and nature and their final blending in the boundless being for this reason the lightest desires even the lightest graces of women have a philosophical value for what suggestions they bring us of the divinity behind them as men and women feel themselves more and more to be sharers of universal aims they will contemplate in each other and in themselves that aspect of the boundless being under whose influence they are cast and will appeal to it for understanding and power time which is forever bringing back the old and renewing it may yet bring back to us some counterpart of aphrodite or hera as they were understood by the most profound thinkers of the ancient world and woman may again have her temples and her mysteries and renew again her radiant life at its fountain and feel that in seeking for beauty she is growing more into her own ancestral being 
and that in its shining forth she is giving to man as he may give to her something of that completeness of spirit of which it is written neither is the man without the woman nor the woman without the man in the highest it may seem strange that what is so clear should require statement but it is only with a kind of despair the man or woman of religious mind can contemplate the materialism of our thought about life it is not our natural heritage from the past for the bardic poetry shows that a heaven lay about us in the mystical childhood of our race and a supernatural original was often divined for the great hero or the beautiful woman all this perception has withered away for religion has become observance of rule and adherence to doctrine the first steps to the goal have been made sufficient in themselves but religion is useless unless it has a transforming power unless it is able to turn fishermen into divines and make the blind see and the deaf hear they are no true teachers who cannot rise beyond the world of sense and darkness and awaken the links within us from earth to heaven who cannot see within the heart what are its needs and who have not the power to open the poor blind eyes and touch the ears that have heard no sound of the heavenly harmonies our clergymen do their best to deliver us from what they think is evil but do not lead us into the kingdom they forget that the faculties cannot be spiritualized by restraint but in use and that the greatest evil of all is not to be able to see the divine everywhere in life and love no less than in the solemn architecture of the spheres in the free play of the beautiful and natural human relations lie the greatest possibilities of spiritual development for heaven is not prayer nor praise but the fullness of life which is only divined through the richness and variety of life on earth there is a certain infinitude in the emotions of love tenderness pity joy and all that is begotten in love and this limitless character of the emotions has never received the philosophical consideration which is due to it for even laughter may be considered solemnly and gaiety and joy in us are the shadowy echoes of that joy spoken of the radiant morning stars and there is not an emotion in man or woman which has not however perverted and muddied in its coming in some way flowed from the first fountain we are no more divided from supernature than we are from our own bodies and where the life of man or woman is naturally most intense it most naturally overflows and mingles with the subtler and more lovely world within if religion has no word to say upon this it is incomplete and we wander in the narrow circle of prayers and praise wondering all the while what it is we are praising god for because we feel so melancholy and lifeless dante had a place in his inferno for the joyless souls and if his conception be true the population of that circle will be largely modern irish a reaction against this conventional restraint is setting in and the needs of life will perhaps in the future no longer be violated as they are today and since it is the pent-up flood of the joy which ought to be in life which is causing this reaction and since there is a divine root in it it is difficult to say where it might not carry us i hope into some renewal of ancient conceptions of the fundamental purpose of womanhood and its relations to divine nature and that from the temples where woman may be instructed she will come forth with strength in her to resist all pleading until the lover worship in her a divine womanhood 
and that through their love the divided portions of the immortal nature may come together and be one as before the beginning of worlds 1904 end of religion and love by a e recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey the antichrist chapter 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by martin geeson james joyce in context volume 1 telemachus the antichrist chapter 1 by friedrich wilhelm nietzsche Translated by H. L. Mencken Let us look each other in the face. We are Hyperboreans. We know well enough how remote our place is. Neither by land nor by water will you find the road to the Hyperboreans. Even Pindar in his day knew that much about us. Beyond the north, beyond the ice, beyond death, our life, our happiness. We have discovered that happiness. We know the way. We got our knowledge of it from thousands of years in the labyrinth. Who else has found it? The man of today. I don't know either the way out or the way in. I am whatever doesn't know either the way out or the way in. So sighs the man of today. This is the sort of modernity that made us ill. We sickened on lazy peace, cowardly compromise, the whole virtuous dirtiness of the modern yea and nay. This tolerance and largeur of the heart that forgives everything because it understands everything is a sirocco to us. Rather live amid the ice than among modern virtues and other such south winds. We were brave enough, we spared neither ourselves nor others, but we were a long time finding out where to direct our courage. We grew dismal. They called us fatalists. Our fate, it was the fullness, the tension, the storing up of powers. We thirsted for the lightnings and great deeds. We kept as far as possible from the happiness of the weakling, from resignation. There was thunder in our air. Nature, as we embodied it, became overcast, for we had not yet found the way. The formula of our happiness, a yea, a nay, a straight line, a goal. End of the Antichrist by Friedrich Wilhelm Nietzsche, Chapter 1 Translated from the German by H. L. Mencken Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey Hamlet by William Shakespeare, Act One, Scene Two This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Philippa James Joyce in Context, Volume 1, Telemachus Hamlet, by William Shakespeare, Act 1, Scene 2 Elsinore, a room of state in the castle Enter the king, queen, Hamlet, Polonius, Laertes, Voltimand, Cornelius, lords and attendants King Though yet of Hamlet our dear brother's death the memory be green, and that it has befitted to bear our hearts in grief, and our whole kingdom to be contracted in one brow of woe. Yet so far hath discretion fought with nature, that we with wisest sorrow think on him, together with remembrance of ourselves. Therefore our sometime sister, now our queen, the imperial jointress to this warlike state, have we, as twere with a defeated joy, with an auspicious and one dropping eye, with mirth in funeral, and with dirge in marriage, in equal scale weighing delight and dole,
taken to wife. Nor have we herein barred your better wisdoms, which have freely gone with this affair along, or all our thanks. Now follows that you know, young Fortinbras, holding a weak supposal of our worth, or thinking by our late dear brother's death our state to be disjoint and out of frame, colleagued with this dream of his advantage, he hath not failed to pester us with message importing the surrender of those lands lost by his father, with all bonds of law, to our most valiant brother. So much for him. Now for ourself, and for this time of meeting, thus much the business is. We have here writ to Norway, uncle of young Fortinbras, who, impotent and bedrid, scarcely hears of this his nephew's purpose, to suppress his further gate herein, in that the levies, the lists, and full proportions are all made out of his subject. And we here dispatch you, good Cornelius, and you, Voltimand, for bearers of this greeting to old Norway, giving to you no further personal power to business with the king, more than the scope of these dilated articles allow. Farewell, and let your haste commend your duty. Cornelius and Voltimand. In that, In that and all things will we show our duty. We doubt it nothing. Heartily farewell. Exeunt Voltimand and Cornelius. And now, Laertes, what's the news with you? You told us of some suit. What is it, Laertes? You cannot speak of reason to the Dane and lose your voice. What wouldst thou beg, Laertes, that shall not be my offer, not thy asking? The head is not more native to the heart, the hand more instrumental to the mouth, than is the throne of Denmark to thy father. What wouldst thou have, Laertes? Dread my lord, your leave and favour to return to France, from whence, though willingly I came to Denmark to show my duty in your coronation, yet now I must confess that duty done, my thoughts and wishes bend again toward France, and bow them to your gracious leave and pardon. Have you your father's leave? What says Polonius? He hath, my lord, wrung from me my slow leave by laboursome petition, and at last upon his will I sealed my hard consent. I do beseech you, give him leave to go. Take thy fair hour, Laertes. Time be thine, and thy best graces spend it at thy will. But now, my cousin Hamlet and my son, Hamlet aside, a little more than kin, and less than kind. How is it that the clouds still hang on you? Not so, my lord, I am too much in the sun. Queen. Good Hamlet, cast thy knighted colour off, and let thine eye look like a friend on Denmark. Do not for ever with thy veiled lids seek for thy noble father in the dust. Thou know'st, tis common, all that lives must die, passing through nature to eternity. Hamlet. Ay, madam, it is common. If it be, why seems it so particular with thee? Seems, madam. Nay, it is. I know not seems. Tis not alone my inky cloak, good mother, nor customary suits of solemn black, nor windy suspiration of forced breath. No, nor the fruitful river in the eye, nor the dejected haviour of the visage, together with all forms, moods, shows of grief that can denote me truly. These, indeed, seem, for they are actions that a man might play. But I have that within which passeth show, these but the trappings and the suits of woe. King, tis sweet and commendable in your nature, Hamlet, to give these mourning duties to your father. But you must know, your father lost a father, that father lost, lost his, and the survivor bound in filial obligation for some term to do obsequious sorrow. But to persevere in obstinate condolment is a course of impious stubbornness. Tis unmanly grief. 
it shows a will most incorrect to heaven, a heart unfortified, a mind impatient, an understanding simple and unschooled, for what we know must be, and is as common as any the most vulgar thing to sense, why should we in our peevish opposition take it to heart? Fie! "'Tis a fault to heaven, a fault against the dead, "'a fault to nature, to reason most absurd, "'whose common theme is death of fathers, "'and who still hath cried from the first cause "'till he that died to-day, this must be so. "'We pray you throw to earth this unprevailing woe, "'and think of us as of a father.' For let the world take note, you are the most immediate to our throne, and with no less nobility of love than that which dearest father bears his son do I impart toward you. For your intent in going back to school in Wittenberg, it is most retrograde to our desire, and we beseech you, bend you to remain here in the cheer and comfort of our eye, our chiefest courtier, cousin, and our son." Let not thy mother lose her prayers, Hamlet. I pray thee stay with us, go not to Wittenberg. Hamlet. I shall in all my best obey you, madam. King. Why, tis a loving and a fair reply. Be as ourself in Denmark. Madam, come. This gentle and unforced accord of Hamlet sits smiling to my heart, in grace whereof no jocund health that Denmark drinks to-day, but the great cannon to the clouds shall tell, and the king's rouse, the heaven shall brute again, re-speaking earthly thunder. Come away. Exeunt all but Hamlet. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon gainst self-slaughter. Oh, God! Oh, God! How weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world! Fiant! Oh, fight is an unweeded garden that grows to seed. Things rank and gross in nature possess it merely that it should come to this, but two months dead, nay, not so much, not two, so excellent a king, that was to this Hyperion to a satyr, so loving to my mother that he might not beteem the winds of heaven visit her face too roughly. Heaven and earth, must I remember? Why, she would hang on him as if increase of appetite had grown by what it fed on and yet within a month let me not think aunt frailty thy name is woman a little month or ere those shoes were old with which she followed my poor father's body like niobe all tears why she even she, oh God, a beast that once discourse of reason would have mourned longer, married with mine uncle, my father's brother, but no more like my father than I to Hercules, within a month, ere yet the salt of most unrighteous tears had left the flushing in her gallard eyes, she married, Oh, most wicked speed, to post with such dexterity to incestuous sheets! It is not, nor it cannot come to good. But break my heart, for I must hold my tongue. Enter Horatio, Marcellus, and Bernardo. Horatio. Hail to your lordship. Hamlet. I am glad to see you well. Horatio, or I do forget myself. The same, my lord, and your poor servant ever. Sir, my good friend, I'll change that name with you. And what make you from Wittenberg, Horatio? Marcellus. Marcellus. My good lord. I am very glad to see you. Good even, sir. But what, in faith, make you from Wittenberg? Horatio. 
A truant disposition, good my lord. I would not hear your enemy say so, nor shall you do my ear that violence to make it truster of your own report against yourself. I know you are no truant, but what is your affair in Elsinore? We'll teach you to drink deep ere you depart. My lord, I came to see your father's funeral. I prithee do not mock me, fellow student. I think it was to see my mother's wedding. Indeed, my lord, it followed hard upon. Thrift, thrift, Horatio. The funeral baked meats did coldly furnish forth the marriage tables. Would I had met my dearest foe in heaven, or ever I had seen that day, Horatio. My father, methinks I see my father. Where, my lord? In my mind's eye, Horatio. I saw him once. He was a goodly king. He was a man. Take him for all in all. I shall not look upon his like again. My lord, I think I saw him yesternight. Saw who? My lord, the king your father. The king my father? Season your admiration for a while with an attent ear till I may deliver upon the witness of these gentlemen this marvel to you. For God's love let me hear. Two nights together had these gentlemen, Marcellus and Bernardo, on their watch, in the dead, vast, and middle of the night, been thus encountered. A figure like your father, armed at point exactly cap a appears before them, and with solemn march goes slow and stately by them. Thrice he walked by their oppressed and fear-surprised eyes, within his truncheon's length, whilst they, distilled almost to jelly with the act of fear, stand dumb and speak not to him. This, to me, in dreadful secrecy in part they did, and I, with them, the third night, kept the watch, where, as they had delivered, both in time, form of the thing, each word made true and good, the apparition comes. I, I knew your father, these hands are not more like. But where was this? Marcellus. My lord, upon the platform where we watched. Did you not speak to it? Horatio. My lord, I did, but answer made it none. Yet once methought it lifted up its head, and did address itself to motion like as it would speak. But even then the morning cock crew loud, and at the sound it shrunk in haste away, and vanished from our sight. Tis very strange. As I do live, my honoured lord, tis true. And we did think it writ down in our duty to let you know of it. Indeed, indeed, sirs, but... This troubles me. Hold you the watch to-night. Marcellus and Bernardo. We, we do, do, my, my lord. lord. Armed, say you. Armed, Armed my, lord. my lord. From top to toe. My lord, my lord from, from head, head to, to foot. foot. Then saw you not his face? Horatio. Oh, yes, my lord, he wore his beaver up. What, looked he frowningly? A countenance more in sorrow than in anger. Pale or red? Nay, very pale. And fixed his eyes upon you? Most constantly. I would I had been there. It would have much amazed you. Very like, very like. Stayed it long. While one with moderate haste might tell a hundred. Longer. Longer. Not when I saw it. His beard was grizzled, no? It was, as I have seen it in his life, a sable silvered. I will watch to-night. Perchance twill walk again. I warrant it will. If it assume my noble father's person, I'll speak to it, though hell itself should gape and bid me hold my peace. I pray you all, if you have hitherto concealed this sight, let it be tenable in your silence still, and whatsoever else shall hap to-night, give it an understanding, but no tongue. I will requite your loves. So, fare ye well. 
Upon the platform twixt eleven and twelve I'll visit you. All. Our, Our duty, duty to your honour. Your, duty to your, honor. your loves, as mine to you. Farewell. Exeunt Horatio, Marcellus, and Bernardo. My father's spirit in arms. All is not well. I doubt some foul play. Would the night were come. Till then, sit still, my soul. Foul deeds will rise, though all the earth o'erwhelm them to men's eyes. Exit. End of Hamlet, Act One, Scene Two. To a Laos by Robert Burns. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shalifa Mollichem. James Joyce in Context, Volume 1. Telemachus. To a Laos by Robert Burns. To a Laos. On seeing one in a lady's bonnet at church. A Mauklin incident of a Mauklin lady is related in this poem, which, to many of the softer friends of the bard, was anything but welcome. It appeared in the Kilmanagh copy of his poems, and remonstrance and persuasion were alike tried in vain to keep it out of the Edinburgh edition. Instead of regarding it as a seasonable rebuke to pride and vanity, some of his learned commentators called it coarse and vulgar. Those classic persons might have remembered that Julian, no vulgar person but an emperor and a scholar, wore a populous beard and was proud of it. Ha! Huh? Where are you going? You growling fairly. Your impudence protects you sadly. I cannot say, but you surrender rarely o'er the goes and lees. Though faiths are fair, you dine but sparely on sick a please. You ugly, creeping, blasted wonner, detested, shunned by his own sinner. How dare you set your fit upon her, so fine a lady? Ye somewhere else, and seek your dinner on some poor body. Swiss, in some beggar's half at squattle, there you may creep and sprawl and sprattle, with either kindred jumping cattle in shoals and nations, where hoar no be near door and settle your sick plantations. Now hood you there, your other sicht, below the fetteral snug and ticht. Now faith ye yet, you'll be no recht till you've cut on it, the very topmost towering hecht of Mrs. Bonnet. My sooth, recht bold you set her nose it, as plump and grey as only crows it, or for some rank mercurial rot it, or fell reds, madam, I'd give a sick hearty dose it, or dress your trodden. I wouldn't have been surprised to spy on an old wife's flaming toy, or able on some bit dirty boy on his wily coat. But miss this fine Leonard defy, how dare you do it? Oh, Jenny, did I toss your head, and set your beauties over bread? You little can what corsets speed to blast his makin. They wings and finger and side the red are no distaken. Oh, what some part the gift he gives, to see ourselves as our seers. Eh, hey, what frame man ye blunder free is, and foolish notion. What airs and dress and gait would lead us, and in devotion. End of To a Louse by Robert Burns The Lord's Prayer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lenny. James Joyce in Context, Volume 1. Telemachus. The Lord's Prayer. Latin Version. Sic ergo vos orabitis. Pater noster, qui in celis es, sanctificetur nomen tuum, veniet regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in cielo et in terra. Panem nostrum, super substantialem, da nobis hodie. Et dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimissimus debitoribus nostris. Et ne inducas nos in temptationem, sed libera nos amalo. Amen. 
English version. Thus therefore shall you pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our supersubstantial bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. End of the Lord's Prayer Preface to The Picture of Dorian Gray This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Williams James Joyce in Context, Volume 1, Telemachus Preface to The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde The artist is the creator of beautiful things. To reveal art and conceal the artist is the art's aim. The critic is he who can translate into another manner or a new material his impression of beautiful things. The highest, as the lowest form of criticism, is a mode of autobiography. Those who find ugly meanings in beautiful things are corrupt without being charming. This is a fault. Those who find beautiful meanings in beautiful things are the cultivated. For these there is hope. They are the elect, to whom beautiful things mean only beauty. There is no such thing as a moral or an immoral book. Books are well written or badly written. That is all. The nineteenth century dislike of realism is the rage of Caliban seeing his own face in a glass. The nineteenth century dislike of romanticism is the rage of Caliban not seeing his own face in a glass. The moral life of man forms part of the subject matter of the artist, but the morality of art consists in the perfect use of an imperfect medium. No artist desires to prove anything. Even things that are true can be proved. No artist has ethical sympathies. An ethical sympathy in an artist is an unpardonable mannerism of style. No artist is ever morbid. The artist can express everything. Thought and language are to the artist instruments of an art. Vice and virtue are to the artist materials for an art. From the point of view of form, the type of all the arts is the art of the musician. From the point of view of feeling, the actor's craft is the type. All art is at once surface and symbol. Those who go beneath the surface do so at their peril. Those who read the symbol do so at their peril. It is the spectator, and not life, that art really mirrors. Diversity of opinion about a work of art shows that the work is new, complex, and vital. When critics disagree, the artist is in accord with himself. We can forgive a man for making a useful thing as long as he does not admire it. The only excuse for making a useless thing is that one admires it intensely. All art is quite useless. Oscar Wilde End of Preface to the Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde Recording by Sarah Williams Culture and Anarchy by Matthew Arnold Chapter 4 Hellenism and Hebraism This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa James Joyce in Context, Volume 1, Telemachus Culture and Anarchy by Matthew Arnold, Chapter 4, Hellenism and Hebraism This fundamental ground is our preference of doing to thinking. Now this preference is a main element in our nature, 
and as we study it we find ourselves opening up a number of large questions on every side. Let me go back for a moment to what I have already quoted from Bishop Wilson. First, never go against the best light you have. Secondly, take care that your light be not darkness. I said we show, as a nation, laudable energy and persistence in walking according to the best light we have, but are not quite careful enough, perhaps, to see that our light be not darkness. This is only another version of the old story that energy is our strong point and favourable characteristic, rather than intelligence. But we may give to this idea a more general form still, in which it will have a yet larger range of application. We may regard this energy driving at practice, this paramount sense of the obligation of duty, self-control and work, this earnestness in going manfully with the best light we have, as one force. And we may regard the intelligence driving at those ideas which are, after all, the basis of right practice, the ardent sense for all the new and changing combinations of them which man's development brings with it, the indomitable impulse to know and adjust them perfectly, as another force. And these two forces we may regard as in some sense rivals, rivals not by the necessity of their own nature, but as exhibited in man and his history, and rivals dividing the empire of the world between them. And to give these forces names, from the two races of men who have supplied the most signal and splendid manifestations of them, we may call them respectively the forces of Hebraism and Hellenism. Hebraism and Hellenism, between these two points of influence, moves our world. At one time it feels more powerfully the attraction of one of them, at another time of the other, and it ought to be, though it never is, evenly and happily balanced between them. The final aim of both Hellenism and Hebraism, as of all great spiritual disciplines, is no doubt the same, man's perfection or salvation. The very language which they both of them use in schooling us to reach this aim is often identical. Even when their language indicates by variation, sometimes a broad variation, often a but slight and subtle variation, the different courses of thought which are uppermost in each discipline, even then the unity of the final end and aim is still apparent. To employ the actual words of that discipline with which we ourselves are all of us most familiar, and the words of which therefore come most home to us, that final end and aim is that we might be partakers of the divine nature. These are the words of a Hebrew apostle, but of Hellenism and Hebraism alike, this is, I say, the aim. When the two are confronted, as they very often are confronted, it is nearly always with what I may call a rhetorical purpose. The speaker's whole design is to exalt and enthrone one of the two, and he uses the other only as a foil, and to enable him the better to give effect to his purpose. Obviously, with us, it is usually Hellenism which is thus reduced to minister to the triumph of Hebraism. There is a sermon on Greece and the Greek spirit by a man, never to be mentioned without interest and respect, Frederick Robertson, in which this rhetorical use of Greece and the Greek spirit, and the inadequate exhibition of them necessarily consequent upon this, is almost ludicrous, and would be censurable if it were not to be explained by the exigences of a sermon. On the other hand, Heinrich Heine, and other writers of his sort, give us the spectacle of the tables completely turned, and of Hebraism brought in just as a foil and contrast to Hellenism, and to make the superiority of Hellenism more manifest. In both these cases there is injustice and misrepresentation. The aim and end of both Hebraism and Hellenism is, as I have said, one and the same, and this aim and end is august and admirable. Still, they pursue this aim by very different courses. The uppermost idea with Hellenism is to see things as they really are. The uppermost idea with Hebraism is conduct and obedience. Nothing can do away with this ineffaceable difference. The Greek quarrel with the body and its desires is that they hinder right thinking, 
The Hebrew quarrel with them is that they hinder right acting. He that keepeth the law, happy is he. There is nothing sweeter than to take heed unto the commandments of the Lord. That is the Hebrew notion of felicity, and pursued with passion and tenacity, this notion would not let the Hebrew rest till, as is well known, he had at last got out of the law a network of prescriptions to enwrap his whole life, to govern every moment of it, every impulse, every action. The Greek notion of felicity, on the other hand, is perfectly conveyed in these words of a great French moralist. C'est le bonheur des hommes? When? When they abhor that which is evil? No. When they exercise themselves in the law of the Lord day and night? No. When they die daily? No. When they walk about the new Jerusalem with palms in their hands? No. But when they think aright? when their thought hits, quand ils pensent juste. At the bottom of both the Greek and the Hebrew notion is the desire, native in man, for reason and the will of God, the feeling after the universal order, in a word, the love of God. But while Hebraism seizes upon certain plain capital intimations of the universal order, and rivets itself, one may say, with unequalled grandeur of earnestness and intensity, on the study and observance of them, the bent of Hellenism is to follow with flexible activity the whole play of the universal order, to be apprehensive of missing any part of it, of sacrificing one part to another, to slip away from resting in this or that intimation of it, however capital. An unclouded clearness of mind, an unimpeded play of thought, is what this bent drives at. The governing idea of Hellenism is spontaneity of consciousness, that of Hebraism, strictness of conscience. Christianity changed nothing in this essential bent of Hebraism to set doing above knowing. Self-conquest, self-devotion, the following not our own individual will but the will of God, obedience, is the fundamental idea of this form also of the discipline to which we have attached the general name of Hebraism. Only as the old law and the network of prescriptions with which it enveloped human life were evidently a motive power not driving and searching enough to produce the result aimed at, patient continuance in well-doing self-conquest, Christianity substituted for them boundless devotion to that inspiring and affecting pattern of self-conquest offered by Christ, and by the new motive power, of which the essence was this, though the love and admiration of Christian churches have for centuries been employed in varying, amplifying, and adorning the plain description of it, Christianity, as St. Paul truly says, establishes the law, and in the strength of the ampler power which she has thus supplied to fulfil it, has accomplished the miracles, which we all see, of her history. So long as we do not forget that both Hellenism and Hebraism are profound and admirable manifestations of man's life, tendencies, and powers, and that both of them aim at a like final result, we can hardly insist too strongly on the divergence of line and of operation with which they proceed. It is a divergence so great that it most truly, as the prophet Zechariah says, has raised up thy sons, O Zion, against thy sons, O Greece. The difference, whether it is by doing or by knowing, that we set most store, and the practical consequences which follow from this difference, leave their mark on all the history of our race and of its development. Language may be abundantly quoted from both Hellenism and Hebraism, to make it seem that one follows the same current as the other towards the same goal. They are truly born towards the same goal, but the currents which bear them are infinitely different. It is true, Solomon will praise knowing. Understanding is a wellspring of life unto him that hath it. And in the New Testament, again, Christ is a light, and truth makes us free. It is true, Aristotle will undervalue knowing. In what concerns virtue, says he, three things are necessary, knowledge, deliberate will, and perseverance. But whereas the two last are all important, the first is a matter of little importance. It is true that with the same impatience with which St. James enjoins a man to be not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, Epictetus exhorts us to do what we have demonstrated to ourselves we ought to do, 
or he taunts us with futility, for being armed at all points to prove that lying is wrong, yet all the time continuing to lie. It is true, Plato, in words which are almost the words of the New Testament or the imitation, calls life a learning to die. But underneath the superficial agreement, the fundamental divergence still subsists. The understanding of Solomon is the walking in the way of the commandments. This is the way of peace, and it is of this that blessedness comes. In the New Testament, the truth which gives us the peace of God and makes us free is the love of Christ constraining us to crucify as he did, and with a like purpose of moral regeneration, the flesh with all its affections and lusts, and thus establishing, as we have seen, the law. To St. Paul it appears possible to hold the truth in unrighteousness, which is just what Socrates judged impossible. The moral virtues, on the other hand, are with Aristotle but the porch and access to the intellectual, and with these last is blessedness. That partaking of the divine life, which both Hellenism and Hebraism, as we have said, fix as their crowning aim, Plato expressly denies to the man of practical virtue merely, of self-conquest with any other motive than that of perfect intellectual vision. He reserves it for the lover of pure knowledge, of seeing things as they really are, the philomates. Both Hellenism and Hebraism arise out of the wants of human nature, and address themselves to satisfying those wants. But their methods are so different, they lay stress on such different points, and call into being, by their respective disciplines, such different activities, that the face which human nature presents when it passes from the hands of one of them to those of the other is no longer the same. To get rid of one's ignorance, to see things as they are, and by seeing them as they are, to see them in their beauty, is the simple and attractive ideal which Hellenism holds out before human nature, and from the simplicity and charm of this ideal, Hellenism and human life in the hands of Hellenism is invested with a kind of aerial ease, clearness and radiancy. They are full of what we call sweetness and light. Difficulties are kept out of view, and the beauty and rationalness of the idea have all our thoughts. The best man is he who most tries to perfect himself, and the happiest man is he who most feels that he is perfecting himself. This account of the matter by Socrates, the true Socrates of the memorabilia, has something so simple, spontaneous, and unsophisticated about it, that it seems to fill us with clearness and hope when we hear it. But there is a saying which I have heard attributed to Mr. Carlyle about Socrates, a very happy saying, whether it is really Mr. Carlyle's or not, which excellently marks the essential point in which Hebraism differs from Hellenism. Socrates, this saying goes, is terribly at ease in Zion. Hebraism, and here is the source of its wonderful strength, has always been severely preoccupied with an awful sense of the impossibility of being at ease in Zion, of the difficulties which oppose themselves to man's pursuit or attainment of that perfection of which Socrates talks so hopefully, and, as from this point of view one might also say, so glibly. It is all very well to talk of getting rid of one's ignorance, of seeing things in their reality, seeing them in their beauty. But how is this to be done when there is something which thwarts and spoils all our efforts? This something is sin, and the space which sin fills in Hebraism, as compared with Hellenism, is indeed prodigious. This obstacle to perfection fills the whole scene, and perfection appears remote and rising away from earth in the background. Under the name of sin, the difficulties of knowing oneself and conquering oneself, which impede man's passage to perfection, become for Hebraism a positive, active entity hostile to man, a mysterious power which I heard Dr. Pusey the other day, in one of his impressive sermons, compare to a hideous hunchback seated on our shoulders and which it is the main business of our lives to hate and oppose. The discipline of the Old Testament may be summed up as a discipline teaching us to abhor and flee from sin, the discipline of the New Testament as a discipline teaching us to die to it. As Hellenism speaks of thinking clearly, seeing things in their essence and beauty, as a grand and precious feat for man to achieve, 
So Hebraism speaks of becoming conscious of sin, of awakening to a sense of sin, as a feat of this kind. It is obvious to what wide divergence these differing tendencies, actively followed, must lead. As one passes and repasses from Hellenism to Hebraism, from Plato to St. Paul, one feels inclined to rub one's eyes and ask oneself whether man is indeed a gentle and simple being, showing the traces of a noble and divine nature, or an unhappy chained captive, labouring with groanings that cannot be uttered to free himself from the body of this death. Apparently it was the Hellenic conception of human nature which was unsound, for the world could not live by it. Absolutely to call it unsound, however, is to fall into the common error of its Hebraizing enemies. But it was unsound at that particular moment of man's development. It was premature. The indispensable basis of conduct and self-control, the platform upon which alone the perfection aimed at by Greece can come into bloom, was not to be reached by our race so easily. Centuries of probation and discipline were needed to bring us to it. Therefore the bright promise of Hellenism faded, and Hebraism ruled the world. Then was seen that astonishing spectacle, so well marked by the often quoted words of the prophet Zechariah, when men of all languages of the nations took hold of the skirt of him that was a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. And the Hebraism which thus received and ruled a world all gone out of the way and altogether become unprofitable, was, and could not but be, the later, the more spiritual, the more attractive development of Hebraism. It was Christianity, that is to say, Hebraism aiming at self-conquest and rescue from the thrall of vile affections, not by obedience to the letter of a law, but by conformity to the image of a self-sacrificing example. To a world stricken with moral enervation, Christianity offered its spectacle of an inspired self-sacrifice. To men who refused themselves nothing, it showed one who refused himself everything. My Saviour banished joy, says George Herbert. When the Alma Venus, the life-giving and joy-giving power of nature, so fondly cherished by the pagan world, could not save her followers from self-dissatisfaction and ennui, the severe words of the Apostle came bracingly and refreshingly. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Throughout age after age, and generation after generation, our race, or all that part of our race which was most living and progressive, was baptized into a death, and endeavoured by suffering in the flesh to cease from sin. Of this endeavour the animating labours and afflictions of early Christianity, the touching asceticism of medieval Christianity, are the great historical manifestations. Literary monuments of it, each in its own way incomparable, remain in the Epistles of St. Paul, in St. Augustine's Confessions, and in the two original and simplest books of the Imitation. Of two disciplines laying their main stress, the one on clear intelligence, the other on firm obedience, the one on comprehensively knowing the grounds of one's duty, the other on diligently practising it, the one on taking all possible care, to use Bishop Wilson's words again, that the light we have be not darkness, the other that, according to the best light we have, we diligently walk. The priority naturally belongs to that discipline which braces man's moral powers, and founds for him an indispensable basis of character. And therefore it is justly said of the Jewish people, who were charged with setting powerfully forth that side of the divine order to which the words conscience and self-conquest point, that they were entrusted with the oracles of God, as it is justly said of Christianity, which followed Judaism, and which set forth this side with much deeper effectiveness and a much wider influence, that the wisdom of the old pagan world was foolishness compared to it. No words of devotion and admiration can be too strong to render thanks to these beneficent forces which have so borne forward humanity in its appointed work of coming to the knowledge and possession of itself, above all in those great moments when their action was the wholesomest and most necessary. But the evolution of these forces, separately and in themselves, is not the whole evolution of humanity. 
their single history is not the whole history of man, whereas their admirers are always apt to make it stand for the whole history. Hebraism and Hellenism are neither of them the law of human development, as their admirers are prone to make them. They are each of them contributions to human development, august contributions, invaluable contributions, and each showing itself to us more august, more invaluable, more preponderant over the other, according to the moment in which we take them and the relation in which we stand to them. The nations of our modern world, children of that immense and salutary movement which broke up the pagan world, inevitably stand to Hellenism in a relation which dwarfs it, and to Hebraism in a relation which magnifies it. They are inevitably prone to take Hebraism as the law of human development, and not as simply a contribution to it, however precious. And yet the lesson must perforce be learned that the human spirit is wider than the most priceless of the forces which bear it onward, and that to the whole development of man Hebraism itself is, like Hellenism, but a contribution. Perhaps we may help ourselves to see this clearer by an illustration drawn from the treatment of a single great idea which has profoundly engaged the human spirit, and has given it eminent opportunities for showing its nobleness and energy. It surely must be perceived that the idea of the immortality of the soul, as this idea rises in its generality before the human spirit, is something grander, truer, and more satisfying than it is in the particular forms by which St. Paul, in the famous fifteenth chapter of the Epistle to the Corinthians, and Plato, in the Phaedo, endeavour to develop and establish it. Surely we cannot but feel that the argumentation with which the Hebrew apostle goes about to expound this great idea is, after all, confused and inconclusive, and that the reasoning, drawn from analogies of likeness and equality, which is employed upon it by the Greek philosopher, is over-subtle and sterile. Above and beyond the inadequate solutions which Hebraism and Hellenism here attempt, extends the immense and august problem itself, and the human spirit which gave birth to it. And this single illustration may suggest to us how the same thing happens in other cases also. But meanwhile, by alternations of Hebraism and Hellenism, of man's intellectual and moral impulses, of the effort to see things as they really are, and the effort to win peace by self-conquest, the human spirit proceeds, and each of these two forces has its appointed hours of culmination and seasons of rule. As the great movement of Christianity was a triumph of Hebraism and man's moral impulses, so the great movement which goes by the name of the Renaissance was an uprising and reinstatement of man's intellectual impulses and of Hellenism. We in England, the devoted children of Protestantism, chiefly know the Renaissance by its subordinate and secondary side of the Reformation. The Reformation has been often called a Hebraizing revival, a return to the ardour and sincereness of primitive Christianity. No one, however, can study the development of Protestantism and of Protestant churches without feeling that into the Reformation too, Hebraizing child of the Renaissance and offspring of its fervour rather than its intelligence, as it undoubtedly was, the subtle Hellenic leaven of the Renaissance found its way, and that the exact respective parts in the Reformation of Hebraism and of Hellenism are not easy to separate. But what we may with truth say is that all which Protestantism was to itself clearly conscious of, all which it succeeded in clearly setting forth in words, had the characters of Hebraism rather than of Hellenism. The Reformation was strong in that it was an earnest return to the Bible, and to doing from the heart the will of God as they are written. It was weak in that it never consciously grasped or applied the central idea of the Renaissance, the Hellenic idea of pursuing in all lines of activity the law and science, to use Plato's words, of things as they really are. Whatever direct superiority, therefore, Protestantism had over Catholicism was a moral superiority, a superiority arising out of its greater sincerity and earnestness, at the moment of its apparition at any rate, in dealing with the heart and conscience. Its pretensions to an intellectual superiority are in general quite illusory. For Hellenism, for the thinking side in man as distinguished from the acting side, the attitude of mind of Protestantism towards the Bible 
in no respect differs from the attitude of mind of Catholicism towards the Church. The mental habit of him who imagines that Balaam's ass spoke in no respect differs from the mental habit of him who imagines that a Madonna of wood or stone winked, and the one who says that God's Church makes him believe what he believes, and the other who says that God's Word makes him believe what he believes, are for the philosopher perfectly alike in not really and truly knowing, when they say God's Church and God's Word, what it is they say, or whereof they affirm. In the sixteenth century, therefore, Hellenism re-entered the world, and again stood in presence of Hebraism, a Hebraism renewed and purged. Now it has not been enough observed how, in the seventeenth century, a fate befell Hellenism in some respects analogous to that which befell it at the commencement of our era. The Renaissance, that great reawakening of Hellenism, that irresistible return of humanity to nature and to seeing things as they are, which in art, in literature, and in physics produced such splendid fruits, had, like the anterior Hellenism of the pagan world, a side of moral weakness, and of relaxation or insensibility of the moral fibre which in Italy showed itself with the most startling plainness, but which in France, England, and other countries was very apparent too. Again this loss of spiritual balance, this exclusive preponderance given to man's perceiving and knowing side, this unnatural defect of his feeling and acting side, provoked a reaction. Let us trace that reaction where it most nearly concerns us. Science has now made visible to everybody the great and pregnant elements of difference which lie in race, and in how signal a manner they make the genius and history of an Indo-European people vary from those of a Semitic people. Hellenism is of Indo-European growth, Hebraism is of Semitic growth, and we English, a nation of Indo-European stock, seem to belong naturally to the movement of Hellenism. But nothing more strongly marks the essential unity of man than the affinities we can perceive, in this point or that, between members of one family of peoples and members of another. And no affinity of this kind is more strongly marked than that likeness in the strength and prominence of the moral fibre, which, notwithstanding immense elements of difference, knits in some special sort the genius and history of us English, and of our American descendants across the Atlantic, to the genius and history of the Hebrew people. Puritanism, which has been so great a power in the English nation, and in the strongest part of the English nation, was originally the reaction, in the seventeenth century, of the conscience and moral sense of our race, against the moral indifference and lax rule of conduct, which in the sixteenth century came in with the Renaissance. It was a reaction of Hebraism against Hellenism, and it powerfully manifested itself, as was natural, in a people with much of what we call a Hebraizing turn, with a signal affinity for the bent which was the master bent of Hebrew life. Eminently Indo-European by its humour, by the power it shows, through this gift of imaginatively acknowledging the multiform aspects of the problem of life, and of thus getting itself unfixed from its own over-certainty, of smiling at its over-tenacity, our race has yet, and a great part of its strength lies here, in matters of practical life and moral conduct, a strong share of the assuredness, the tenacity, the intensity of the Hebrews. This turn manifested itself in Puritanism, and has had a great part in shaping our history for the last two hundred years. Undoubtedly it checked and changed amongst us that movement of the Renaissance which we see producing in the reign of Elizabeth such wonderful fruits, Undoubtedly it stopped the prominent rule and direct development of that order of ideas which we call by the name of Hellenism, and gave the first rank to a different order of ideas. Apparently, too, as we said of the former defeat of Hellenism, if Hellenism was defeated, this shows that Hellenism was imperfect, and that its ascendancy at that moment would not have been for the world's good. Yet there is a very important difference between the defeat inflicted on Hellenism by Christianity eighteen hundred years ago, and the check given to the Renaissance by Puritanism. The greatness of the difference is well measured by the difference in force, beauty, significance and usefulness between primitive Christianity and Protestantism. Eighteen hundred years ago it was altogether the hour of Hebraism. Primitive Christianity was legitimately and truly the ascendant force in the world at that time, 
and the way of mankind's progress lay through its full development. Another hour in man's development began in the fifteenth century, and the main road of his progress then lay for a time through Hellenism. Puritanism was no longer the central current of the world's progress, it was a side-stream crossing the central current and checking it. The cross and the check may have been necessary and salutary, but that does not do away with the essential difference between the main stream of man's advance and a cross or side-stream. For more than two hundred years the main stream of man's advance has moved towards knowing himself and the world, seeing things as they are, spontaneity of consciousness. The main impulse of a great part, and that the strongest part, of our nation has been towards strictness of conscience. They have made the secondary the principal at the wrong moment, and the principal they have at the wrong moment treated as secondary. This contravention of the natural order has produced, as such contravention always must produce, a certain confusion and false movement, of which we are now beginning to feel in almost every direction the inconvenience. In all directions our habitual courses of action seem to be losing efficaciousness, credit and control, both with others and even with ourselves. Everywhere we see the beginnings of confusion, and we want a clue to some sound order and authority. This we can only get by going back upon the actual instincts and forces which rule our life, seeing them as they really are, connecting them with other instincts and forces, and enlarging our whole view and rule of life. End of Culture and Anarchy, Chapter 4 Hellenism and Hebraism by Matthew Arnold The Twin Soul by William Sharp. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shalifa Malachem. James Joyce in Context, Volume 1. Telemachus. The Twin Soul by William Sharp. In the dead of the night, a spirit came. Her moon-white face and her eyes of flame were known to me. I called her name. The name that shall not be spoken at all, till death hath this body of mine in thrall. And she laughed to see me lying there, wrapped in the living corpse, bloody and fair, and my soul mid its thin film shining bare. And I rose, and followed her glance so sweet, and passed from the house, with noiseless feet. I know not myself what I knew, what I saw. I know that it filled me with trouble and awe, with pain that still at my heart doth gnaw, that she with her wild eyes witched my soul, and whispered the name of the unknown goal. Oh, wild was her laugh, and wild was my cry, when with one long flash and a weary sigh I awoke as from sleep bewilderingly. Her voice, her eyes, they are with me still, O spirit enchantress, O demon will. End of the Twin Soul A School for Scandal this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. James Joyce in Context, Volume 1, Telemachus. A School for Scandal by Richard Brinsley Sheridan. Act 1, Scene 2. Scene 2. Sir Peter's House. Enter Sir Peter. When an old bachelor takes a young wife, what is he to expect? Tis now six months since Lady Teasel made me the happiest of men, and I have been the most miserable dog ever since that committed wedlock. We tiffed a little going to church, and come back to quarrel before the bells had done ringing. I was more than once nearly choked with gall during the honeymoon, and had lost all comfort in life before my friends had done wishing me joy. Yet I choose with caution, a girl bred wholly in the country, 
who never knew luxury beyond one silk gown, nor dissipation above the annual gala of a race ball. Yet she now plays her part in all the extravagant fopperies of the fashion in the town, with as ready a grace as if she had never seen a bush, nor a grass plot out of Grovener's Square. I am sneered at by my old acquaintances, paragraphed in the newspapers. She dissipates my fortune, and contradicts all my humors. Yet the worst of it is, I doubt I love her, or I should never bear all this. However, I'll never be weak enough to own it. Enter Rowley. Rowley. Sir Peter, your servant. How is it with you, sir? Sir Peter. Very bad, Master Rowley, very bad. I meet with nothing but crosses and vexations. Rowley. What can have happened to trouble you since yesterday? Sir Peter. A good question to a married man. Rowley. Nay, I'm sure your lady, Sir Peter, can't be the cause of your uneasiness. Sir Peter. Why, has anyone told you she was dead? Rowley. Come, come, Sir Peter. You love her, notwithstanding your tempers do not exactly agree. Sir Peter. But the fault is entirely hers, Master Rowley. I am, myself, the sweetest tempered man alive, and I hate a teasing temper. And so I tell her a hundred times a day. Rowley. Indeed. Sir Peter. Ay, and what is very extraordinary, in all our disputes, she is always in the wrong. But Lady Sneerwell and this set she meets at her house, encouraged the perverseness of her disposition. Then, to complete my vexations, Maria, my ward, whom I ought to have the power of a father over, is determined to turn rebel too, and absolutely refuses the man whom I have long resolved on her for a husband meaning, I suppose, to bestow herself on his profligate brother. Rowley. You know, Sir Peter, I have always taken the liberty to differ with you on the subject of those two young gentlemen. I only wish you may not be deceived in your opinion of the elder. For Charles, my life aunt, he will retrieve his errors yet. Their worthy father, once my honoured master, was at his years nearly as wild a spark. Sir Peter. You are wrong, Master Rowley. On their father's death you know I acted as a kind of guardian to them both, till their uncle Sir Oliver's eastern bounty gave them an early independence. Of course no person could have more opportunities of judging of their hearts, and I was never mistaken in my life. Joseph is indeed a model for the young man of the age. He is a man of sentiment, and acts up to the sentiments he professes. But for the other... Take my word for it, if he had any grain of virtue by descent, he has dissipated it with the rest of his inheritance. Ah, my old friend, Sir Oliver, will be deeply mortified when he finds how part of his bounty has been misapplied. Rowley, I am sorry to find you so violent against the young man, because this may be the most critical period of his fortune. I came hither with news that will surprise you. Sir Peter, what? Let me hear. Rowley. Sir Oliver is arrived, and at this moment in town. Sir Peter. How? You astonish me. I thought you did not expect him this month. Rowley. I did not, but his passage has been remarkably quick. Sir Peter. Egad, I shall rejoice to see my old friend. Tis sixteen years since we met. We have had many a day together, but does he still enjoin us not to inform his nephew of his arrival? Rowley. Most strictly, he means, before he makes it known to make some trial of their dispositions, and we have already planned something for the purpose. Sir Peter. Ah, there needs no art to discover their merits. However, he shall have his way. But pray, does he know I am married? Rowley. Yes, and will soon wish you joy. Sir Peter. <laughs> you may tell him tis too late. Ah, Oliver will laugh at me. We used to rail at matrimony together, but he has been steady to his text. Well, he must be at my house, though. I'll instantly give orders for his reception. But, Master Rowley, don't drop a word that Lady Teasel and I ever disagree. Rowley. By no means. Sir Peter. For I should never be able to stand Noel's jokes, so I'd have him think we are a very happy couple. Rowley. 
I understand you. But then you must be very careful not to differ while he's in the house with you. Sir Peter. Egad, so we must. That's impossible. Ah, Master Rowley, when an old bachelor meets a young wife he deserves. No, the crime carries the punishment along with it. End of A School for Scandal Who Goes with Fergus? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daniel W. James Joyce in Context, Volume 1. Telemachus. Who Goes with Fergus? By William Butler Yeats. Who will go drive with Fergus now, and pierce the deep wood's woven shade, and dance upon the level shore? Young man, lift up your russet brow, and lift your tender eyelids, maid, and brood on hopes, and fear no more. And no more turn aside and brood upon love's bitter mystery, for Fergus rules the brazen cause, and rules the shadows of the wood, and the white breast of the dim sea, and all disheveled wandering stars. End of Who Goes with Fergus by William Butler Yeats Recording by Daniel W. Numbers Chapter 5, Verses 11 through 31 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daniel W. James Joyce in Context, Volume 1. Telemachus. Numbers, Chapter 5, Verses 11 through 31. Douay Reims Translation. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and thou shalt say to them, The man whose wife shall have gone astray, and condemning her husband, shall have slept with another man, and her husband cannot discover it. But the adultery is secret, and cannot be proved by witnesses, because she was not found in the adultery. If the spirit of jealousy stir up the husband against his wife, who either is defiled or is charged with false suspicion, he shall bring her to the priest, and shall offer an oblation for her, the tenth part of a measure of barley meal. He shall not pour oil thereon, nor put frankincense upon it, because it is a sacrifice of jealousy, and an oblation searching out adultery. The priest therefore shall offer it, and set it before the Lord. And he shall take holy water in an earthen vessel, and he shall cast a little earth of the pavement of the tabernacle into it. And when the women shall stand before the Lord, he shall uncover her head, and shall put on her hands the sacrifice of remembrance, and the oblation of jealousy. And he himself shall hold the most bitter waters, whereon he hath heaped curses with execration. And he shall adjure her, and shall say, If another man hath not slept with thee, and if thou be not defiled by forsaking thy husband's bed, these most bitter waters on which I have heaped curses shall not hurt thee. But if thou hast gone aside from thy husband, and art defiled, and hast lain with another man, these curses shall light upon thee. The Lord make thee a curse, and an example for all among his people. May he make thy thigh to rot, and may thy belly swell and burst asunder. Let the cursed waters enter into thy belly, and may thy womb swell and thy thigh rot. And the women shall answer, Amen, Amen. And the priest shall write these curses in a book, and shall wash them out with the most bitter waters, upon which he hath heaped these curses, and he shall give them her to drink. And when she hath drunk them up, the priest shall take from her hand the sacrifice of jealousy, and shall elevate it before the Lord, and shall put it upon the altar. Yet so is first, to take a handful of the sacrifice of that which is offered, and burn it upon the altar, and so to give the most bitter waters to the woman to drink. And when she hath drunk them, if she be defiled, and having despised her husband, be guilty of adultery, the malediction shall go through her, and her belly swelling her thigh shall rot, and the woman shall be a curse and an example to all the people. But if she be not defiled, she shall not be hurt, and shall bear children. This is the law of jealousy. If a woman hath gone aside from her husband, and be defiled, and the husband stirred up by the spirit of jealousy bring her before the Lord, and the priest do to her according to all these things that are here written, the husband shall be blameless, and she shall bear her iniquity.
End of Numbers chapter 5, verses 11 through 31, Douay Reims translation. Recording by Daniel W. From the book of Genesis, chapter 19, verses 18 through 29. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Anderson. James Joyce in Context, Volume 1, Telemachus. From the book of Genesis, chapter 19, verses 18 through 29. From the Douay Reims Version. And the sons of Noah, who came out of the ark, were Sem, Cam, and Japheth. And Cam is the father of Canaan. These three are the sons of Noah, and from these were all mankind spread over the whole earth. And Noah, a husbandman, began to till the ground and planted a vineyard. And drinking of the wine was made drunk, and was uncovered in his tent. Which when Cam, the father of Canaan, had seen, to wit, that his father's nakedness was uncovered, he told it to his two brethren without. But Sem and Japheth put a cloak upon their shoulders, and going backwards covered the nakedness of their father, and their faces were turned away, and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah, awakening from the wine, when he had learned what his younger son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be under his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Sem, be Canaan his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Sem, and Canaan be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood three hundred and fifty years, and all his days were in the whole nine hundred and fifty years, and he died. End from the book of Genesis, chapter 19, verses 18 through 29, from the Douay Reims Version. Tis the Last Rose of Summer by Thomas Moore, sung to the traditional air The Groves of Blarney. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. James Joyce in Context, Volume 1, Telemachus. Tis the Last Rose of Summer, by Thomas Moore. Tis the last rose of summer, left blooming alone. All her lovely companions are faded and gone. No flower of her kindred, no rose bud is nigh to reflect back her blushes to give sigh for sigh I'll not leave thee thou lone one to pine on the stem since the love are sleeping, go sleep thou with them. Thus kindly I scatter thy leaves o'er the bed, where thy mates of the garden lie scentless and dead. So soon may I follow when 
friendships decay and from love's shining circle the gems drop away when true hearts lie withered and fond ones are flown oh, who would inhabit this bleak world alone end of tis the last rose of summer Ned Grogan, Irish Folk Song by an Unknown Author. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. James Joyce in Context, Volume 1, Telemachus. Ned Grogan, Author Unknown. Ned Grogan, dear Joy, was the son of his mother and as like her it seems as one pea to another but to find out his dad he was put to the rout as many folks wiser have been joy no doubt to this broth of a boy oft his mother would say when the moon shines my jewel be making your hay always ask my advice when the business is done for two heads sure you'll own are much better than one so neddy taking it into his pate to fetch a walk over to england stepped to ask the advice of his second head but by st patrick a drop of the creature had made her speechless and so being dead into the bargain all that he could get out of her was fillaloo bodderoo whack grama cree ned's mother being waked to england he came sir big with hopes of promotion of honour and fame sir where a snug berth he got, do you mind, by my soul, to be partner, dear Joy, with a knight of the pole. For Larry, to teach him his art, proving willing, soon taught him the changes to ring with a shilling, and that folks, when not sober, are easily won, which proves that two heads, Joy, are better than one. Och, to be sure, and they didn't carry on a roaring trade, till Larry, having the misfortune to take a drop too much at the old bailey, poor Grogan was once more left alone to sing, Fillilu, bodderu, whack, grammar cree. Left alone, sure, old Grogan set up for himself, got a partner, and twixt them got plenty of pelf. And because he was pleased with a bachelor's life, married Catty O'Doody, who made him her wife. For some time they played joy like kittens so frisky, till Catty O'Horn took to drinking of whisky, sold his sticks, and away with his partner did run, proving still that two heads are much better than one. Oh, bad luck to her, cried Grogan. To be sure I took her for better or worse, but since she's proved all worse and no better, faith, her loss makes me sing. Fillilu, bodderu, whack, grammar cree. End of Ned Grogan. The Oblation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Kristen Hughes. James Joyce in Context, Volume 1, Telemachus, The Oblation, by Algernon Charles Swinburne. Ask nothing more of me, sweet. All I can give you, I give, heart of my heart. Were it more, more would be laid at your feet. Love that should help you to live, song that should spur you to soar. All things were nothing to give, once to have sense of you more, touch you and taste of you sweet, 
think you and breathe you and live swept of your wings as they soar trodden by chance of your feet i that have love and no more give you but love of you sweet he that hath more let him give he that hath wings let him soar mine is the heart at your feet here that must love you to live End of the Oblation The Death of Nelson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Shalifa Malchem James Joyce in Context, Volume 1 Telemachus The Death of Nelson by S. J. Arnold O oh, Nelson's tomb, with silent grief oppressed, Britannia mourns her hero, now at rest. Those bright laurels now shall fade with years, Whose leaves are watered by a nation's tears. T'was in Trafalgar's bay we saw the Frenchman lay, Each heart was bounding then. We scorned the foreign yoke, For our ships were British oak, And hearts of oak our men. Our Nelson marked them on the wave, Three cheers our gallant seamen gave, Nor thought of home or beauty, Along the line this signal ran, England expects that every man This day will do his duty. And now the cannons roar Along the frightened shore, Our Nelson led the way, His ship the victory named, Long be that victory famed, For victory crowned the day, but dearly was that conquest bought, Too well the gallant hero fought, For England home and beauty. He cried as midst the fire he ran, England shall find that every man This day will do his duty. At last the fatal wound, Which spread dismay round, The hero's breast received. Heaven fights on our side, The day's our own, he cried, Now long enough I've lived, in honour's cause my life was passed, In honour's cause I fell at last, For England, home and beauty. Thus ending life as he began, England confessed that every man That day had done his duty. End of the Death of Nelson The Catholic Encyclopedia Via Dolorosa or The Way of the Cross this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daniel W. James Joyce in Context, Volume 1. Telemachus. The Catholic Encyclopedia, Via Dolorosa, or The Way of the Cross. The Way of the Cross, also called Stations of the Cross, Via Crucis, and Via Dolorosa. These names are used to signify either a series of pictures or tableau representing certain scenes in the Passion of the Christ, each corresponding to a particular incident or the special form of devotion connected with such representations. Taken in the former sense, the stations may be of stone, wood, or metal, sculptured or carved, or they may be merely paintings or engravings. Some stations are valuable works of art, as those, for instance, in Antwerp Cathedral, which have been much copied elsewhere. They are usually ranged at intervals around the walls of a church, although sometimes they are to be found in the open air, especially on roads leading to a church or shrine. In monasteries they are often placed in the cloisters. The erection and use of the stations did not become at all general before the end of the seventeenth century, but they are now to be found in almost every church. Formerly their number varied considerably in different places, but fourteen are now prescribed by authority. They are as follows. Number 1. Christ is condemned to death. Number 2. The cross is laid upon him. Number 3. His first fall. Number 4. He meets his blessed mother. Number 5. Simon of Cyrene is made to bear the cross. Number 6. Christ's face is wiped by Veronica. Number 7. His second fall. Number 8. He meets the women of Jerusalem. Number 9. His third fall. Number 10. He is stripped of his garments. Number 11, his crucifixion. Number 12, his death on the cross. 
number 13, his body is taken down from the cross, and number 14, laid in the tomb. The object of the stations is to help the faithful to make in spirit, as it were, a pilgrimage to the chief scenes of Christ's sufferings and death, and this has become one of the most popular of Catholic devotions. It is carried out by passing from station to station, with certain prayers at each and devout meditation on the various incidents in turn. It is very usual, when the devotion is performed publicly, to sing a stanza of the Stabat Mater while passing from one station to the next. Insomuch as the way of the cross, made in this way, constitutes a miniature pilgrimage to the holy places at Jerusalem, the origin of the devotion may be traced to the Holy Land. The Via Dolorosa at Jerusalem, though not called by that name before the 16th century, was reverently marked out from the earliest times, and has been the goal of pious pilgrims ever since the days of Constantine. Tradition asserts that the Blessed Virgin used to visit daily the scenes of Christ's Passion, and St. Jerome speaks of crowds of pilgrims from all countries who used to visit the holy places in his day. There is, however, no direct evidence as to the existence of any set form of the devotion at that early date, and it is noteworthy that St. Sylvia, around 380, says nothing about it in her Peregrinatio ad loca sancta, although she describes minutely every other religious exercise that she saw practiced there. A desire to reproduce the holy places in other lands, in order to satisfy the devotion of those who were hindered from making the actual pilgrimage, seems to have manifested itself at quite an early date. At the monastery of San Stefano at Bologna, a group of connected chapels were constructed as early as the 5th century by St. Petronius, bishop of Bologna, which were intended to represent the more important shrines of Jerusalem, and in consequence this monastery became familiarly known as Jerusalem. These may perhaps be regarded as the germ from which the stations afterward developed, although it is tolerably certain that nothing we, that we have before about the 15th century can strictly be called a way of the cross in the modern sense. Several travelers, it is true, who visited the Holy Land during the 12th, 13th, and 14th centuries mention a Via Sacra, that is, a settled route along which pilgrims were conducted, but there is nothing in their accounts to identify this with the Via Crucis, as we understand it, including special stopping places with indulgences attached, and such indulgence stations must, after all, be considered to be the true origin of the devotion as now practiced. It cannot be said with any certainty when such indulgences began to be granted, but most probably they may be due to the Franciscans, to whom, in 1342, the guardianship of the holy places was entrusted. Ferraris mentions the following as stations to which indulgences were, were attached. The place where Christ met his blessed mother, where he spoke to the women of Jerusalem, where he met Simon of Cyrene, where the soldiers cast lots for his garment, where he was nailed to the cross, Pilate's house, and the Holy Sepulchre. Analogous to this, it may be mentioned that in 1520, Leo X granted an indulgence of a hundred days to each of a set of sculptured stations, representing the seven dolors of Our Lady, in the cemetery of the Franciscan Friary at Antwerp, the devotion connected with them being a very popular one. The earliest use of the word stations, as applied to the accustomed halting places in the Via Sacra at Jerusalem, occurs in the narrative of an English pilgrim, William Way, who visited the Holy Land in 1458 and again in 1462, and who describes the manner in which it was then usual to follow the footsteps of Christ in his sorrowful journey. It seems that up to that time it had been the general practice to commence at Mount Calvary, and proceeding thence in the opposite direction of Christ to work back to Pilate's house. By the early part of the 16th century, however, the more reasonable way of traversing the route, by beginning at Pilate's house and ending at Mount Calvary, had become to be regarded as more correct, and it became a special exercise of devotion complete in itself. During the 15th and 16th centuries, several reproductions of the holy places were set up in different parts of Europe. The Blessed Alvarez, death 1420, on his return from the Holy Land, built a series of little chapels at the Dominican Friary of Cordova, in which, after the pattern of separate stations, were painted the principal scenes of the Passion. About the same time, the Blessed Eustochia, a poor Clare, constructed a similar set of stations in her convent at Messina. Others that may be enumerated with those, were those at Gorlitz, erected by George Emmerich about 1465, and at Nuremberg by Ketzel in 1468. 
Imitations of these were made by Louvain in 1505 by Peter Stex, at St. Gertrude at Bamberg in 1507, at Fribourg and at Rhodes about the same date, the two latter being in the commanderies of the Knights of Rhodes. Those at Nuremberg, which were carved by Adam Kraft, as well as some of the others, consisted of seven stations, popularly known as the Seven Falls, because in each of them Christ was represented as either actually prostrate or as sinking under the weight of his cross. A famous set of stations was set up in 1515 by Romane Bouffin at Romans in Dauphin, in imitation of those at Fribourg, and a similar set was erected in 1491 at Varallo by the Franciscans there, whose guardian, Blessed Bernardino Caimi, had been custodian in the holy places. In several of these early examples, an attempt was made not merely to duplicate the most hallowed spots of the original Via Dolorosa at Jerusalem, but also to reproduce the exact intervals between them, measured in paces, so that devout people might cover precisely the same distances as they would have done if they had made the pilgrimage to the Holy Land itself. Bofan and some of the others visited Jerusalem for the express purpose of obtaining the exact measurements, but unfortunately, though each claimed to be correct, there is an extraordinary divergence between some of them. With regard to the number of stations, it is not at all easy to determine how this came to be fixed at fourteen, for it seems to have varied considerably at different times and places, and, naturally, with varying numbers the incidents of the Passion commemorated also varied greatly. Way's account, written in the middle of the fifteenth century, gives fourteen, but only five of those correspond with ours, and of the others, seven are only remotely connected with our Via Crucis, the House of Dives, the city gate through which Christ passed, the probatic pool, the Ecce Homo Arch, the Blessed Virgin School, and the houses of Herod and Simon the Pharisee. When Romane Bofan visited Jerusalem in 1515 for the purpose of obtaining correct details for a set of stations at Romans, two friars there told him that there ought to be 31 in all, but in the manuals of devotion subsequently issued for the use of those visiting the stations, they are given variously at 19, 25, and 37. So it seems that even in the same place the number was not determined very definitely. A book entitled Jerusalem Sicut Christi Tempore Floruit, written by one Andracomius and published in 1584, gives twelve stations which correspond exactly with the first twelve of ours. And this fact is thought by some to point conclusively to the origin of the particular selection afterward authorized by the church, especially as this book had a wide circulation and was translated into several European languages. Whether this is so or not, we cannot say for certain. At any rate, during the 16th century, a number of devotional manuals giving prayers for use when making the stations were published in the Low Countries, and some of our 14 appear in them for the first time. But whilst this was being done in Europe for the benefit of those who could not visit the Holy Land and yet could reach Louvain, Nuremberg, Romans, or one of the other reproductions of the Via Dolorosa, it appears doubtful whether, even up to the end of the 16th century, there was any settled form of the devotion performed publicly in Jerusalem. For Zualardo, who wrote a book on the subject, published in Rome in 1587, although he gives a full series of prayers, etc., for the shrines within the Holy Sepulchre, which were under the care of the Franciscans, provides none for the stations themselves. He explains the reason thus. It is not permitted to make any halt, nor to pay veneration to them with uncovered head, nor to make any other demonstration. From this it would seem that after Jerusalem had passed under the Turkish domination, the pious exercises of the way of the cross could be performed far more devoutly at Nuremberg or Louvain than in Jerusalem itself. It may therefore be conjectured, with extreme probability, that our present series of stations, together with the accustomed series of prayers for them, comes to us not from Jerusalem, but from some of the imitation ways of the cross in different parts of Europe, and that we owe the propagation of the devotion, as well as the number and selection of our stations, much more to the pious ingenuity of certain 16th century devotional writers than to the actual practice of pilgrims to the holy places. With regard to the particular subjects which have been retained in our series of stations, it may be noted that very few of the medieval accounts make any account of either the second, Christ receiving the cross, or the tenth, Christ being stripped of his garments, whilst others, which have since dropped out, appear in almost all of the early lists. One of the most frequent of these is the station formerly made at the remains of the Ecce Homo Arch, that is, the balcony from which these words were pronounced. 
Additions and omissions such as these seem to confirm the supposition that our stations were derived from pious manuals of devotion rather than from Jerusalem itself. The three falls of Christ, the third, seventh, and ninth stations, are apparently all that remain of the seven falls, as depicted by Kraft at Nuremberg and his imitators, in all of which Christ was represented as either falling or actually fallen. In explanations of this, it is supposed that the other four falls coincided with his meetings of his mother, Simon Cyrene, Veronica, and the women of Jerusalem, and that in these four the mention of the fall has dropped out, whilst it survives in the other three, which have nothing else to distinguish them. A few medieval writers have taken the meeting with Simon and the women of Jerusalem to have been simultaneous, but the majority represent them as separate events. The Veronica incident does not incur in many of the earlier accounts, whilst almost all of those that do mention it place it as having happened just before reaching Mount Calvary, instead of earlier in the journey as in our present arrangement. An interesting variation is found in the special set of eleven stations ordered in 1799 for the use in the Diocese of Vienne. It is as follows. The Agony in the Garden, the Betrayal by Judas, the Scourging, the Crowning with Thorns, Christ Condemned to Death, He Meets Simon of Cyrene, the Women of Jerusalem, He Tastes the Gall, He is Nailed to the Cross, His Death on the Cross, and his body is taken down from the cross. It will be noticed that only five of these correspond exactly with our stations. The others, though comprising the chief events of the Passion, are not strictly incidents of the Via Dolorosa itself. Another variation that occurs in different churches relates to the side of the church on which the stations begin. The Gospel side is perhaps the more usual. In reply to a question the Sacred Congregation of Indulgences in 1837, said that, although nothing was ordered on this point, beginning on the gospel side seemed to be the more appropriate. In deciding the matter, however, the arrangement and form of a church may make it more convenient to go the other way. The position of figures in the tableau, too, may sometimes determine the direction of the route, for it seems more in accordance with the spirit of the devotion that the procession, in passing from station to station, should follow Christ rather than meet him. The erection of the stations in churches did not become at all common until towards the end of the 17th century, and the popularity of the practice seems to have been chiefly due to the indulgences attached. The custom originated with the Franciscans, but its special connection with that order has now disappeared. It has already been said that numerous indulgences were formerly attached to the holy places at Jerusalem. Realizing that few persons, comparatively, were able to gain these by means of a personal pilgrimage to the Holy Land, Innocent XI, in 1686, granted to the Franciscans, in answer to their petition, the right to erect the stations in all their churches, and declared that all the indulgences that had ever been given for devoutly visiting the actual scenes of Christ's Passion could thenceforth be gained by the Franciscans and all others affiliated to their order if they made the way of the cross in their own churches in the accustomed manner. Innocent XII confirmed the privilege in 1694, and Benedict the Thirteenth in 1726 extended it to all the faithful. In 1731, Clement the Twelfth still further extended it by permitting the indulgence stations to all churches, provided that they were erected by a Franciscan father with the sanction of the ordinary. At the same time, he definitely fixed the number of stations at fourteen. Benedict the Fourteenth in 1742 exhorted all priests to enrich their churches with so great a treasure, and there are few churches now without the stations. In 1857, the bishops of England received faculties from the Holy See to erect stations themselves with the indulgences attached, wherever there were no Franciscans available, and in 1862 this last restriction was removed, and the bishops were empowered to erect the stations themselves, either personally or by delegate, anywhere within their jurisdiction. These faculties are quinquennial, there is some uncertainty as to what are the precise indulgences belonging to the stations. It is agreed that all that have ever been granted to the faithful for visiting the holy places in person can now be gained by making the Via Crucis in any church where the stations have been erected in due form. But the instructions of the sacred congregation, approved by Clement XII in 1731, prohibit priests and others from specifying what or how many indulgences may be gained. In 1773, Clement XIV attached the same indulgence, under certain conditions, to crucifixes duly blessed for the purpose, for the use of the sick, those at sea or in prison, and others lawfully hindered from making the stations in a church. 
The conditions are that, while holding the crucifix in their hands, they must say the Pater and Ave fourteen times, and then the Pater, Ave, and Gloria five times, and the same again once each for the Pope's intentions. If one person hold the crucifix, a number present may gain all the indulgences provided that the other conditions are fulfilled. Such crucifixes cannot be sold, lent, or given away without losing the indulgence. The following are the principal regulations universally in force at the present time with regard to the stations. If a pastor or a superior of a convent, hospital, etc., wishes to have the stations erected in their places, he must ask permission of the bishop. If there are Franciscan fathers in the same town or city, their superior must be asked to bless the stations or delegate some priest either of his own monastery or a secular priest. If there are no Franciscan fathers in that place, the bishops who have obtained from the Holy See the extraordinary of form C can delegate any priest to erect the stations. This delegation of a certain priest for the blessing of the stations must necessarily be done in writing. The pastor of such a church, or the superior of such a hospital convent, etc., should take care to sign the document the bishop or the superior of the monastery sends, so that he may thereby express his consent to have the stations erected in their place, for the bishops and the respective pastors or superior's consent must be had before the stations are blessed, otherwise the blessing is null and void. Pictures or tableaux of the various stations are not necessary. It is to the cross placed over them that the indulgence is attached. These crosses must be of wood. No other material will do. If only painted on the wall, the erection is null. If, for restoring the church, for pacing them in a more convenient position, or for any other reasonable cause, the, the crosses are moved, this may be done without the indulgence being lost. If any of the crosses, for some reason, have to be replaced, no fresh pressing is required, unless more than half of them are so replaced. There should, if possible, be a separate meditation on each of the fourteen incidents of the Via Crucis, not a general meditation on the Passion, nor on other incidents not included in the stations. No particular prayers are ordered. The distance required between the stations is not defined. Even when only the clergy move from one station to another, the faithful can still gain the indulgence without moving. It is necessary to make all the stations uninterruptedly. Hearing Mass or going to confession or communion with between stations is not considered an interruption. According to many, the stations may be made more than once on the same day, and the indulgence may be gained each time, but this is by no means certain. Confession and communion on the day of making the stations are not necessary, provided the person making them is in a state of grace. Ordinarily, the stations should be erected within a church or public oratory. If the Via Crucis goes outside, that is, in a cemetery or cloister, it should, if possible, begin and end in the church. In conclusion, it may be safely asserted that there is no devotion more richly endowed, endowed with indulgences than the way of the cross, and none which enables us, more literally, to obey Christ's injunction to take up our cross and follow him. A perusal of the prayers usually given for this devotion in any manual will show what abundant spiritual graces, apart from the indulgences, may be obtained through a right use of them, and the fact that the stations may be made, either publicly or privately, in any church, renders the devotion especially suitable for all. One of the most popularly attended ways of the cross at the present day is that in the Colosseum at Rome, where every Friday the devotion of the stations is conducted publicly by a Franciscan friar. End of the Catholic Encyclopedia, Via Dolorosa, The Way of the Cross. Recording by Daniel W. Song of Myself, Section 51. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Davis Drake. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Alan Davis Drake. Song of Myself, Section 51, by Walt Whitman. The Past and Present Wilt. I have filled them, emptied them, and proceed to fill my next fold of the future. Listener up there, what have you to confide to me? Look in my face while I snuff the sidle of evening. Talk honestly. No one hears you. I stay 
only a minute longer. Do I contradict myself? Very well, then, I contradict myself. I am large, I contain multitudes. I concentrate towards them that are nigh. I wait on the door slab. Who has done his day's work? Who will soonest be through with his supper? Who wishes to walk with me? Will you speak before I am gone? Will you prove already too late? End of Song of Myself, Section 51Matthew 26 and 27, Dewey Reams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tricia G. James Joyce in Context, Volume 1, Telemachus. Matthew, Chapters 26 and 27. Chapter 26. And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended all these words, he said to his disciples, You know that after two days shall be the pash, and the Son of Man shall be delivered up to be crucified. Then were gathered together the chief priests and ancients of the people into the court of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas. And they consulted together that by subtlety they might apprehend Jesus and put him to death. But they said, Not on the festival day, lest perhaps there should be a tumult among the people. And when Jesus was in Bethania, in the house of Simon the leper, there came to him a woman having an alabaster box of precious ointment, and poured it on his head as he was at table. And the disciples, seeing it, had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? For this might have been sold for much and given to the poor. And Jesus, knowing it, said to them, why do you trouble this woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. For the poor you have always with you, but me you have not always. For she, in pouring this ointment on my body, hath done it for my burial. Amen, I say to you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, that also which she hath done shall be told for a memory of her. Then went one of the twelve, who was called Judas Iscariot, to the chief priests, and said to them, What will you give me, and I will deliver him unto you? But they appointed him thirty pieces of silver, and from thenceforth he sought opportunity to betray him. And on the first day of the Azimes the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the pash? But Jesus said, Go ye into the city to a certain man, and say to him, The master saith, My time is near at hand. With thee I make the pash with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus appointed to them, and they prepared the pash. But when it was evening, he sat down with his twelve disciples. And whilst they were eating, he said, Amen, I say to you, that one of you is about to betray me. And they, being very much troubled, began every one to say, Is it I, Lord? But he answering said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, he shall betray me. The Son of Man indeed goeth, as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man shall be betrayed. It were better for him if that man had not been born. And Judas that betrayed him answering said, Is it I, Rabbi? he saith to him, Thou hast said it. And whilst they were at supper, Jesus took bread, and blessed, and broke, and gave to his disciples, and said, Take ye, and eat, this is my body. And taking the chalice, he gave thanks, and gave to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which shall be shed for many unto remission of sins. And I say to you, I will not drink from henceforth of this fruit of the vine, until that day when I shall drink it with you new in the kingdom of my father. And a hymn being said, they went out unto Mount Olivet. Then Jesus saith to them, All you shall be scandalized in me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be dispersed. But after I shall be risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. And Peter answering said to him, 
although all shall be scandalized in thee, I will never be scandalized. Jesus said to him, Amen, I say to thee, that in this night before the cock crow, thou wilt deny me thrice. Peter saith to him, Yea, though I should die with thee, I will not deny thee. And in like manner said all the disciples. Then Jesus came with them into a country place, which is called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit you here till I go yonder and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to grow sorrowful and to be sad. Then he saith to them, My soul is sorrowful even unto death. Stay you here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell upon his face, praying and saying, My father, if it be possible, let this chalice pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh to his disciples, and findeth them asleep. And he saith to Peter, What, could you not watch one hour with me? Watch ye, and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again the second time he went and prayed, saying, My father, if this chalice may not pass away, but I must drink it, thy will be done. And he cometh again, and findeth them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And leaving them, he went again, and he prayed the third time, saying the selfsame word. Then he cometh to his disciples, and said to them, Sleep ye now, and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Behold, he is at hand that will betray me. As he yet spoke, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the ancients of the people. And he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that is he, hold him fast. And forthwith, coming to Jesus, he said, Hail, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And Jesus said to him, Friend, whereto art thou come? Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and held him. And behold, one of them that were with Jesus, stretching forth his hand, drew out his sword, and striking the servant of the high priest, cut off his ear. Then Jesus saith to him, Put up again thy sword into its place, for all that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot ask my father, and he will give me presently more than twelve legions of angels? How then shall the scriptures be fulfilled, that so it must be done? In that same hour Jesus said to the multitudes, You are come out, as it were, to a robber, with swords and clubs to apprehend me. I sat daily with you, teaching in the temple, and you laid not hands on me. Now all this was done, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then the disciples, all leaving him, fled. But they holding Jesus led him to Caiaphas the high priest, where the scribes and the ancients were assembled. And Peter followed him afar off, even to the court of the high priest, and going in, he sat with the servants that he might see the end. And the chief priests and the whole council sought false witness against Jesus, that they might put him to death. And they found not, whereas many false witnesses had come in. And last of all there came two false witnesses, and they said, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God, and after three days to rebuild it. And the high priest rising up said to him, Answerest thou nothing to the things which these witness against thee? But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest said to him, I adjure thee by the living God, that thou tell us if thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus saith to him, Thou hast said it, nevertheless I say to you, Hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the power of God, and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his garments, saying, He hath blasphemed, what further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now you have heard the blasphemy. What think you? But they answering said, He is guilty of death. Then did they spit in his face, and buffeted him and others struck his face with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy unto us, O Christ, who is he that struck thee? But Peter sat without in the court, and there came to him a servant-maid, saying, 
thou also wast with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. And as he went out of the gate, another maid saw him, and she saith to them that were there, This man also was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath, I know not the man. And after a little while they came that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou also art one of them, for even thy speech doth discover thee. Then he began to curse and to swear that he knew not the man, and immediately the cock crew. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which he had said, Before the cock crow thou wilt deny me thrice. And going forth he wept bitterly. Chapter 27 And when morning was come, all the chief priests and the agents of the people took counsel against Jesus, that they might put him to death. And they brought him bound, and delivered him to Pontius Pilate the governor. Then Judas, who betrayed him, seeing that he was condemned, repenting himself, brought back the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and ancients, saying, I have sinned in betraying innocent blood. But they said, What is that to us? Look thou to it. And casting down the pieces of silver in the temple, he departed and went and hanged himself with an halter. But the chief priests, having taken the pieces of silver, said, It is not lawful to put them in the corbona, because it is the price of blood. And after they had consulted together, they bought with them the potter's field to be a burying place for strangers. For this cause that field was called Hasseldama, that is, the field of blood, even to this day. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, and they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was prized, whom they prized of the children of Israel, and they gave him unto the potter's field, as the Lord appointed to me. And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus saith to him, Thou sayest it. And when he was accused by the chief priests and ancients, he answered nothing. Then Pilate saith to him, Dost not thou hear how great testimonies they allege against thee? And he answered him to never a word, so that the governor wondered exceedingly. Now upon the solemn day the governor was accustomed to release to the people one prisoner whom they would. And he had then a notorious prisoner that was called Barabbas. They therefore being gathered together, Pilate said, Whom will you that I release to you? Barabbas, or Jesus, that is called Christ. For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. And as he was sitting in the place of judgment, his wife sent to him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and ancients persuaded the people that they should ask Barabbas, and make Jesus away. And the governor answering said to them, whether will you of the two to be released unto you? But they said, Barabbas. Pilate saith to them, What shall I do then with Jesus that is called Christ? They say all, Let him be crucified. The governor said to them, Why, what evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. And Pilate, seeing that he prevailed nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, taking water, washed his hands before the people, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just man, look you to it. And the whole people answering said, His blood be upon us and upon our children. Then he released to them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him unto them to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor, taking Jesus into the hall, gathered together unto him the whole band and stripping him, they put a scarlet cloak about him, and plaiting a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head, and a reed in his right hand, and bowing the knee before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And spitting upon him, they took the reed and struck his head, and after they had mocked him, they took off the cloak from him, and put on him his own garments, and led him away to crucify him. And going out, they found a man of Cyrene, named Simon. Him they forced to take up his cross. 
and they came to the place that is called Golgotha, which is the place of Calvary. And they gave him wine to drink, mingled with gall. And when he had tasted, he would not drink. And after they had crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, They divided my garments among them, and upon my vesture they cast lots. And they sat and watched him. And they put over his head his cause written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were crucified with him two thieves, one on the right hand and one on the left. And they that passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Bah, thou that destroyest the temple of God and in three days dost rebuild it, save thy own self. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. In like manner also the chief priests, with the scribes and ancients, mocking, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him now deliver him, if he will save him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the selfsame things the thieves also that were crucified with him reproached him with. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over the whole earth until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? That is, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some that stood there and heard said, This man calleth Elias. And immediately one of them running took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. And the others said, Let be, let us see whether Elias will come to deliver him. And Jesus again crying with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in two, from top even to the bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints that had slept arose, and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, came into the holy city, and appeared to many. Now the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus, having seen the earthquake and the things that were done, were sore afraid, saying, Indeed, this was the Son of God. And there were there many women afar off, who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him, among whom was Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. And when it was evening, there came a certain rich man of Arimathea, named Joseph, who also himself was the disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded that the body should be delivered. And Joseph, taking the body, wrapped it up in a clean linen cloth, and laid it in his own new monument, which he had hewed out in a rock. And he rolled the great stone to the door of the monument and went his way. And there was there Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, sitting over against the sepulchre. And the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees came together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we have remembered that that seducer said, while he was yet alive, After three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, the sepulchre to be guarded until the third day lest perhaps his disciples come and steal him away and say to the people, He is risen from the dead, and the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate saith to them, You have a guard, go, guard it as you know. And they departing made the sepulchre sure, sealing the stone and setting guards. End of Matthew 26 and 27 Dewey Reams The Nicene Creed, English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Cheng. James Joyce in Context, Volume 1, Telemachus, The Nicene Creed, English. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, 
God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And we believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. End of the Nicene Creed, English. The Nicene Creed, Latin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Cheng. James Joyce in Context, Volume 1. Telemachus. The Nicene Creed, Latin. Credo in unum Deum Patrem Omnipotentem, Factorum Celi et Terre, Visibilium omnium et invisibilium, et in unum dominum Jesum Christum, filium Dei unigenitum, et ex patre natum ante omnia secula, Deum de Deo, lumen de lumine, Deum verum de Deo vero, genitum non factum, consubstantialem patri, per quem omnia facta sunt, qui propter no somines et propter nostram salutem descendit de celis et incarnatus est de spiritu sancto ex maria vergine et homo factus est crucifixus etiam pro nobis sub pontio pilato passus et sepultus est et resurrexit tertia die secundum scripturas et ascendit in celum, sedet ad dexteram patris, et iterum venturus est, cum gloria, judicare vivos et mortuos, cuius regni non erit finis, et in spiritum sanctum dominum et vivificantem, qui ex patre filioque procedit, qui cum patre et filio simul adorato et conglorificato, qui locutus est per profetas et unam sanctam catholicam et apostolicam ecclesiam, confiteo unum baptisma in remissionem peccatorum, et expecto resurrectionem mortuorum, et vitam venturi seculi. Amen. End of the Nicene Creed, Latin. Paradise by Dante Alighieri Canto 17. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen. James Joyce in Context, Volume 1, Telemachus. Paradise by Dante Alighieri. Canto 17. As came to Climene to be made certain of that which he had heard against himself, he who makes fathers chary still to children, even such was I, and such was I perceived by Beatrice and by the holy light that first on my account had changed its place. Therefore my lady said to me, Send forth the flame of thy desire, so that it issue imprinted well with the internal stamp. Not that our knowledge may be greater made by speech of thine, but to accustom thee to tell thy thirst, that we may give thee drink. O my beloved tree, that so dost lift thee, 
that even as minds terrestrial perceive no triangle containeth too obtuse, so thou beholdest the contingent things, ere in themselves they are, fixing thine eyes upon the point in which all times are present. While I was with Virgilius conjoined upon the mountain that the souls doth heal, and when descending into the dead world, were spoken to me of my future life some grievous words, although I feel myself in sooth four square against the blows of chance. On this account my wish would be content to hear what fortune is approaching me, because foreseen an arrow comes more slowly. Thus did I say unto that self-same light that unto me had spoken before, and even as Beatrice willed, was my own will confessed. Not in vague phrase in which the foolish folk ensnared themselves of old, ere yet was slain the Lamb of God who taketh sins away, but with clear words and unambiguous language responded that paternal love, hid and revealed by its own proper smile. Contingency, that outside of the volume of your materiality extends not, is all depicted in the eternal aspect. Necessity, however, thence it takes not, except as from the eye in which it is mirrored, a ship that with the current down descends. From thence, e'en as there cometh to the ear sweet harmony from an organ, comes in sight to me the time that is preparing for thee. As forth from Athens went Hippolytus, by reason of his stepdame false and cruel, so thou from Florence must perforce depart. Already this is willed, and this is sought for, and soon it shall be done by him who thinks it, where every day the Christ is bought and sold. The blame shall follow the offended party in outcry, as is usual, but the vengeance shall witness to the truth that doth dispense it. Thou shalt abandon everything beloved most tenderly, and this the arrow is which first the bow of banishment shoots forth. Thou shalt have proof how savoureth of salt the bread of others, and how hard a road the going down and up another stairs, and that which most shall weigh upon thy shoulders will be the bad and foolish company with which into this valley thou shalt fall. For all ingrate, all mad and impious will they become against thee, but soon after they, and not thou, shall have the forehead scarlet. Of their bestiality their own proceedings shall furnish proof. So twill be well for thee a party to have made thee by thyself. Thine earliest refuge and thine earliest inn shall be the mighty Lombard's courtesy, who on the ladder bears the holy bird who such benign regard shall have for thee, that twixt you twain, in doing and in asking, that shall be first, which is the other's last. With him shalt thou see one who at his birth has by this star of strength been so impressed that notable shall his achievements be. Not yet the people are aware of him through his young age, since only nine years yet around about him have these wheels revolved. But ere the Gascon cheat the noble Henry, some sparkles of his virtue shall appear, in caring not for silver nor for toil. So recognized shall his magnificence become hereafter, that his enemies will not have power to keep mute tongues about it. On him rely, and on his benefits. By him shall many people be transformed, changing condition, rich and mendicant. And written in thy mind thou hence shalt bear of him, but shalt not say it. And things said he incredible to those who shall be present. Then added, Son, these are the commentaries on what was said to thee. Behold the snares that are concealed behind few revolutions. Yet would I not thy neighbours thou shouldst envy, because thy life into the future reaches beyond the punishment of their perfidies. When by its silence showed that sainted soul that it had finished putting in the woof into that web which I had given it warped, began I, 
even as he who yearneth after being in doubt some counsel from a person who seeth and uprightly wills and loves well see i father mine how spurreth on the time towards me such a blow to deal me as heaviest is to him who most gives way therefore with foresight it is well i arm me that if the dearest place be taken from me i may not lose the others by my songs down through the world of infinite bitterness and o'er the mountain from whose beauteous summit the eyes of my own lady lifted me and afterward through heaven from light to light i have learned that which if i tell again will be a savour of strong herbs to many and if i am a timid friend to truth i fear lest i may lose my life with those who will hereafter call this time the olden the light in which was smiling my own treasure which there i had discovered flashed at first as in the sunshine doth a golden mirror then made reply a conscience overcast or with its own or with another's shame will taste forsooth the tartness of thy word but ne'ertheless all falsehood laid aside make manifest thy vision utterly and let them scratch wherever is the itch for if thine utterance shall offensive be at the first taste a vital nutriment to leave thereafter when it is digested this cry of thine shall do as doth the wind which smiteth most the most exalted summits and that is no slight argument of honour therefore are shown to thee within these wheels upon the mount and in the dolorous valley only the souls that unto fame are known because the spirit of the hearer rests not nor doth confirm its faith by an example which has the root of it unknown and hidden or other reason that is not apparent end of canto 17 of paradise by dante alighieri recording by martin giessen in hazelmere surrey purgatory by dante alighieri canto 27 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen. James Joyce in Context, Volume 1, Telemachus. Purgatory by Dante Alighieri, Canto 27. Translated by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. As when he vibrates forth his earliest rays In regions where his maker shed his blood, The Ebro falling under lofty Libra, And waters in the Ganges burnt with noon, So stood the sun. Hence was the day departing When the glad angel of God appeared to us. Outside the flame he stood upon the verge, And chanted forth, Beati mundo corde, In voice by far more living than our own. Then no one farther goes, soul sanctified, If first the fire bite not, Within it enter, and be not deaf unto the song beyond. When we were close beside him, thus he said, Wherefore e'en such became I when I heard him, As he is who is put into the grave. Upon my clasped hands I straightened me, Scanning the fire, and vividly recalling the human bodies I had once seen burned. Towards me turned themselves my good conductors, and unto me Virgilius said, My son, here may indeed be torment, but not death. Remember thee, remember, and if I on Gerion have safely guided thee, what shall I do now I am nearer God? Believe for certain, shouldst thou stand a full millennium in the bosom of this flame, it could not make thee bald a single hair. And if perchance thou think that I deceive thee, draw near to it and put it to the proof, with thine own hands upon thy garment's hem. Now lay aside, now lay aside all fear, turn hitherward, and onward come securely. And I still motionless and against my conscience, Seeing me stand still motionless and stubborn, 
somewhat disturbed, he said, Now look thou, son, twixt Beatrice and thee there is this wall. As at the name of Thisbe oped his lids the dying Pyramus, and gazed upon her, what time the mulberry became vermilion, even thus, my obduracy being softened, I turned to my wise guide, hearing the name that in my memory evermore is welling. Whereat he wagged his head, and said, How now? Shall we stay on this side? Then smiled as one does at a child who's vanquished by an apple. Then into the fire in front of me he entered, beseeching Statius to come after me, who a long way before divided us. When I was in it, into molten glass I would have cast me to refresh myself, so without measure was the burning there. And my sweet father, to encourage me, discoursing still of Beatrice, went on, saying, Her eyes I seem to see already. A voice that on the other side was singing directed us, and we, attent alone on that, came forth where the ascent began. Venite benedicti patris mei, sounded within a splendour which was there such it all came me and i could not look the sun departs it added and night cometh tarry ye not but onward urge your steps so long as yet the west becomes not dark straight forward through the rock the path ascended in such a way that i cut off the rays before me of the sun that now was low and a few stairs we yet had made a say Ere by the vanished shadow the sun setting behind us we perceived, I and my sages. And ere in all its parts immeasurable the horizon of one aspect had become, And night her boundless dispensation held, Each of us of a stair had made his bed, Because the nature of the mount took from us the power of climbing more than the delight. Even as in ruminating, passive grow the goats who have been swift and venturesome upon the mountain tops ere they were fed, hushed in the shadow while the sun is hot, watched by the herdsman, who upon his staff is leaning, and in leaning tendeth them, and as the shepherd, lodging out of doors, passes the night beside his quiet flock, watching that no wild beast may scatter it, such at that hour were we, all three of us, I like the goat, and like the herdsmen they, begirt on this side and on that by rocks. Little could there be seen of things without, but through that little I beheld the stars more luminous and larger than their wont. Thus ruminating and beholding these, sleep seized upon me, sleep that oftentimes before a deed is done has tidings of it, it was the hour, I think, when from the east, first on the mountains, Cytherea beamed, who with the fire of love seems always burning. Youthful and beautiful, in dreams methought I saw a lady walking in a meadow, gathering flowers, and singing she was saying, No, whosoever may my name demand that I am Leah, and go moving round my beauteous hands to make myself a garland. To please me at the mirror, here I deck me, but never does my sister Rachel leave her looking-glass, and sitteth all day long, to see her beauteous eyes as eager as she as I am to adorn me with my hands, her seeing and me doing satisfies. And now before the Antilucan splendours that unto pilgrims the more grateful rise, as home returning less remote they lodge, the darkness fled away on every side, and slumber with it, whereupon I rose, seeing already the great masters risen. That apple sweet, which through so many branches the care of mortals goeth in pursuit of, to-day shall put in peace thy hungerings. Speaking to me, Virgilius, of such words as these made use, and never were there guerdons that could in pleasantness compare with these. Such longing upon longing came upon me to be above, that at each step thereafter, for flight I felt in me the pinions growing. When underneath us was the stairway all run o'er, and we were on the highest step, Virgilius fastened upon me his eyes, and said, The temporal fire and the eternal, son, thou hast seen, and to a place art come whereof myself no farther I discern. By intellect and art I here have brought thee. 
Take thine own pleasure for thy guide henceforth. Beyond the steep ways and the narrow art thou. Behold the sun that shines upon thy forehead. Behold the grass, the flowerets, and the shrubs which of itself alone this land produces. Until rejoicing come the beauteous eyes which weeping caused me to come unto thee, thou canst sit down, and thou canst walk among them. Expect no more or word or sign from me. Free and upright and sound is thy free will, and error were it not to do its bidding. Thee or thyself I therefore crown and mitre. End of Purgatory by Dante Alighieri Canto 27 Recording by Martin Giesen in Hazelmere, Surrey The Apostles' Creed, Latin version. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa. James Joyce in Context, Volume 1. Telemachus. The Apostles' Creed, Latin version. Credo in Deum Patrem Omnipotentem, Creatorem Celi et Terre. Et in Jesum Christum, Filium eus unicum, Dominum nostrum, qui conceptus est de Spiritu Sancto, natus ex Maria Virgine, passus sub Pontio Pilato, crucifixus, mortuus et sepultus, descendit ad inferna, tertia die, resurrexit a mortuis, ascendit ad celos, sedet ad dexteram dei patris omnipotentis, in de venturus est judicare vivos et mortuos. Credo in spiritum sanctum, sanctam ecclesiam catholicam, sanctorum communionem, remissionem peccatorum, carnis resurrectionem, vitam eternam. Amen. End of the Apostles' Creed in Latin The Apostles' Creed in English this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daniel W. James Joyce in Context, Volume 1, Telemachus, The Apostles' Creed in English. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. End of the Apostles' Creed in English Recording by Daniel W. The Acts of the Apostles Chapters 6 and 7 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linny James Joyce in Context, Volume 1 Telemachus The Acts of the Apostles Chapters 6 and 7 In diebus autem illis, crescente numero discipulorum, factus est murmur, graecorum adversus hebraeus, eo quod dispicerentur in ministerio quotidiano viduae eorum. Convocantes autem duodecim multitudinem discipulorum dixerunt. Non est aequum nos de delinquere verbum dei et ministrare mensis. Considerate ergo, fratres virus ex vobis, boni testimonii septem, plenos spiritu et sapientia, quos constituamus super hoc opus. Nos vero orationi et ministerio verbi instantes erimus et placuit sermo corum omni multitudine, et elegerunt Stephanum, virum plenum fide et spiritu sancto, et Philippum, et procorum, 
et Nicanorem, et Timonem, et Parmenam, et Nicolaum aduenam Antiochenum. Hos statuerunt ante conspectum apostolorum, et orantes imposuerunt eis manus. Et verbum dei crescebat, et multiplicabatur numerus discipulorum, in Jerusalem, walde multa etiam turba sacerdotum obediebat fidei. Stephanus autem plenus gratia et fortitudine faciebat prodigia, et signa magna in populo. Surexerunt autem quidam de sinagoga, quae apelatur libertinorum, et Quirenensium, et Alexandrinorum, et Eorum, qui erant as Cilicia et Asia disputantes cum Stefano. Et non poterant resistere, sapientiae et spiritui, qualo quebatur. Tunc, submiserunt viros qui dicerent se audice eum dicentem verba blasfemiae, in mosen et deum. Como verunt itaque plebem et seniores et scribas, et concurrentes rapuerunt eum et aduxerunt in concilium. Et statuerunt testes falsos, dicentes homoiste non cessat loqui verba adversus locum sanctum et legem. Audivimus enim eum dicentem quoniam Jesus Nazarenus hic destruet locum istum et mutabit traditiones quas tradidit nobis moses. Et intuentes eum omnes qui sedebant in concilio viderunt, Facem eius, tamquam facem angeli. Dixit autem princip sacerdotum, si haec ita se habent. Qui ait, viri fratres et patres, audite, Deus gloriae aparuit patri nostru, Abraham, cum esset in Mesopotamiam priusquam moraretur in caram. Et dixit ad ilum, exide terra tua et de cognatione tua et veni in terram quam tibi monstrauero. Tunc exiit de terra caldeorum, et habitavit in caram, et inde posqua mortus est pater eius, transtulit ilum in terram istam, in qua nunc vos habitatis. Et non dedit ili hereditatem in ea, nec passum pedis, et repromisit, dare ili eam in possessionem et semini eius post ipsum cum non haberet filium. Locutus est autem Deus, quia erit semen eius, Acola in terra aliena, et servituti eos subicient et malec tractabunt eos anis quadringentis. Et gentem qui servierint judicabo ego, dixit Deus, et post haec exibunt et der servient mihi in loco isto. Et dedit ili testamentum circumcisionis, et sic genuit Isaac, et circumcidit eum, die octava, et Isaac Jacob, et Jacob duodecim patriarchas. Et patriarcae aemulantes, Iosef, vendi derunt in Aegyptum, et erat Deus cum eo. Et eripuit eum ex omnibus tribulationibus eius, et dedit ei gratiam et sapientiam in conspectu faraonis, regis Aegypti, et constituit eum praepositum super Aegyptum et super omnem domum suam. Venit autem fames in universam Aegyptum, et Canaan, et tribulatio magna, et non inveniebam cibos patres nostri. Cum audisset autem Iacob, esse frumentum in Aegypto, misit patres nostros primum. Et in secundo cognitus est Iosef, a fratribus suis, et manifestatum est faraoni genus eius. Mitens autem Iosef acersivit Iacob, patrem suum, et omnen cognationem in animabus septuaginta quinque. Et descendit Jacob in Aegyptum, et defunctus est ipse et patres nostri. Et translati sunt in Sichem, et positi sunt in sepulcro, quod emit Abraham pretio argenti a filiis emor filii Sichem. Cum ad propinquaret autem tempus repromissionis, quam confessus erat Deus Abrahae, creuit populus et multiplicatus est in Aegypto. Coadusque surrexit rex alius in Aegypto, qui non sciebat Iosef. Hic, que cum veniens genus nostrum ad flixit patris, ut exponerent infantes suos ne vivificarentur. Eodem tempore natus est moses, et fuit gratus deo, qui nutritus est tribus mensibus in domo patris sui. Exposito autem illo, sustulit eum filia faraonis, et enutriuit eum sibi in filium. 
et eruditus es moses, omnis sapientia aegyptiorum, et erat potens in verbis et in operibus suis. Com autem incleretur ei quadraginta anorum tempus, ascendit in cor eius ut visitaret fratres suos, filios Israel. Et cum vidisset, quendam in iudiam patientem, vindicabit ilum, et fecit utionim, ei, qui in iudiam sustinebat percusso aegyptio. Existimabat autem intelegere fratres, quoniam Deus per manum ipsius, daret salutem, ilis ad ili, non intelexerunt. Sequenti vero die, aparuit ilis litigantibus, et reconciliabat eos, in pacem, dicens viri fratres estis, ut quid nocetis alterutrum. Qui autem in iuriam faciebat proximo, repulit eum, dicens, quis te constituit principem et iudicem super nos. Nunquid interficere me tuis quem ad modum interfecisti heri aegyptium? Fugit autem moses in verbo isto, et factus est aduena in terra madiam, ubi generavit filios duos. Et expletis anis quadraginta, aparuit ili in deserto monte sina, angelus in igne flamae rubi. Moses autem videns, admiratus est visum, et accedente illo ut consideraret facta est vox domini. Ego Deus, patrum tuorum, Deus Abraham, et Deus Isaac, et Deus Jacob, treme factus autem Moses, non audebat considerare. Dixit autem ili dominus, Solve calciamentum pedum tuorum locus, enim in postas terra sancta est. Videns vidi ad fictionem populi mei, qui est in Aegypto, et gemitum eorum audivi, et descendi liberare eos, et nunc veni et mitam te in Aegyptum. Hunc mosen, quem negaverunt dicentes quis te constituit principem et iudicem hunc, Deus principem et redemptorem misit, cum manu angeli qui aparuit ili in drugo. Hic eduxit ilos faciens prodigia, et signa in terra Aegypti, et in rubro mari, et in deserto anis quadraginta. Hic est moses qui dixit filis Israel, Profetam vobis suscitabit Deus de fratribus vestris tamquam me. Hic est qui fuit in ecclesia in solitudine, cum angelo qui loquebatur, ei, in monte sina, et cum patribus nostris qui acepit verba vitae dare nobis. Qui noluerunt obedire patres nostri, sed repulerunt et aversis sunt coribus suis in Aegyptum. Dicentes ad aron fac nobis Deus, qui praecedant nos moses enim, hic, qui eduxit nos de terra a Egypti, nescimus quid factum sit ei. Et vitulum fecerunt in ilis diebus, et obtulerunt hostiam, simulacro et laetabantur in operibus manum suarum. Convertit autem Deus, et tradidit eo serviri militiae caeli, sicut scriptum est in libro profetarum, numquid victimas aut hostias obtulistis, mihi, anis quadraginta in desertu domus Israel. Et suscepistis tabernaculum moloch, et sidus dei westri remfam, figuras quas fecistis adorare eas, et transferam vos trans Babilonem. Tabernaculum testimonii fuit patribus nostris in desertu, sicut disposuit loquens ad mosent, ut facerent ilud secundum formam quam viderat. Quod et induxerunt suscipientes patres nostri, cum Iesu, in possessionem gentium, quas expulit Deus a facie patrum nostrorum, usque in diebus David. Qui invenit gratiam ante Deum, et petit, ut invenire tabernaculum Deo Jacob. Salomon autem aedificavit ili domum. Sed non excelsus in manufactis habitat, sicut profeta dicit. Caelum mihi sedis est, terra autem, scabilum pedum meorum, quam domum aedificabitis, mihi, dicit dominus, aut quis locus requietionis mea est? Non emanus mea fecit haec omnia? Dura cervici, et incircuncisi coribus et auribus, vos semper spiritui sancto resistitis, sicut patres vestri et vos. Quem profetarum non sunt persecuti, patres vestri, et occiderunt eos qui praenuntiabant de aduentu iusti, cui os vos nunc proditores et homicidae fuistis. 
quia que pistis legem in dispositionem angelorum et non custodistis. Audientes autem haec dissecabantur cordibus suis, et stridebant dentibus in eum, cum autem esset plenus spiritus sancto, intendens in caelum vidit gloriam dei, et iesum stantem ad dextris dei, et ai, eque video, caelos apertus, et filium hominis ad dextris stantem dei. Exclamantes autem voce magna continuerunt aures suas, et impetum fecerunt unianimiter in eum. Et eicientes eum extras civitatem lapidabant, et testes deposuerunt vestimenta suas secus pedes adolescentes qui vocabatur saulus. Et lapidabant Stefanum, invocantem et dicentem, Domino Iesu, suscipe spiritum meum. Positis autem genibus, clamavit voce magna. Domine, ne statuas ilis hoc peccatum, et cum hoc dixisset, obdormivit. Saulus autem erat consentiens neci eius. End of Acts of the Apostles, chapters 6 and 7. The Decay of Lying, an Observation, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen. James Joyce in Context, Volume 1. Telemachus. The Decay of Lying. An Observation. Part 1 by Oscar Wilde. A Dialogue Persons Cyril and Vivian Scene The Library of a Country House in Nottinghamshire Cyril, coming in through the open window from the terrace. My dear Vivian, don't coop yourself up all day in the library. It is a perfectly lovely afternoon. The air is exquisite. There is a mist upon the woods, like the purple bloom upon a plum. Let us go and lie on the grass and smoke cigarettes and enjoy nature. Vivian. Enjoy nature? I am glad to say that I have entirely lost that faculty. People tell us that art makes us love nature more than we loved her before, that it reveals her secrets to us, and that after a careful study of Corot and Constable we see things in her that had escaped our observation. My own experience is that the more we study art, the less we care for nature. What art really reveals to us is nature's lack of design, her curious crudities, her extraordinary monotony, her absolutely unfinished condition. Nature has good intentions, of course, but as Aristotle once said, she cannot carry them out. When I look at a landscape, I cannot help seeing all its defects. It is fortunate for us, however, that nature is so imperfect, as otherwise we should have no art at all. Art is our spirited protest, our gallant attempt to teach nature her proper place. As for the infinite variety of nature, that is a pure myth. It is not to be found in nature herself. It resides in the imagination, or fancy, or cultivated blindness of the man who looks at her. Cyril. Well, you need not look at the landscape. You can lie on the grass and smoke and talk. Vivian. But nature is so uncomfortable. Grass is hard and lumpy and damp, and full of dreadful black insects. Why, even Morris's poorest workman could make you a more comfortable seat than the whole of nature can. 
nature pales before the furniture of the street from which oxford has borrowed its name as the poet you love so much once vilely phrased it i don't complain if nature had been comfortable mankind would never have invented architecture and i prefer houses to the open air in a house we all feel of the proper proportions everything is subordinated to us fashioned for our use and our pleasure egotism itself which is so necessary to a proper sense of human dignity is entirely the result of indoor life out of doors one becomes abstract and impersonal one's individuality absolutely leaves one and then nature is so indifferent so unappreciative whenever i am walking in the park here i always feel that i am no more to her than the cattle that browse on the slope or the burdock that blooms in the ditch nothing is more evident than that nature hates mind thinking is the most unhealthy thing in the world and people die of it just as they die of any other disease fortunately in england at any rate thought is not catching our splendid physique as a people is entirely due to our national stupidity i only hope we shall be able to keep this great historic bulwark of our happiness for many years to come but i am afraid that we are beginning to be over-educated at least everybody who is incapable of learning has taken to teaching that is really what our enthusiasm for education has come to in the meantime you had better go back to your wearisome uncomfortable nature and leave me to correct my proofs cyril writing an article that is not very consistent after what you have just said vivian who wants to be consistent the dullard and the doctrinaire the tedious people who carry out their principles to the bitter end of action to the reductio ad absurdum of practice not i like emerson i write over the door of my library the word whim besides my article is really a most salutary and valuable warning if it is attended to there may be a new renaissance of art cyril what is the subject vivian i intend to call it the decay of lying a protest cyril lying i should have thought that our politicians kept up that habit vivian i assure you that they do not they never rise beyond the level of misrepresentation and actually condescend to prove to discuss to argue how different from the temper of the true liar with his frank fearless statements his superb irresponsibility his healthy natural disdain of proof of any kind after all what is a fine lie simply that which is its own evidence if a man is sufficiently unimaginative to produce evidence in support of a lie he might just as well speak the truth at once no the politicians won't do something may perhaps be urged on behalf of the bar the mantle of the sophist has fallen on its members their feigned ardours and unreal rhetoric are delightful they can make the worse appear the better cause as though they were fresh from leontine schools and have been known to wrest from reluctant juries triumphant verdicts of acquittal for their clients even when those clients as often happens were clearly and unmistakably innocent but they are briefed by the prosaic and are not ashamed to appeal to precedent 
in spite of their endeavours the truth will out newspapers even have degenerated they may now be absolutely relied upon one feels it as one wades through their columns it is always the unreadable that occurs i am afraid there is not much to be said in favour of either the lawyer or the journalist besides what i am pleading for is lying in art shall i read you what i have written it might do you a great deal of good cyril certainly if you give me a cigarette thanks by the way what magazine do you intend it for vivian for the retrospective review i think i told you that the elect had revived it cyril whom do you mean by the elect vivian oh the tired hedonists of course it is a club to which i belong we are supposed to wear faded roses in our buttonholes when we meet and to have a sort of cult for domitian i am afraid you are not eligible you are too fond of simple pleasures cyril i should be black-balled on the ground of animal spirits i suppose vivian probably besides you are a little too old we don't admit anybody who is of the usual age cyril well i should fancy you are all a good deal bored with each other vivian we are this is one of the objects of the club now if you promise not to interrupt too often i will read you my article cyril ah you will find me all attention vivian reading in a very clear musical voice <coughs> the decay of lying a protest one of the chief causes that can be assigned for the curiously commonplace character of most of the literature of our age is undoubtedly the decay of lying as an art a science and a social pleasure the ancient historians gave us delightful fiction in the form of fact the modern novelist presents us with dull facts under the guise of fiction the blue book is rapidly becoming his ideal both for method and manner he has his tedious document humain his miserable little coin de la création into which he peers with his microscope he is to be found at the librairie nationale or at the british museum shamelessly reading up his subject he has not even the courage of other people's ideas but insists on going directly to life for everything and ultimately between encyclopedias and personal experience he comes to the ground having drawn his types from the family circle or from the weekly washerwoman and having acquired an amount of useful information from which never even in his most meditative moments can he thoroughly free himself the loss that results to literature in general from this false ideal of our time can hardly be overestimated people have a careless way of talking about a born liar just as they talk about a born poet but in both cases they are wrong lying and poetry are arts arts as pinto saw not unconnected with each other and they require the most careful study the most disinterested devotion indeed they have their technique just as the more material arts of painting and sculpture have their subtle secrets of form and colour their craft mysteries their deliberate artistic methods as one knows the poet by his fine music so one can recognize the liar by his rich rhythmic utterance and in neither case will the casual inspiration of the moment suffice here as elsewhere practice must precede perfection 
but in modern days while the fashion of writing poetry has become far too common and should if possible be discouraged the fashion of lying has almost fallen into disrepute many a young man starts in life with a natural gift for exaggeration which if nurtured in congenial and sympathetic surroundings or by the imitation of the best models might grow into something really great and wonderful but as a rule he comes to nothing he either falls into careless habits of accuracy cyril my dear fellow vivian please don't interrupt in the middle of a sentence <clears throat> He either falls into careless habits of accuracy, or takes to frequenting the society of the aged and the well-informed. Both things are equally fatal to his imagination, as indeed they would be fatal to the imagination of anybody, and in a short time he develops a morbid and unhealthy faculty of truth-telling begins to verify all statements made in his presence, has no hesitation in contradicting people who are much younger than himself, and often ends by writing novels which are so lifelike that no one can possibly believe in their probability. This is no isolated instance that we are giving. It is simply one example out of many and if something cannot be done to check or at least to modify our monstrous worship of facts art will become sterile and beauty will pass away from the land even mr robert louis stevenson that delightful master of delicate and fanciful prose is tainted with this modern vice for we know positively no other name for it. There is such a thing as robbing a story of its reality by trying to make it too true, and the black arrow is so inartistic as not to contain a single anachronism to boast of, while the transformation of Dr. Jekyll reads dangerously like an experiment out of the Lancet as for mr rider haggard who really has or had once the makings of a perfectly magnificent liar he is now so afraid of being suspected of genius that when he does tell us anything marvellous he feels bound to invent a personal reminiscence and to put it into a footnote as a kind of cowardly corroboration nor are our other novelists much better mr henry james writes fiction as if it were a painful duty and wastes upon mean motives and imperceptible points of view his neat literary style his felicitous phrases his swift and caustic satire mr hall caine it is true aims at the grandiose but then he writes at the top of his voice. He is so loud that one cannot hear what he says. Mr. James Payne is an adept in the art of concealing what is not worth finding. He hunts down the obvious with the enthusiasm of a short-sighted detective. As one turns over the pages, the suspense of the author becomes almost unbearable. The horses of Mr. William Black's Phaeton do not soar towards the sun. They merely frighten the sky at evening into violent chromolithographic effects. On seeing them approach, the peasants take refuge in dialect. Mrs. Oliphant prattles pleasantly about curates, lawn-tennis parties, domesticity, and other wearisome things. Mr. Marion Crawford has immolated himself upon the altar of local colour. He is like the lady in the French comedy, who keeps talking about le beau ciel d'Italie. Besides, he has fallen into the bad habit of uttering moral platitudes. 
he is always telling us that to be good is to be good and that to be bad is to be wicked at times he is almost edifying robert ellesmere is of course a masterpiece a masterpiece of the genre ennuyeux the one form of literature that the english people seems thoroughly to enjoy a thoughtful young friend of ours once told us that it reminded him of the sort of conversation that goes on at a meat tea in the house of a serious nonconformist family and we can quite believe it indeed it is only in england that such a book could be produced england is the home of lost ideas as for that great and daily increasing school of novelists for whom the sun always rises in the east end the only thing that can be said about them is that they find life crude and leave it raw in france though nothing so deliberately tedious as robert ellesmere has been produced things are not much better m guy de maupassant with his keen mordant irony and his hard vivid style strips life of the few poor rags that still cover her and shows us foul sore and festering wound he writes lurid little tragedies in which everybody is ridiculous bitter comedies at which one cannot laugh for very tears m zola true to the lofty principle that he lays down in one of his pronunciamentos on literature l'homme de génie n'a jamais d'esprit is determined to show that if he has not got genius he can at least be dull and how well he succeeds he is not without power indeed at times as in germinal there is something almost epic in his work but his work is entirely wrong from beginning to end and wrong not on the ground of morals but on the ground of art from any ethical standpoint it is just what it should be the author is perfectly truthful and describes things exactly as they happen what more can any moralist desire we have no sympathy at all with the moral indignation of our time against m zola it is simply the indignation of tartuffe on being exposed but from the standpoint of art what can be said in favour of the author of l'assommoir nana and Pobouille? nothing mr ruskin once described the characters in george eliot's novels as being like the sweepings of a pentonville omnibus but m zola's characters are much worse they have their dreary vices and their drearier virtues the record of their lives is absolutely without interest who cares what happens to them in literature we require distinction charm beauty and imaginative power we don't want to be harrowed and disgusted with an account of the doings of the lower orders m daudet is better he has wit a light touch and an amusing style but he has lately committed literary suicide nobody can possibly care for de lobel with his il faut lutter pour l'art or for valmajour with his eternal refrain about the nightingale or for the poet in jack with his mot cruel now that we have learned from vingt ans de ma vie littéraire that these characters were taken directly from life to us they seem to have suddenly lost all their vitality all the few qualities they ever possessed the only real people are the people who never existed and if a novelist is base enough to go to life for his personages he should at least pretend that they are creations and not boast of them as copies 
the justification of a character in a novel is not that other persons are what they are but that the author is what he is otherwise the novel is not a work of art as for m paul bourget the master of the roman psychologique he commits the error of imagining that the men and women of modern life are capable of being infinitely analysed for an innumerable series of chapters in point of fact what is interesting about people in good society and m bourget rarely moves out of the faubourg saint germain except to come to london is the mask that each one of them wears not the reality that lies behind the mask it is a humiliating confession but we are all of us made out of the same stuff in falstaff there is something of hamlet in hamlet there is not a little of falstaff the fat knight has his moods of melancholy and the young prince his moments of coarse humour where we differ from each other is purely in accidentals in dress manner tone of voice religious opinions personal appearance tricks of habit and the like the more one analyses people the more all reasons for analysis disappear sooner or later one comes to that dreadful universal thing called human nature indeed as any one who has ever worked among the poor knows only too well the brotherhood of man is no mere poet's dream it is a most depressing and humiliating reality and if a writer insists upon analysing the upper classes he might just as well write of match-girls and costermongers at once however my dear cyril i will not detain you any further just here i quite admit that modern novels have many good points all i insist on is that as a class they are quite unreadable cyril that is certainly a very grave qualification but i must say that i think you are rather unfair in some of your strictures i like the deemster and the daughter of heth and le disciple and mr isaacs and as for robert ellesmere i am quite devoted to it not that i can look upon it as a serious work as a statement of the problems that confront the earnest christian it is ridiculous and antiquated it is simply arnold's literature and dogma with the literature left out it is as much behind the age as paley's evidences or colenso's method of biblical exegesis nor could anything be less impressive than the unfortunate hero gravely heralding a dawn that rose long ago and so completely missing its true significance that he proposes to carry on the business of the old firm under the new name on the other hand it contains several clever caricatures and a heap of delightful quotations and green's philosophy very pleasantly sugars the somewhat bitter pill of the author's fiction i also cannot help expressing my surprise that you have said nothing about the two novelists whom you are always reading balzac and george meredith surely they are realists both of them vivian ah meredith who can define him his style is chaos illumined by flashes of lightning as a writer he has mastered everything except language as a novelist he can do everything except tell a story as an artist he is everything except articulate somebody in shakespeare touchstone i think talks about a man who is always breaking his shins over his own wit and it seems to me that this might serve as the basis for a criticism of meredith's method 
but whatever he is he is not a realist or rather i would say that he is a child of realism who is not on speaking terms with his father by deliberate choice he has made himself a romanticist he has refused to bow the knee to baal and after all even if the man's fine spirit did not revolt against the noisy assertions of realism his style would be quite sufficient of itself to keep life at a respectful distance by its means he has planted round his garden a hedge full of thorns and red with wonderful roses as for balzac he was a most remarkable combination of the artistic temperament with the scientific spirit the latter he bequeathed to his disciples the former was entirely his own the difference between such a book as m zola's l'assommoir and balzac's illusion perdue is the difference between unimaginative realism and imaginative reality all balzac's characters said baudelaire are gifted with the same ardour of life that animated himself all his fictions are as deeply coloured as dreams each mind is a weapon loaded to the muzzle with will the very scullions have genius a steady course of balzac reduces our living friends to shadows and our acquaintances to the shadows of shades his characters have a kind of fervent fiery coloured existence they dominate us and defy scepticism one of the greatest tragedies of my life is the death of lucien de rubempre it is a grief from which i have never been able completely to rid myself it haunts me in my moments of pleasure i remember it when i laugh but balzac is no more a realist than holbein was he created life he did not copy it i admit however that he set far too high a value on modernity of form and that consequently there is no book of his that as an artistic masterpiece can rank with salambeau or esmond or the cloister and the hearth or the vicomte de bragelonne cyril do you object to modernity of form then vivian yes it is a huge price to pay for a very poor result pure modernity of form is always somewhat vulgarizing it cannot help being so the public imagine that because they are interested in their immediate surroundings art should be interested in them also and should take them as her subject matter but the mere fact that they are interested in these things makes them unsuitable subjects for art the only beautiful things as somebody once said are the things that do not concern us as long as a thing is useful or necessary to us or affects us in any way either for pain or for pleasure or appeals strongly to our sympathies or is a vital part of the environment in which we live it is outside the proper sphere of art to art's subject matter we should be more or less indifferent we should at any rate have no preferences no prejudices no partisan feeling of any kind it is exactly because hecuba is nothing to us that her sorrows are such an admirable motive for a tragedy i do not know anything in the whole history of literature sadder than the artistic career of charles reed he wrote one beautiful book the cloister and the hearth a book as much above romola as romola is above daniel deronda and wasted the rest of his life in a foolish attempt to be modern to draw public attention to the state of our convict prisons 
and the management of our private lunatic asylums charles dickens was depressing enough in all conscience when he tried to arouse our sympathy for the victims of the poor law administration but charles reed an artist a scholar a man with a true sense of beauty raging and roaring over the abuses of contemporary life like a common pamphleteer or a sensational journalist is really a sight for the angels to weep over believe me my dear cyril modernity of form and modernity of subject matter are entirely and absolutely wrong we have mistaken the common livery of the age for the vesture of the muses and spend our days in the sordid streets and hideous suburbs of our vile cities when we should be out on the hillside with apollo certainly we are a degraded race and have sold our birthright for a mess of facts end of the decay of lying an observation part one recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey the decay of lying an observation part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by martin geeson james joyce in context volume 1 telemachus the decay of lying an observation part two by oscar wilde vivian reading art begins with abstract decoration with purely imaginative and pleasurable work dealing with what is unreal and non-existent this is the first stage then life becomes fascinated with this new wonder and asks to be admitted into the charmed circle art takes life as part of her rough material recreates it and refashions it in fresh forms is absolutely indifferent to fact invents imagines dreams and keeps between herself and reality the impenetrable barrier of beautiful style of decorative or ideal treatment the third stage is when life gets the upper hand and drives art out into the wilderness that is the true decadence and it is from this that we are now suffering take the case of the english drama at first in the hands of the monks dramatic art was abstract decorative and mythological then she enlisted life in her service and using some of life's external forms she created an entirely new race of beings whose sorrows were more terrible than any sorrow man has ever felt whose joys were keener than lovers joys who had the rage of the titans and the calm of the gods who had monstrous and marvellous sins monstrous and marvellous virtues to them she gave a language different from that of actual use a language full of resonant music and sweet rhythm made stately by solemn cadence or made delicate by fanciful rhyme jewelled with wonderful words and enriched with lofty diction she clothed her children in strange raiment and gave them masks and at her bidding the antique world rose from its marble tomb a new caesar stalked through the streets of risen rome 
and with purple sail and flute-led oars another cleopatra passed up the river to antioch old myth and legend and dream took shape and substance history was entirely rewritten and there was hardly one of the dramatists who did not recognize that the object of art is not simple truth but complex beauty in this they were perfectly right art itself is really a form of exaggeration and selection which is the very spirit of art is nothing more than an intensified mode of over-emphasis but life soon shattered the perfection of the form even in shakespeare we can see the beginning of the end it shows itself by the gradual breaking up of the blank verse in the later plays by the predominance given to prose and by the over-importance assigned to characterization the passages in shakespeare and they are many where the language is uncouth vulgar exaggerated fantastic obscene even are entirely due to life calling for an echo of her own voice and rejecting the intervention of beautiful style through which alone should life be suffered to find expression shakespeare is not by any means a flawless artist he is too fond of going directly to life and borrowing life's natural utterance he forgets that when art surrenders her imaginative medium she surrenders everything goethe says somewhere in der beschränkung zeigt sich erst der meister it is in working within limits that the master reveals himself and the limitation the very condition of any art is style however we need not linger any longer over shakespeare's realism the tempest is the most perfect of palinodes all that we desired to point out was that the magnificent work of the elizabethan and jacobean artists contained within itself the seeds of its own dissolution and that if it drew some of its strength from using life as rough material it drew all its weakness from using life as an artistic method as the inevitable result of this substitution of an imitative for a creative medium this surrender of an imaginative form we have the modern english melodrama the characters in these plays talk on the stage exactly as they would talk off it they have neither aspirations nor aspirates they are taken directly from life and reproduce its vulgarity down to the smallest detail they present the gait manner costume and accent of real people they would pass unnoticed in a third-class railway carriage and yet how wearisome the plays are they do not succeed in producing even that impression of reality at which they aim and which is their only reason for existing as a method realism is a complete failure what is true about the drama and the novel is no less true about those arts that we call the decorative arts the whole history of these arts in europe is the record of the struggle between orientalism with its frank rejection of imitation its love of artistic convention its dislike to the actual representation of any object in nature and our own imitative spirit wherever the former has been paramount as in byzantium sicily and spain by actual contact or in the rest of europe by the influence of the crusades we have had beautiful and imaginative work in which the visible things of life are transmuted into artistic conventions and the things that life has not are invented and fashioned for her delight but wherever we have returned to life and nature 
our work has always become vulgar common and uninteresting modern tapestry with its aerial effects its elaborate perspective its broad expanses of waste sky its faithful and laborious realism has no beauty whatsoever the pictorial glass of germany is absolutely detestable we are beginning to weave passable carpets in england but only because we have returned to the method and spirit of the east our rugs and carpets of twenty years ago with their solemn depressing truths their inane worship of nature their sordid reproductions of visible objects have become even to the philistine a source of laughter a cultured mohammedan once remarked to us you christians are so occupied in misinterpreting the fourth commandment that you have never thought of making an artistic application of the second he was perfectly right and the whole truth of the matter is this the proper school to learn art in is not life but art and now let me read you a passage which seems to me to settle the question very completely it was not always thus we need not say anything about the poets for they with the unfortunate exception of mr wordsworth have been really faithful to their high mission and are universally recognized as being absolutely unreliable but in the works of herodotus who in spite of the shallow and ungenerous attempts of modern sciolists to verify his history may justly be called the father of lies in the published speeches of cicero and the biographies of suetonius in tacitus at his best in pliny's natural history in hanno's periplus in all the early chronicles in the lives of the saints in froissart and sir thomas mallory in the travels of marco polo in olaus magnus and aldrovandus and conrad lycosthenes with his magnificent prodigiorum et ostentorum chronicon in the autobiography of benvenuto cellini in the memoirs of casanova in defoe's history of the plague in boswell's life of johnson in napoleon's dispatches and in the works of our own carlyle whose french revolution is one of the most fascinating historical novels ever written facts are either kept in their proper subordinate position or else entirely excluded on the general ground of dullness now everything is changed facts are not merely finding a footing place in history but they are usurping the domain of fancy and have invaded the kingdom of romance their chilling touch is over everything they are vulgarizing mankind the crude commercialism of america its materializing spirit its indifference to the poetical side of things and its lack of imagination and of high unattainable ideals are entirely due to that country having adopted for its national hero a man who according to his own confession was incapable of telling a lie and it is not too much to say that the story of george washington and the cherry tree has done more harm and in a shorter space of time than any other moral tale in the whole of literature cyril my dear boy vivian i assure you it is the case and the amusing part of the whole thing is that the story of the cherry tree is an absolute myth however you must not think that i am too despondent about the artistic future either of america or of our own country listen to this <clears throat> that some change will take place before this century has drawn to its close we have no doubt whatsoever 
bored by the tedious and improving conversation of those who have neither the wit to exaggerate nor the genius to romance tired of the intelligent person whose reminiscences are always based upon memory whose statements are invariably limited by probability and who is at any time liable to be corroborated by the merest philistine who happens to be present society sooner or later must return to its lost leader the cultured and fascinating liar who he was who first without ever having gone out to the rude chase told the wandering cavemen at sunset how he had dragged the megatherium from the purple darkness of its jasper cave or slain the mammoth in single combat and brought back its gilded tusks we cannot tell and not one of our modern anthropologists for all their much boasted science has had the ordinary courage to tell us whatever was his name or race he was certainly the true founder of social intercourse for the aim of the liar is simply to charm to delight to give pleasure he is the very basis of civilized society and without him a dinner-party even at the mansions of the great is as dull as a lecture at the royal society or a debate at the incorporated authors or one of mr bernand's farcical comedies nor will he be welcomed by society alone art breaking from the prison-house of realism will run to greet him and will kiss his false beautiful lips knowing that he alone is in possession of the great secret of all her manifestations the secret that truth is entirely and absolutely a matter of style while life poor probable uninteresting human life tired of repeating herself for the benefit of mr herbert spencer scientific historians and the compilers of statistics in general will follow meekly after him and try to reproduce in her own simple and untutored way some of the marvels of which he talks no doubt there will always be critics who like a certain writer in the saturday review will gravely censure the teller of fairy tales for his defective knowledge of natural history who will measure imaginative work by their own lack of any imaginative faculty and will hold up their ink-stained hands in horror if some honest gentleman who has never been farther than the yew-trees of his own garden pens a fascinating book of travels like sir john mandeville or like great raleigh writes a whole history of the world without knowing anything whatsoever about the past to excuse themselves they will try and shelter under the shield of him who made prospero the magician and gave him caliban and ariel as his servants who heard the tritons blowing their horns round the coral reefs of the enchanted isle and the fairies singing to each other in a wood near athens who led the phantom kings in dim procession across the misty scottish heath and hid hecate in a cave with the weird sisters they will call upon shakespeare they always do and will quote that hackneyed passage forgetting that this unfortunate aphorism about art holding the mirror up to nature is deliberately said by hamlet in order to convince the bystanders of his absolute insanity in all art matters cyril um another cigarette please vivian my dear fellow whatever you may say it is merely a dramatic utterance and no more represents shakespeare's real views upon art than the speeches of iago represent his real views upon morals but let me get to the end of the passage <clears throat> art finds her own perfection within and not outside of herself 
she is not to be judged by any external standard of resemblance she is a veil rather than a mirror she has flowers that no forests know of birds that no woodland possesses she makes and unmakes many worlds and can draw the moon from heaven with a scarlet thread hers are the forms more real than living man and hers the great archetypes of which things that have existence are but unfinished copies nature has in her eyes no laws no uniformity she can work miracles at her will and when she calls monsters from the deep they come she can bid the almond tree blossom in winter and send the snow upon the ripe cornfield at her word the frost lays its silver finger upon the burning mouth of june and the winged lions creep out from the hollows of the lydian hills the dryads peer from the thicket as she passes by and the brown fawns smile strangely at her when she comes near them she has hawk-faced gods that worship her and the centaurs gallop at her side cyril i like that i can see it is that the end vivian no there is one more passage but it is purely practical it simply suggests some methods by which we could revive this lost art of lying cyril well before you read it to me i should like to ask you a question what do you mean by saying that life poor probable uninteresting human life will try to reproduce the marvels of art i can quite understand your objection to art being treated as a mirror you think it would reduce genius to the position of a cracked looking-glass but you don't mean to say that you seriously believe that life imitates art that life in fact is the mirror and art the reality vivian certainly i do paradox though it may seem and paradoxes are always dangerous things it is none the less true that life imitates art far more than art imitates life we have all seen in our own day in england how a certain curious and fascinating type of beauty invented and emphasized by two imaginative painters has so influenced life that whenever one goes to a private view or to an artistic salon one sees here the mystic eyes of rossetti's dream the long ivory throat the strange square-cut jaw the loosened shadowy hair that he so ardently loved there the sweet maidenhood of the golden stare the blossom-like mouth and weary loveliness of the laus amoris the passion pale face of andromeda the thin hands and lithe beauty of the vivian in merlin's dream and it has always been so a great artist invents a type and life tries to copy it to reproduce it in a popular form like an enterprising publisher neither holbein nor van dyck found in england what they have given us they brought their types with them and life with her keen imitative faculty set herself to supply the master with models the greeks with their quick artistic instinct understood this and set in the bride's chamber the statue of hermes or of apollo so that she might bear children as lovely as the works of art that she looked at in her rapture or her pain they knew that life gains from art not merely spirituality depth of thought and feeling soul turmoil or soul peace but that she can form herself on the very lines and colours of art and can reproduce the dignity of phaedias as well as the grace of praxiteles hence came their objection to realism 
they disliked it on purely social grounds they felt that it inevitably makes people ugly and they were perfectly right we try to improve the conditions of the race by means of good air free sunlight wholesome water and hideous bare buildings for the better housing of the lower orders but these things merely produce health they do not produce beauty for this art is required and the true disciples of the great artist are not his studio imitators but those who become like his works of art be they plastic as in greek days or pictorial as in modern times in a word life is art's best art's only pupil as it is with the visible arts so it is with literature the most obvious and the vulgarest form in which this is shown is in the case of the silly boys who after reading the adventures of jack shepherd or dick turpin pillage the stalls of unfortunate apple women break into sweet shops at night and alarm old gentlemen who are returning home from the city by leaping out on them in suburban lanes with black masks and unloaded revolvers this interesting phenomenon which always occurs after the appearance of a new edition of either of the books i have alluded to is usually attributed to the influence of literature on the imagination but this is a mistake the imagination is essentially creative and always seeks for a new form the boy burglar is simply the inevitable result of life's imitative instinct he is fact occupied as fact usually is with trying to reproduce fiction and what we see in him is repeated on an extended scale throughout the whole of life schopenhauer has analyzed the pessimism that characterizes modern thought but hamlet invented it the world has become sad because a puppet was once melancholy the nihilist that strange martyr who has no faith who goes to the stake without enthusiasm and dies for what he does not believe in is a purely literary product he was invented by turgenev and completed by dostoevsky robespierre came out of the pages of rousseau as surely as the people's palace rose out of the debris of a novel literature always anticipates life it does not copy it but moulds it to its purpose the nineteenth century as we know it is largely an invention of balzac our luciens de rubempre our rastignacs and de marsays made their first appearance on the stage of the comedie humaine we are merely carrying out with footnotes and unnecessary additions the whim or fancy or creative vision of a great novelist i once asked a lady who knew thackeray intimately whether he had had any model for becky sharp she told me that becky was an invention but that the idea of the character had been partly suggested by a governess who lived in the neighbourhood of kensington square and was the companion of a very selfish and rich old woman i inquired what became of the governess and she replied that oddly enough some years after the appearance of vanity fair she ran away with the nephew of the lady with whom she was living and for a short time made a great splash in society quite in mrs rawdon crawley's style and entirely by mrs rawdon crawley's methods ultimately she came to grief disappeared to the continent and used to be occasionally seen at monte carlo and other gambling places the noble gentleman from whom the same great sentimentalist drew colonel newcombe died a few months after the newcombes had reached a fourth edition with the word adsum on his lips 
shortly after mr stevenson published his curious psychological story of transformation a friend of mine called mr hyde was in the north of london and being anxious to get to a railway station took what he thought would be a short cut lost his way and found himself in a network of mean evil-looking streets feeling rather nervous he began to walk extremely fast when suddenly out of an archway ran a child right between his legs it fell on the pavement he tripped over it and trampled upon it being of course very much frightened and a little hurt it began to scream and in a few seconds the whole street was full of rough people who came pouring out of the houses like ants they surrounded him and asked him his name he was just about to give it when he suddenly remembered the opening incident in mr stevenson's story he was so filled with horror at having realized in his own person that terrible and well-written scene and at having done accidentally though in fact what the mr hyde of fiction had done with deliberate intent that he ran away as hard as he could go he was however very closely followed and finally he took refuge in a surgery the door of which happened to be open where he explained to a young assistant who happened to be there exactly what had occurred the humanitarian crowd were induced to go away on his giving them a small sum of money and as soon as the coast was clear he left as he passed out the name on the brass door-plate of the surgery caught his eye it was jekyll at least it should have been here the imitation as far as it went was of course accidental in the following case the imitation was self-conscious in the year eighteen seventy nine just after i had left oxford i met at a reception of the house of one of the foreign ministers a woman of very curious exotic beauty we became great friends and were constantly together and yet what interested me most in her was not her beauty but her character her entire vagueness of character she seemed to have no personality at all but simply the possibility of many types sometimes she would give herself up entirely to art turn her drawing-room into a studio and spend two or three days a week at picture galleries or museums then she would take to attending race meetings wear the most horsey clothes and talk about nothing but betting she abandoned religion for mesmerism mesmerism for politics and politics for the melodramatic excitements of philanthropy in fact she was a kind of proteus and as much a failure in all her transformations as was that wondrous sea-god when odysseus laid hold of him one day a serial began in one of the french magazines at that time i used to read serial stories and i well remember the shock of surprise i felt when i came to the description of the heroine she was so like my friend that i brought her the magazine and she recognized herself in it immediately and seemed fascinated by the resemblance i should tell you by the way that the story was translated from some dead russian writer so that the author had not taken his type from my friend well to put the matter briefly some months afterwards i was in venice and finding the magazine in the reading-room of the hotel i took it up casually to see what had become of the heroine it was a most piteous tale as the girl had ended by running away with a man absolutely inferior to her not merely in social station but in character and intellect also i wrote to my friend that evening about my views on john bellini 
and the admirable ices at florian's and the artistic value of gondolas but added a postscript to the effect that her double in the story had behaved in a very silly manner i don't know why i added that but i remember i had a sort of dread over me that she might do the same thing before my letter had reached her she had run away with a man who deserted her in six months i saw her in eighteen eighty four in paris where she was living with her mother and i asked her whether the story had had anything to do with her action she told me that she had felt an absolutely irresistible impulse to follow the heroine step by step in her strange and fatal progress and that it was with a feeling of real terror that she had looked forward to the last few chapters of the story when they appeared it seemed to her that she was compelled to reproduce them in life and she did so it was a most clear example of this imitative instinct of which i was speaking and an extremely tragic one however i do not wish to dwell any further upon individual instances personal experience is a most vicious and limited circle all that i desire to point out is the general principle that life imitates art far more than art imitates life and i feel sure that if you think seriously about it you will find that it is true life holds the mirror up to art and either reproduces some strange type imagined by painter or sculptor or realizes in fact what has been dreamed in fiction scientifically speaking the basis of life the energy of life as aristotle would call it is simply the desire for expression and art is always presenting various forms through which this expression can be attained life seizes on them and uses them even if they be to her own hurt young men have committed suicide because rolla did so have died by their own hand because by his own hand werther died think of what we owe to the imitation of christ of what we owe to the imitation of caesar cyril the theory is certainly a very curious one but to make it complete you must show that nature no less than life is an imitation of art are you prepared to prove that vivian my dear fellow i am prepared to prove anything end of the decay of lying an observation part two Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey. The Decay of Lying An Observation Part 3 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen. James Joyce in Context, Volume 1. Telemachus. The Decay of Lying. An Observation. Part 3. By Oscar Wilde. Cyril nature follows the landscape painter then and takes her effects from him vivian certainly where if not from the impressionists do we get those wonderful brown fogs that come creeping down our streets blurring the gas lamps and changing the houses into monstrous shadows 
to whom if not to them and their master do we owe the lovely silver mists that brood over our river and turn to faint forms of fading grace curved bridge and swaying barge the extraordinary change that has taken place in the climate of london during the last ten years is entirely due to a particular school of art you smile consider the matter from a scientific or a metaphysical point of view and you will find that i am right for what is nature nature is no great mother who has borne us she is our creation it is in our brain that she quickens to life things are because we see them and what we see and how we see it depends on the arts that have influenced us to look at a thing is very different from seeing a thing one does not see anything until one sees its beauty then and then only does it come into existence at present people see fogs not because there are fogs but because poets and painters have taught them the mysterious loveliness of such effects there may have been fogs for centuries in london i dare say there were but no one saw them and so we do not know anything about them they did not exist till art had invented them now it must be admitted fogs are carried to excess they have become the mere mannerism of a clique and the exaggerated realism of their method gives dull people bronchitis where the cultured catch an effect the uncultured catch cold and so let us be humane and invite art to turn her wonderful eyes elsewhere she has done so already indeed that white quivering sunlight that one sees now in france with its strange blotches of mauve and its restless violet shadows is her latest fancy and on the whole nature reproduces it quite admirably where she used to give us corots and daubignies she now gives us exquisite monets and entrancing pissarros indeed there are moments rare it is true but still to be observed from time to time when nature becomes absolutely modern of course she is not always to be relied upon the fact is she is in this unfortunate position art creates an incomparable and unique effect and having done so passes on to other things nature upon the other hand forgetting that imitation can be made the sincerest form of insult keeps on repeating this effect until we all become absolutely wearied of it nobody of any real culture for instance ever talks nowadays about the beauty of a sunset sunsets are quite old-fashioned they belong to the time when turner was the last note in art to admire them is a distinct sign of provincialism of temperament upon the other hand they go on yesterday evening mrs arundel insisted on my going to the window and looking at the glorious sky as she called it of course i had to look at it she is one of those absurdly pretty philistines to whom one can deny nothing and what was it it was simply a very second-rate turner a turner of a bad period with all the painter's worst faults exaggerated and over-emphasized of course i am quite ready to admit that life very often commits the same error she produces her false renes and her sham vautrins just as nature gives us on one day a doubtful caup and on another a more than questionable rousseau still nature irritates one more when she does things of that kind 
it seems so stupid so obvious so unnecessary a false vautrin might be delightful a doubtful culp is unbearable however i don't want to be too hard on nature i wish the channel especially at hastings did not look quite so often like a henry moore grey pearl with yellow lights but then when art is more varied nature will no doubt be more varied also that she imitates art i don't think even her worst enemy would deny now it is the one thing that keeps her in touch with civilized man but have i proved my theory to your satisfaction cyril you have proved it to my dissatisfaction which is better but even admitting this strange imitative instinct in life and nature surely you would acknowledge that art expresses the temper of its age the spirit of its time the moral and social conditions that surround it and under whose influence it is produced vivian certainly not art never expresses anything but itself this is the principle of my new aesthetics and it is this more than that vital connection between form and substance on which mr pater dwells that makes music the type of all the arts of course nations and individuals with that healthy natural vanity which is the secret of existence are always under the impression that it is of them that the muses are talking always trying to find in the calm dignity of imaginative art some mirror of their own turbid passions always forgetting that the singer of life is not apollo but marcias remote from reality and with her eyes turned away from the shadows of the cave art reveals her own perfection and the wondering crowd that watches the opening of the marvellous many-petalled rose fancies that it is its own history that is being told to it its own spirit that is finding expression in a new form but it is not so the highest art rejects the burden of the human spirit and gains more from a new medium or a fresh material than she does from any enthusiasm for art or from any lofty passion or from any great awakening of the human consciousness she develops purely on her own lines she is not symbolic of any age it is the ages that are her symbols even those who hold that art is representative of time and place and people cannot help admitting that the more imitative an art is the less it represents to us the spirit of its age the evil faces of the roman emperors look out at us from the foul porphyry and spotted jasper in which the realistic artists of the day delighted to work and we fancy that in those cruel lips and heavy sensual jaws we can find the secret of the ruin of the empire but it was not so the vices of tiberius could not destroy that supreme civilization any more than the virtues of the antonines could save it it fell for other for less interesting reasons the sibyls and prophets of the sistine may indeed serve to interpret for some that new birth of the emancipated spirit that we call the renaissance but what do the drunken boors and bawling peasants of dutch art tell us about the great soul of holland the more abstract the more ideal an art is the more it reveals to us the temper of its age if we wish to understand a nation by means of its art let us look at its architecture or its music cyril 
i quite agree with you there the spirit of an age may be best expressed in the abstract ideal arts for the spirit itself is abstract and ideal upon the other hand for the visible aspect of an age for its look as the phrase goes we must of course go to the arts of imitation vivian i don't think so after all what the imitative arts really give us are merely the various styles of particular artists or of certain schools of artists surely you don't imagine that the people of the middle ages bore any resemblance at all to the figures on medieval stained glass or in medieval stone and wood carving or on medieval metalwork or tapestries or illuminated manuscripts they were probably very ordinary-looking people with nothing grotesque or remarkable or fantastic in their appearance the Middle Ages, as we know them in art, are simply a definite form of style, and there is no reason at all why an artist with this style should not be produced in the nineteenth century. No great artist ever sees things as they really are. If he did, he would cease to be an artist. Take an example from our own day. I know that you are fond of Japanese things now do you really imagine that the japanese people as they are presented to us in art have any existence if you do you have never understood japanese art at all the japanese people are the deliberate self-conscious creation of certain individual artists if you set a picture by hokusai or hokei or any of the great native painters beside a real japanese gentleman or lady you will see that there is not the slightest resemblance between them the actual people who live in japan are not unlike the general run of english people that is to say they are extremely commonplace and have nothing curious or extraordinary about them in fact the whole of japan is a pure invention there is no such country there are no such people one of our most charming painters went recently to the land of the chrysanthemum in the foolish hope of seeing the japanese all he saw all he had the chance of painting were a few lanterns and some fans he was quite unable to discover the inhabitants as his delightful exhibition at messrs dowdswell's gallery showed only too well he did not know that the japanese people are as i have said simply a mode of style an exquisite fancy of art and so if you desire to see a japanese effect you will not behave like a tourist and go to tokyo on the contrary you will stay at home and steep yourself in the work of certain japanese artists and then when you have absorbed the spirit of their style and caught their imaginative manner of vision you will go some afternoon and sit in the park or stroll down piccadilly and if you cannot see an absolutely Japanese effect there, you will not see it anywhere. Or, to return again to the past, take as another instance the ancient Greeks. Do you think that Greek art ever tells us what the Greek people were like? Do you believe that the Athenian women were like the stately dignified figures of the Parthenon frieze? or like those marvellous goddesses who sat in the triangular pediments of the same building if you judge from the art they certainly were so but read an authority like aristophanes for instance you will find that the athenian ladies laced tightly wore high-heeled shoes dyed their hair yellow painted and rouged their faces and were exactly like any silly fashionable or fallen creature of our own day 
the fact is that we look back on the ages entirely through the medium of art and art very fortunately has never once told us the truth cyril but modern portraits by english painters what of them surely they are like the people they pretend to represent vivian quite so they are so like them that a hundred years from now no one will believe in them the only portraits in which one believes are portraits where there is very little of the sitter and a very great deal of the artist holbein's drawings of the men and women of his time impress us with a sense of their absolute reality but this is simply because holbein compelled life to accept his conditions to restrain itself within his limitations to reproduce his type and to appear as he wished it to appear it is style that makes us believe in a thing nothing but style most of our modern portrait painters are doomed to absolute oblivion they never paint what they see they paint what the public sees and the public never sees anything cyril well after that i think i should like to hear the end of your article vivian with pleasure whether it will do any good i really cannot say ours is certainly the dullest and most prosaic century possible why even sleep has played us false and has closed up the gates of ivory and opened the gates of horn the dreams of the great middle classes of this country as recorded in mr myers's two bulky volumes on the subject and in the transactions of the psychical society are the most depressing things i have ever read there is not even a fine nightmare among them they are commonplace sordid and tedious as for the church i cannot conceive anything better for the culture of a country than the presence in it of a body of men whose duty it is to believe in the supernatural to perform daily miracles and to keep alive that mythopoeic faculty which is so essential for the imagination but in the english church a man succeeds not through his capacity for belief but through his capacity for disbelief ours is the only church where the sceptic stands at the altar and where st thomas is regarded as the ideal apostle many a worthy clergyman who passes his life in admirable works of kindly charity lives and dies unnoticed and unknown but it is sufficient for some shallow uneducated pass man out of either university to get up in his pulpit and express his doubts about noah's ark or balaam's ass or jonah and the whale for half of london to flock to hear him and to sit open-mouthed in rapt admiration at his superb intellect the growth of common sense in the english church is a thing very much to be regretted it is really a degrading concession to a low form of realism it is silly too it springs from an entire ignorance of psychology man can believe the impossible but man can never believe the improbable however i must read the end of my article <clears throat> what we have to do what at any rate it is our duty to do is to revive this old art of lying much of course may be done in the way of educating the public by amateurs in the domestic circle at literary lunches and at afternoon teas but this is merely the light and graceful side of lying such as was probably heard at cretan dinner-parties there are many other forms 
lying for the sake of gaining some immediate personal advantage for instance lying with a moral purpose as it is usually called though of late it has been rather looked down upon was extremely popular with the antique world athena laughs when odysseus tells us his words of sly devising as mr william morris phrases it and the glory of mendacity illumines the pale brow of the stainless hero of euripidean tragedy and sets among the noble women of the past the young bride of one of horace's most exquisite odes later on what at first had been merely a natural instinct was elevated into a self-conscious science elaborate rules were laid down for the guidance of mankind and an important school of literature grew up round the subject indeed when one remembers the excellent philosophical treatise of sanchez on the whole question one cannot help regretting that no one has ever thought of publishing a cheap and condensed edition of the works of that great casuist a short primer when to lie and how if brought out in an attractive and not too expensive a form would no doubt command a large sale and would prove of real practical service to many earnest and deep-thinking people lying for the sake of the improvement of the young which is the basis of home education still lingers amongst us and its advantages are so admirably set forth in the early books of plato's republic that it is unnecessary to dwell upon them here it is a mode of lying for which all good mothers have peculiar capabilities but it is capable of still further development and has been sadly overlooked by the school board lying for the sake of a monthly salary is of course well known in fleet street and the profession of a political leader writer is not without its advantages but it is said to be a somewhat dull occupation and it certainly does not lead to much beyond a kind of ostentatious obscurity the only form of lying that is absolutely beyond reproach is lying for its own sake and the highest development of this is as we have already pointed out lying in art just as those who do not love plato more than truth cannot pass beyond the threshold of the academe so those who do not love beauty more than truth never know the inmost shrine of art the solid stolid british intellect lies in the desert sands like the sphinx in flaubert's marvellous tale and fantasy la chimere dances round it and calls to it with her false flute-toned voice it may not hear her now but surely some day when we are all bored to death with the commonplace character of modern fiction it will hearken to her and try to borrow her wings and when that day dawns or sunset reddens how joyous we shall all be facts will be regarded as discreditable truth will be found mourning over her fetters and romance with her temper of wonder will return to the land the very aspect of the world will change to our startled eyes out of the sea will rise behemoth and leviathan and sail round the high pooped galleys as they do on the delightful maps of those ages when books on geography were actually readable dragons will wander about the waste places and the phoenix will soar from her nest of fire into the air we shall lay our hands upon the basilisk and see the jewel in the toad's head champing his gilded oats the hippogriff will stand in our stalls and over our heads will float the blue bird singing of beautiful and impossible things of things that are lovely and that never happen 
and of things that are not and that should be but before this comes to pass we must cultivate the lost art of lying cyril then we must entirely cultivate it at once but in order to avoid making any error i want you to tell me briefly the doctrines of the new aesthetics vivian briefly then they are these art never expresses anything but itself it has an independent life just as thought has and develops purely on its own lines it is not necessarily realistic in an age of realism nor spiritual in an age of faith so far from being the creation of its time it is usually in direct opposition to it and the only history that it preserves for us is the history of its own progress sometimes it returns upon its footsteps and revives some antique form as happened in the archaistic movement of late greek art and in the pre-raphaelite movement of our own day at other times it entirely anticipates its age and produces in one century work that it takes another century to understand to appreciate and to enjoy in no case does it reproduce its age to pass from the art of a time to the time itself is the great mistake that all historians commit the second doctrine is this all bad art comes from returning to life and nature and elevating them into ideals life and nature may sometimes be used as part of art's rough material but before they are of any real service to art they must be translated into artistic conventions the moment art surrenders its imaginative medium it surrenders everything as a method realism is a complete failure and the two things that every artist should avoid are modernity of form and modernity of subject matter to us who live in the nineteenth century any century is a suitable subject for art except our own the only beautiful things are the things that do not concern us it is to have the pleasure of quoting myself exactly because hecuba is nothing to us that her sorrows are so suitable a motive for a tragedy besides it is only the modern that ever becomes old-fashioned monsieur zola sits down to give us a picture of the second empire who cares for the second empire now it is out of date life goes faster than realism but romanticism is always in front of life the third doctrine is that life imitates art far more than art imitates life this results not merely from life's imitative instinct but from the fact that the self-conscious aim of life is to find expression and that art offers it certain beautiful forms through which it may release that energy it is a theory that has never been put forward before but it is extremely fruitful and throws an entirely new light upon the history of art it follows as a corollary from this that external nature also imitates art the only effects that she can show us are effects that we have already seen through poetry or in paintings this is the secret of nature's charm as well as the explanation of nature's weakness the final revelation is that lying the telling of beautiful untrue things is the proper aim of art but of this i think i have spoken at sufficient length and now let us go out on the terrace where droops the milk-white peacock like a ghost while the evening star washes the dusk with silver 
at twilight nature becomes a wonderfully suggestive effect and is not without loveliness though perhaps its chief use is to illustrate quotations from the poets come we have talked long enough end of the decay of lying an observation part three end of james joyce in context volume one telemachus Telemachus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. James Joyce in Context, Volume 1. Telemachus. Stately, plump, Buck Mulligan came from the stairhead bearing a bowl of lather, on which a mirror and a razor lay crossed. A yellow dressing-gown, ungirdled, was sustained gently behind him on the mild morning air. He held the bowl aloft and intoned, Introibo ad altare dei. Halted, he peered down the dark winding stairs and called out coarsely, Come up, Kinch! Come up, you fearful Jesuit! Solemnly he came forward and mounted the round gun-rest. He faced about and blessed gravely thrice the tower the surrounding land, and the awakening mountains. Then, catching sight of Stephen Daedalus, he bent towards him and made rapid crosses in the air, gurgling in his throat and shaking his head. Stephen Daedalus, displeased and sleepy, leaned his arms on the top of the staircase and looked coldly at the shaking, girdling face that blessed him, equine in its length, and at the light, untonsured hair, grained and hued like pale oak. Buck Mulligan peeped an instant under the mirror, and then covered the bowl smartly. "'Back to barracks,' he said sternly. He added, in a preacher's tone, "'For this, O oh, dearly beloved, is the genuine Christine, body and soul and blood and oons. Slow music, please. Shut your eyes, gents. One moment. A little trouble about those white corpuscles. Silence, all.' He peered sideways up and gave a long, slow whistle of call, then paused a while in rapt attention, his even white teeth glistening here and there with gold points, chrysostomos. Two strong, shrill whistles answered through the calm. "'Thanks, old chap,' he cried briskly. "'That will do nicely. Switch off the current, will you?' He slipped off the gun-rest and looked gravely at his watcher, gathering about his legs the loose folds of his gown, the plump shadowed face and sullen oval jowl recalled a prelate, patron of the arts in the Middle Ages. A pleasant smile broke quietly over his lips. "'The mockery of it,' he said gaily, "'your absurd name, an ancient Greek!' He pointed his finger in friendly jest and went over to the parapet, laughing to himself. Stephen Daedalus stepped up, followed him wearily halfway, and sat down on the edge of the gun-rest watching him still as he propped his mirror on the parapet, dipped his brush in the bowl, and lathered cheeks and neck. Buck Mulligan's gay voice went on. My name is absurd, too. Molokai Mulligan. Two dactyls. But it has a Hellenic ring, hasn't it? Tripping and sunny, like the buck himself. We must go to Athens. Will you come if I can get the ant to fork out twenty quid? He laid the brush aside, and laughing with delight, cried, Will he come? the jejun jesuit ceasing he began to shave with care tell me mulligan stephen said quietly yes my love how long is haynes going to stay in this tower buck mulligan showed a shaven cheek over his right shoulder god isn't he dreadful he said frankly a ponderous saxon he thinks you are not a gentleman god these bloody english bursting with money and indigestion because he comes from Oxford. You know, Daedalus, you have the real Oxford manner. He can't make you out. Oh, my name for you is the best. Kinch, the knife-blade. He shaved warily over his chin. He was raving all night about a black panther, Stephen said. Where is his gun-case? 
A woeful lunatic, Mulligan said. Were you in a funk? I was, Stephen said, with energy and growing fear. Out here in the dark with a man I don't know, raving and moaning to himself about shooting a black panther? You saved men from drowning. I am not a hero, however. If he stays on here, I am off. Buck Mulligan frowned at the lather on his razor blade. He hopped down from his perch and began to search his trouser pockets hastily. Scutter, he said thickly. He came over to the gun rest, and thrusting a hand into Stephen's upper pocket, said, Lend us a loan of your nose rag to wipe my razor. Stephen suffered him to pull out and hold up on show by its corner a dirty, crumpled handkerchief. Buck Mulligan wiped the razor blade neatly. Then, gazing over the handkerchief, he said, The bard's nose rag, a new art color for our Irish poets. Snot green. You can almost taste it, can't you? He mounted to the parapet again and gazed out over Dublin Bay, his fair, oak-pale hair stirring slightly. God, he said quietly, is it the sea what algae calls it? A great sweet mother? The snot-green sea, the scotum tritening sea. Epi oinopa ponton. Ah, Daedalus, the Greeks, I must teach you. You must read them in the original. Thalata, Thalata. She is our great sweet mother. Come and look. Stephen stood up and went over to the parapet. Leaning on it, he looked down on the water and on the mail boat clearing the harbor mouth of Kingstown. Our mighty mother, Buck Mulligan said. He turned abruptly his gray searching eyes from the sea to Stephen's face. The aunt thinks you killed your mother, he said. That's why she won't let me have anything to do with you. Someone killed her, Stephen said gloomily. You could have knelt down, damn it, Kinch, when your dying mother asked you, Buck Mulligan said. I'm hyperborean as much as you, but to think of your mother begging you with her last breath to kneel down and pray for her, and you refused. There is something sinister in you. He broke off and lathered again lightly his farther cheek. A tolerant smile curled his lips. But a lovely mummer, he murmured to himself. Kinch, the loveliest mummer of them all. He shaved evenly and with care, in silence, seriously. Stephen, an elbow raised on the jagged granite, leaned his palm against his brow and gazed at the fraying edge of his shiny black coat-sleeve. Pain that was not yet the pain of love fretted his heart. Silently, in a dream, she had come to him after her death, her wasted body in its loose brown grave-clothes giving off an odor of wax and rosewood, her breath that had bent upon him, mute, reproachful, a faint odor of wetted ashes. Across the threadbare cuffage he saw the sea, hailed as a great sweet mother, by the well-fed voice beside him. The ring of bay and skyline held a dull green mass of liquid. A bowl of white china had stood beside her deathbed, holding the green sluggish bile which she had torn up from her rotting liver by fits of loud, groaning vomiting. Buck Mulligan wiped again his razor-blade. "'Ah, poor dog's body,' he said in a kind voice. "'I must give you a shirt and a few nose-rags. How are the second-hand breeches?' "'They fit well enough,' Stephen answered. Buck Mulligan attacked the hollow beneath his upper lip. "'The mockery of it,' he said contentedly. Second leg they should be. God knows what poxy bowsy left them off. I have a lovely pair with a hair-stripe, gray. You'll look spiffing in them.' I'm not joking, Kinch. You look damn well when you're dressed. Thanks, Stephen said. I can't wear them if they are gray. He can't wear them, Buck Mulligan told his face in the mirror. Etiquette is etiquette. He kills his mother, but he can't wear gray trousers. He folded his razor neatly, and with stroking pulps of fingers felt the smooth skin. Stephen turned his gaze from the sea to the plump face with its smoke-blue mobile eyes. That fellow I was with in the ship last night, said Buck Mulligan, says you have GPI. He was up in Dottyville with Connolly Norman, general paralysis of the insane. He swept the mirror in a half circle in the air to flash the tidings abroad in sunlight, now radiant on the sea. His curling, shaven lips laughed in the edges of his white glittering teeth. Laughter seized all his strong, well-knit trunk. Look at yourself, he said, you dreadful bard. 
Stephen bent forward and peered at the mirror held out to him, cleft by a crooked crack, hair on end. As he and others see me, who chose this face for me, this dog's body to rid of vermin? It asks me, too. I pinched it out of the skivvy's room, Buck Mulligan said. It does her all right. The aunt always keeps plain-looking servants for Malachi. Lead him not into temptation, and her name is Ursula. Laughing again, he brought the mirror away from Stephen's peering eyes. The rage of Caliban at not seeing his face in a mirror, he said. If Wilde were only alive to see you. Drawing back and pointing, Stephen said with bitterness, It is a symbol of Irish art, the cracked looking-glass of a servant. Buck Mulligan suddenly linked his arms in Stephen's, and walked with him round the tower, his razor and mirror clacking in the pocket where he had thrust them. It's not fair to tease you like that, Kinch, is it? he said kindly. God knows you have more spirit than any of them. Parried again. He fears the lancet of my art as I fear that of his, the cold steel pen. Cracked looking glass of a servant. I must tell that to the oxy chap downstairs and touch him for a guinea. He's stinking with money and thinks you are not a gentleman. His old fellow made his tin by selling jalap to Zulus or some bloody swindle or other. God, Kinch, if you and I could only work together, we might do something for the island. Hellenize it. Cranley's arm. His arm. And to think of your having to beg from these swine. I'm the only one who knows what you are. Why don't you trust me more? What have you up your nose against me? Is it Haines? If he makes any noise here, I'll bring down Seymour and will give him a ragging worse than they gave Clive Kempthorpe. Young shouts of moneyed voices in Clive Kempthorpe's rooms. Pale faces. They hold their ribs with laughter, one clasping another. Oh, I shall expire. Break the news to her gently. Aubrey, I shall die. With slit ribbons of his shirt whipping the air, he hops and hobbles round the table, with trousers down at knees, chased by aids of Magdalen, with the tailor's shears. A scared calf's face, gilded with marmalade. I don't want to be debagged. Don't you play the giddy ox with me? Shouts from the open window, startling evening in the quadrangle. A deaf gardener, aproned, masked with Matthew Arnold's face, pushes his mower on the somber lawn, watching narrowly the dancing motes of grasshalms. To ourselves! New paganism! Umphalos! Let him stay, Stephen said. There's nothing wrong with him except at night. Then what is it? Bunk Mulligan asked impatiently. Cough it up. I'm quite frank with you. What have you against me now? They halted, looking towards the blunt cape of Bray Head that lay on the water like a snout of a sleeping whale. Stephen freed his arm quietly. Do you wish me to tell you? he asked. Yes, what is it? Buck Mulligan answered. I don't remember anything. He looked at Stephen's face as he spoke. A light wind passed his brow, fanning softly his fair, uncombed hair, and stirring silver points of anxiety in his eyes. Stephen, depressed by his own voice, said, Do you remember the first day I went to your house after my mother's death? Buck Mulligan frowned quickly and said, What? Where? I can't remember anything. I remember only ideas and sensations. Why? What happened in the name of God? You were making tea, Stephen said, and went across the landing to get more hot water. Your mother and some visitor came out of the drawing room. She asked who was in your room. Yes, Buck Mulligan said. What did I say? I forget. You said, Stephen answered, Oh, it is only Daedalus whose mother is beastly dead. A flush which made him seem younger and more engaging rose to Buck Mulligan's cheek. Did I say that? he asked. Well, what harm is that? He shook his constraint from him nervously. And what is death? he asked. Your mother's, or yours, or my own. You saw only your mother die. I see them pop off every day in the matter in Richmond, and cut up into tripes in the dissecting room. It is a beastly thing and nothing else. It simply doesn't matter. You wouldn't kneel down to pray for your mother on her deathbed when she asked you. Why? Because you have the cursed Jesuit strain in you, only it's injected the wrong way. 
To me, it's all a mockery and beastly. Her cerebral lobes are not functioning. She calls the doctor, Sir Peter Teasel, and picks buttercups off the quilt. Humor her till it's over. You crossed her last wish in death, and yet you sulk with me because I don't whinge like some hired mute from La Lotz? Absurd. I suppose I did say it. I didn't mean to offend the memory of your mother. I am not thinking of the offense to my mother. Of what, then? Buck Mulligan asked. Of the offense to me, Stephen answered. Buck Mulligan swung round on his heel. Oh, an impossible person, he exclaimed. He walked off quickly round the parapet. Stephen stood at his post, gazing over the calm sea towards the headland. Sea and headland now grow dim. Pulses were beating in his eyes, veiling their sight, and he felt the fever of his cheeks. A voice within the tower called loudly, Are you up there, Mulligan? I'm coming, Buck Mulligan answered. He turned towards Stephen and said, Look at the sea. What does it care about offenses? Chuck Loyola, Kinch, and come on down. The Sassenach wants his morning rashers. His head halted again for a moment at the top of the staircase, level with the roof. Don't mope over it all day, he said. I'm inconsequent. Give up the moody brooding. His head vanished, but the drone of his descending voice boomed out of the stairhead. And no more turn aside and brood upon love's bitter mystery. For Fergus rules the brazen cars. Wood shadows floated silently by through the morning peace from the stairhead seaward where he gazed. Inshore and farther out the mirror of water whitened, spurned by light-shot hurrying feet. White breast of the dim sea, the twining stresses, two by two, a hand plucking the harp-strings, merging their twining cords. White wave wedded words shimmering on the dim tide. The cloud began to cover the sun slowly, wholly, shadowing the bay in deeper green. It lay beneath him, a bowl of bitter waters. Fergus's song. I sang it alone in the house, holding down the long, dark chords. Her door was open. She wanted to hear my music. Silent, with awe and pity, I went to her bedside. She was crying in her wretched bed. For these words, Stephen, love's bitter mystery. Where now? Her secrets, old feather fans, tasseled dance cards, powdered with musk, a gaud of amber beads in her locked drawer, a birdcage hung in the sunny window of her house when she was a girl. She heard old Royce sing in the pantomime of Turco the Terrible, and laughed with others when he sang, I am the boy that can enjoy invisibility. Phantasmal mirth, folded away, musk perfumed, and no more turn aside and brood. Folded away in the memory of nature with her toys, memories beset his brooding brain, her glass of water from the kitchen tap when she had approached the sacrament, a cored apple filled with brown sugar roasting for her at the hob on a dark autumn evening, her shapely fingernails reddened by the blood of squashed lice from her children's shirts. In a dream, silently she had come to him, her wasted body within its loose grave clothes getting off an odor of wax and rosewood, her breath bent over him with mute, secret words, a faint odor of wetted ashes. Her glazing eyes staring out of death to shake and bend my soul, on me alone, the ghost candle to light her agony, ghostly light on the tortured face, her hoarse, loud breath rattling in horror, while all prayed on her knees, her eyes on me to strike me down, Liliata utiliantium, te confessorum turma kercum dent, jubilantium te virginum, chorus equipiat, ghoul, chewer of corpses. No, mother, let me be and let me live. Kinch, ahoy! Buck Mulligan's voice sang from within the tower. It came nearer up the staircase, calling again. Stephen, still trembling at his soul's cry, heard warm, running sunlight, and in the air behind him friendly words. Daedalus, come down like a good mosey. Breakfast is ready. Haynes is apologizing for waking us last night. It's all right. I'm coming, Stephen said, turning. Do for Jesus' sake, 
Buck Mulligan said, for my sake and for all our sakes. His head disappeared and reappeared. I told him your symbol of Irish art. He says it's very clever. Touch him for a quid, will you? A guinea, I mean. I get paid this morning, Stephen said. The school kip, Buck Mulligan said. How much? Four quid? Lend us one. If you want it, Stephen said. Four shining sovereigns, Buck Mulligan cried with delight. We'll have a glorious drunk to astonish the druidy druids. Four omnipotent sovereigns. He flung up his hands and tramped down the stone stairs, singing out of tune with a cockney accent, Oh, won't we have a merry time, drinking whiskey, beer, and wine on coronation, coronation day. Oh, won't we have a merry time on coronation day. Warm sunshine marrying over the sea. The nickel shaving bowl shone, forgotten, on the parapet. Why should I bring it down, or leave it there all day? Forgotten friendship? He went over to it, held it in his hands a while, feeling its coolness, smelling the clammy slaver of the lather in which the brush was stuck. So I carried the boat of incense then at Klangau's. I am another now, and yet the same. A servant, too. A server of a servant. In the gloomy domed living room of the tower, Buck Mulligan's gowned form moved briskly to and fro about the hearth, hiding and revealing its yellow glow. Two shafts of soft daylight fell across the flagged floor from the high barbicans, and at the meeting of their rays a cloud of coal smoke and fumes of fried grease floated, turning. We'll be choked, Buck Mulligan says. Haynes, open that door, will you? Stephen laid the shaving bowl on the locker. A tall figure rose from the hammock where it had been sitting, went to the doorway, and pulled open the inner doors. Have you the key? a voice asked. Daedalus has it, Buck Mulligan said. Janie Mack, I'm choked. He howled, without looking up from the fire. Kinch! It's in the lock, Stephen said, coming forward. The key scraped round harshly twice, and when the heavy door had been set ajar, welcome light and bright air entered. Haynes stood at the doorway, looking out. Stephen hauled his up-ended valise to the table and sat down to wait. Buck Mulligan tossed the fry on to the dish beside him. Then he carried the dish and large teapot over to the table, and set them down heavily and sighed with relief. I'm melting, he said, as the candle remarked when, but hush, not a word more on that subject. Kinch, wake up, bread, butter, honey. Haynes, come in, the grub is ready. Bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts. Where's the sugar? O oh, Jay, there's no milk. Stephen fetched the loaf and the pot of honey and the butter cooler from the locker. Buck Mulligan sat down in a sudden pet. What sort of kip is this, he said. I told her to come after eight. We can drink it black, Stephen said thirstily. There's a lemon in the locker. Oh, damn you and your Paris fads, Buck Mulligan said. I want Sandy Cove milk. Haynes came in from the doorway and said quietly, That woman is coming up with the milk. Oh, blessings of God on you, Buck Mulligan cried, jumping up from his chair. Sit down. Pour out the tea there. The sugar is in the bag. Here, I can't go fumbling at the damned eggs. He hacked through the fry on the dish and slapped it out on three plates, saying, In nomine patres et filii et spiritus sancti. Haynes sat down to pour out the tea. I'm giving you two lumps each, he said. But I say, Mulligan, you do make strong tea, don't you? Buck Mulligan, hewing thick slices from the loaf, said in an old woman's wheedling voice, When I makes tea, I makes tea, as old mother Grogan said, and when I makes water, I makes water. By Jove, it is tea, Haines said. Buck Mulligan went on hewing and wheedling. So do I, Mrs. Cassell, says she. Be gob, ma'am, says Mrs. Cahill. God send you, don't make them in one pot. He lunged towards his messmates and turned a thick slice of bread, impaled on his knife. That's folk, he said, very earnestly, for your book, Haynes. Five lines of text and ten pages of notes about the folk and the fish gods of Dundrum, printed by the weird sisters in the year of the big wind. He turned to Stephen and asked in a fine, puzzled voice, lifting his brows, Can you recall, brother, 
Is Mother Grogan's tea and water pot spoken of in the Mamaogian, or is it in the Upanishads? <laughs> I doubt it, said Stephen gravely. Do you now, Buck Mulligan said in the same tone, your reasons, pray. I fancy, Stephen said as he ate, it did not exist in or out of the Mabinogian. Mother Grogan was, one imagines, a kinswoman of Mary Ann. Buck Mulligan's face smiled with delight. Charming, he said, in a finical sweet voice, showing his white teeth and blinking his eyes pleasantly. Do you think she was? Quite charming. Then, suddenly overclouding all his features, he growled in a hoarsened, rasping voice as he hewed again vigorously at the loaf. For old Mary Ann, she doesn't care a damn, but heising up her petticoats. He crammed his mouth with fry and munched and droned. The doorway was darkened by an entering form. The milk, sir. Come in, ma'am, Buck Mulligan said. Kinch, get the jug. An old woman came forward and stood by Stephen's elbow. That's a lovely morning, sir, she said. Glory be to God. To whom? Buck Mulligan said, glancing at her. Ha! To be sure. Stephen reached back and took the milk jug from the locker. The islanders, Mulligan said to Haynes casually, speak frequently of the collector of purposes. How much, sir? asked the old woman. A quart, Stephen said. He watched her pour into the measure, and thence into the jug. Rich, white milk. Not hers. Old shrunken paps. She poured again a measureful and a tilly. Old and secret she had entered from a morning world, maybe a messenger. She praised the goodness of the milk, pouring it out, crouching by a patient cow at daybreak in the lush field, a witch on her toadstool, her wrinkled fingers quick at the squirting dugs. They loud about her whom they knew, do silky cattle. Silk of the kine and poor old woman, names given her in old times, a wandering crone, lowly form of an immortal serving her conqueror and her gay betrayer, their common cuck queen, a messenger from the secret morning, to serve or to upbraid, whether he could not tell, but scorned to beg her favor. It is indeed, ma'am, Buck Mulligan said, pouring milk into their cups. Taste it, sir, she said. He drank at her bidding. If we could live on good food like that, he said to her somewhat loudly, we wouldn't have the country full of rotten teeth and rotten guts, living in a bog swamp, eating cheap food, and the streets paved with dust, horse dung, and consumptive spits. Are you a medical student, sir? the old woman asked. I am, madam, Buck Mulligan answered. Well, look at that now, she said. Stephen listened in scornful silence. She bows her old head to a voice that speaks to her loudly, her bone-setter, her medicine man. Me, she slights, to the voice that will shrive in oil for the grave all that is of her, but her woman's unclean loins, of man's flesh made not in God's likeness, the serpent's prey, and to the loud voice that now bids her be silent, with wondering, unsteady eyes. Do you understand what he says? Stephen asked her. Is it French you are talking, sir? the old woman said to Haynes. Haynes spoke to her again in a longer speech, confidently. Irish, Buck Mulligan said. Is there Gaelic on you? I thought it was Irish, she said, by the sound of it. Are you from the West, sir? I am an Englishman, Haynes answered. He's English, Buck Mulligan says, and he thinks we ought to speak Irish in Ireland. Well, sure we ought to, the old woman said, and I'm ashamed I don't speak the language myself. I'm told it's a grand language by them that knows. Grand is no name for it, said Buck Mulligan. Wonderful entirely. Fill us out some more tea, Kinch. Would you like a cup, ma'am? No, thank you, sir, the old woman said, slipping the ring of the milk can on her forearm and about to go. Haynes said to her, Have you your bill? We had better pay her, Mulligan, hadn't we? Stephen filled out the three cups. Bill, sir, she said, halting. Well... It's seven mornings a pint at two pence, is seven twos is a shilling and two pence over, and these three mornings a quart at four pence is three quarts is a shilling. That's a shilling and one, and two is two and two, sir. Buck Mulligan sighed, and, having filled his mouth with a crust, thickly buttered on both sides, stretched forth his legs and began to search his trouser pockets. Pay up and look pleasant, Haines said to him, smiling. Stephen filled a third cup, a spoonful of tea, 
colouring faintly the rich, thick milk. Buck Mulligan brought up a florin, twisted it round in his fingers, and cried, A miracle! He passed it along the table towards the old woman, saying, Ask nothing more of me, sweet. All I can give you, I give. Stephen laid the coin on her uneager hand. We'll owe two pence, he said. Time enough, sir, she said, taking the coin. Time enough. Good morning, sir. She curtsied and went out, followed by Buck Mulligan's tender chant. Heart of my heart, were it more, more would be laid at your feet. He turned to Stephen and said, Seriously, Daedalus, I'm stony. Hurry out to your school kip and bring us back some money. Today the bards must drink and junk it. Ireland expects that every man this day will do his duty. That reminds me, Haynes said, rising, that I have to visit your national library today. Our swim first, Buck Mulligan said. He turned to Stephen and asked blandly, Is this the day for your monthly wash, Kinch? Then he says to Haynes, The unclean bard makes a point of washing once a month. All Ireland is washed by the Gulf Stream, Stephen said, as he let honey trickle over a slice of the loaf. Haynes, from the corner where he was knotting easily a scarf about the loose collar of his tennis shirt, spoke, I intend to make a collection of your sayings, if you will let me. Speaking to me, they wash and tub and scrub, a genbite of inwit, conscience. Yet, here's a spot. That one about the cracked looking-glass of a servant being the symbol of Irish art is deuced good. Buck Mulligan kicked Stephen's foot under the table, and said, with warmth of tone, Wait till you hear him on Hamlet, Haynes. Well, I mean it, Haynes said, still speaking to Stephen. I was just thinking of it when that poor old creature came in. Would I make any money by it? Stephen asked. Haynes laughed, and, as he took his soft gray hat from the holdfost of the hammock, said, I don't know, I'm sure. He strolled out to the doorway. Buck Mulligan bent across Stephen and said with coarse vigor, You put your hoof in it now. What did you say that for? Well, Stephen said, the problem is to get money. From whom? From the milkwoman or from him? It's a toss-up, I think. I blow him out about you, Buck Mulligan said, and then you come along with your lousy leer and your gloomy Jesuit jibes. I see little hope, Stephen said, from her or from him. Buck Mulligan sighed tragically and laid his hand on Stephen's arm. From me, Kinch, he said. In a suddenly changed tone, he added, to tell you the God's truth, I think you're right. Damn all else they are good for. Why don't you play them as I do? To hell with them all. Let us get out of the kip. He stood up, gravely ungirdled, and disrobed himself of his gown, saying resignedly, Mulligan is stripped of his garments. He emptied his pockets on the table. There's your snot rag, he said. And putting on his stiff collar and rebellious tie, he spoke to them, chiding them, and to his dangling watch-chain. His hands plunged and rummaged in his trunk while he called for a clean handkerchief. God, we'll simply have to dress the character. I want puce gloves and green boots. Contradiction. Do I contradict myself? Very well, then, I contradict myself. Mercurial Malachi. A limp black missile flew out of his talking hands. There's your Latin quarter hat, he said. Stephen picked it up and put it on. Haynes called to them from the doorway. Are you coming, you fellows? I'm ready, Buck Mulligan answered, going towards the door. Come out, Kinch. You've eaten all we have left, I suppose. Resigned, he passed out with grave words and gait, saying, well nigh with sorrow. And going forth, he met Butterly. Stephen, taking his ash plant from its leaning place, followed them out, and as they went down the ladder, pulled to the slow iron door and locked it. He put the huge key in his inner pocket. At the foot of the ladder, Buck Mulligan said, Did you bring the key? I have it, Stephen said, preceding them. He walked on. Behind them he heard Buck Mulligan club with his heavy bath towel the leader shoots of ferns or grasses. Down, sir! How dare you, sir! Haynes asked, Do you pay rent for this tower? Twelve quid, Buck Mulligan said. To the Secretary of State for war, Stephen added over his shoulder. They halted while Haynes surveyed the tower, and said at last, Rather bleak in winter time, I should say. Martello, you call it? Billy Pitt had them built, Buck Mulligan said, when the French were on the sea. But ours is the Omphalos. What 
is your idea of Hamlet? Haines asked Stephen. Oh, no, Buck Mulligan shouted in pain. I am not equal to Thomas Aquinas and the fifty-five reasons he has made out to prop it up. Wait till I've had a few pints in me first. He turned to Stephen, saying, as he pulled down neatly the peaks of his primrose waistcoat, You couldn't manage it under three pints, Kinch, could you? It has waited so long, Stephen said listlessly. It can wait longer. You pique my curiosity, Haines said amiably. Is it some paradox? Pooh, Buck Mulligan said. We've grown out of wild and paradoxes. It's quite simple. He proves by algebra that Hamlet's grandson is Shakespeare's grandfather and that he himself is the ghost of his own father. What? Haines said, beginning to point at Stephen. He himself? Buck Mulligan slung his towel stolewise round his neck, and bending in loose laughter, said to Stephen's ears, O oh, shade of Kinch the Elder! Japhet, in search of a father! We're always tired in the morning, Stephen said to Haines, and it is rather long to tell. Buck Mulligan, walking forward, raised his hands. The sacred pint alone can unbind the tongue of Daedalus, he said. I mean to say, Haines explained to Stephen, as they followed, this tower and these cliffs here remind me somehow of Elsinore. That beetles o'er his base into the sea, isn't it? Buck Mulligan turned suddenly for an instant toward Stephen, but did not speak. In the bright silent instant, Stephen saw his own image in cheap dusty mourning between their gay attires. It's a wonderful tale, Haines said, bringing them to halt again. Eyes pale as the sea, the wind had freshened, paler, firm and prudent, the sea's ruler. He gazed southward over the bay, empty except for the smoke plume of the mail boat vague on the bright skyline, and a sail tacking by the muglins. I read a theological interpretation of it somewhere, he said bemused, the father and the son idea, the son striving to be atoned with the father. Buck Mulligan at once put on a blithe, broadly smiling face. He looked at them, his well-shaped mouth open happily, his eyes, from which he had suddenly withdrawn all shrewd sense, blinking with mad gaiety. He moved a doll's head to and fro, the brims of his Panama hat quivering, and began to chant in a quiet, happy, foolish voice. I am the queerest young fellow that you have heard. My mother's a Jew, my father's a bird. With Joseph the joiner I cannot agree, so here's two disciples and cavalry. He held up a forefinger of warning. And if anyone thinks that I'm not divine, he'll get no free drinks when I'm making the wine, but have to drink water and wish it were plain, that I make when the wine becomes water again. He tugged swiftly at Stephen's ash plant in farewell, and running forward to a brow of the cliff, fluttered his hands at his sides like fins or wings of one about to rise in the air and chanted, Goodbye now, goodbye. Write down all I said, and tell Tom, Dick, and Harry I rose from the dead. What's bred in the bone cannot fail me to fly, and all of it's breezy. Goodbye now, goodbye. He capered before them, down towards the forty-foot hole, fluttering his wing-like hands. Leaping nimbly, Mercury's hat quivering in the fresh wind that bore back to them his brief, bird-sweet cries. Haines, who had been laughing guardedly, walked on beside Stephen and said, We oughtn't to laugh, I suppose. He's rather blasphemous. I'm not a believer myself, that is to say. Still, his gaiety takes the harm out of it somehow, doesn't it? What did he call it? Joseph the Joiner? The Ballad of Joking Jesus, Stephen answered. Oh, Haines said, you've heard it before? Three times a day, after meals, Stephen said dryly. You're not a believer, are you? Haynes asked. I mean, a believer in the narrow sense of the word, creation from nothing and miracles and a personal God. There's only one sense of the word, it seems to me, Stephen said. Haynes stopped to take out a smooth silver case in which twinkled a green stone. He sprang it open with his thumb and offered it. Thank you, Stephen said, taking a cigarette. Haynes helped himself and snapped the case, too. He put it back in his side pocket and took from his waistcoat pocket a nickel tinderbox, sprang it open, too, and, having lit his cigarette, held the flaming spunk toward Stephen in the shell of his hands. Yes, of course, he said. 
as they went on again. Either you believe or you don't, isn't it? Personally, I couldn't stomach that idea of a personal God. You don't stand for that, I suppose. You behold in me, Stephen said with grim displeasure, a horrible example of free thought. He walked on, waiting to be spoken to, trailing his ash plant by his side. Its feral followed lightly on the path, squealing at his heels. My familiar after me, calling Stephen. A wavering line along the path. They will walk on it tonight, coming here in the dark. He wants that key. It is mine. I paid the rent. Now I eat his salt bread. Give him the key, too. All. He will ask for it. That was in his eyes. After all, Haynes began. Stephen turned and saw that the cold gaze which had measured him was not all unkind. After all, you should be able to free yourself. You are your own master, it seems to me. I am the servant of two masters, Stephen said, in English and in Italian. Italian? A crazy queen, old and jealous, kneeled down before me. And a third, Stephen said, there is who wants me for odd jobs. Italian, Haynes said again, what do you mean? The imperial British state, Stephen answered, his color rising, and the holy Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church. Haynes detached from his underlip some fibers of tobacco before he spoke. I can quite understand that, he said calmly. An Irishman must think like that, I dare say. We feel in England that we have treated you rather unfairly. It seems history is to blame. The proud, potent titles clanged over Stephen's memory, the triumph of their blazoned bells. Et unum sanctum catholicum et apostolicum ecclesiam. The slow growth and change of right and dogma like his own rare thoughts, a chemistry of stars, symbol of the apostles in the mass for Pope Marcellus, the voices blended, singing alone loud in affirmation, and behind their chant, the vigilant angel of the church militant disarmed and menaced her heresarchs. A horde of heresies fleeing with mitres awry, Photius and the brood of mockers of whom Mulligan was one, and Arius warring his life long upon the consubstantiality of the Son with the Father, and Valentine spurning Christ's Tyrian body, and the subtle African heresiarch Sibelius, who held that the Father was himself his own son. Words Mulligan had spoken a moment since in mockery to the stranger. Idle mockery. The void awaits surely all of them that weave the wind, a menace, a disarming, and a worsting, from these embattled angels of the church, Michael's host, who defend her ever in the hour of conflict with their lances and their shields. Here, here, prolonged applause. Zut, nom de Dieu. Of course, I'm a Britisher, Haynes's voice said. I feel as one. I don't want to see my country fall into the hands of German Jews either. That's our national problem. I'm afraid just now. Two men stood at the verge of the cliff, watching businessmen, boatmen. She's making for Bullock Harbor. The boatman nodded towards the north of the bay with some disdain. There's five fathoms out there, he said. It'll be swept up that way when the tide comes in about one. It's nine days today. The man that was drowned, a sail veering about the blank bay, waiting, for a swollen bundle to bob up, roll over to the sun a puffy face, salt white. Here I am. They followed the winding path down to the creek. Buck Mulligan stood on a stone, in shirt sleeves, his unclipped tie rippling over his shoulder. A young man clinging to a spur of the rock near him moved slowly, frogwise, his green legs in the deep jelly of the water. Is the brother with you, Malachi? Down in Westmeath, with the Bannons. Still there? I got a call from Bannon. Says he found a sweet young thing down there. Photo girl, he calls her. Snapshot, eh? Brief exposure. Buck Mulligan sat down to unlace his boots. An elderly man shot up near the spur of the rock, a blowing red face. He scrambled up by the stones, water glistening on his pate and on its garland of gray hair. Water rilling over his chest and paunch and spilling jets out of his black, sagging loincloth. Buck Mulligan made way for him to scramble past, 
and glancing at Haynes and Stephen, crossed himself piously with his thumbnail at brow and lips and breastbone. Seymour's back in town, the young man said, grasping again the spur of his rock. Chucked medicine and going in for the army. Oh, go to God, Buck Mulligan said. Going over next week to stew. You know that red Carlisle girl, Lily? Yes. Spooning with him last night on the pier. The father is Rauto with money. Is she up the pole? Better ask Seymour that. Seymour's a bleeding officer, Buck Mulligan said. He nodded to himself as he drew off his trousers and stood up, saying tritely, Red-headed woman, buck like goats. He broke off in alarm, feeling his side under his flapping shirt. My twelfth rib is gone, he cried. I'm the Ubermensch, toothless kinch, and I, the Superman. He struggled out of his shirt and flung it behind him to where his clothes lay. Are you going in here, Malachi? Yes, make room in the bed. The young man shoved himself backwards through the water and reached the middle of the creek in two long, clean strokes. Haynes sat down on a stone, smoking. Are you not coming in? Buck Mulligan said. Later on, Haynes said, not on my breakfast. Stephen turned away. I'm going, Mulligan, he said. Give us that key, Kinch, Buck Mulligan said, to keep my chemise flat. Stephen handed him the key. Buck Mulligan laid it across his heaped clothes. And two pence, he said, for a pint. Throw it there. Stephen threw two pennies on the soft heap. Dressing, undressing. Buck Mulligan, erect, with joined hands before him, said solemnly, He who stealeth from the poor lendeth to the Lord. Thus speck Zarathustra. His plump body plunged. We'll see you again, Haines said turning as Stephen walked up the path and smiling at wild Irish. Horn of a bull, hoof of a horse, smile of a Saxon. The ship, Buck Mulligan cried, half twelve. Good, Stephen said. He walked along the upward curving path. Liliata utiliantum, turma circumdate, jubilantium de virginum. The priests, grey nimbus, in a niche where he dressed discreetly. I will not sleep here tonight. Home, also, I cannot go. A voice, sweet-tuned and sustained, called to him from the sea. Turning the curve, he waved his hand. It called again. A sleek brown head, a seal's far off on the water, round. Usurper. End of Telemachus.